welcome to day two of Raleigh City Council, City Council Retreat. Uh, Council wishes to start uh, just a few moments of silence just uh, to recognize the tragedy of Mr. Nichols um, in Memphis. So if we could just all take a moment of silence uh, to show our respects, please. Thank you for that. Uh, first, we're gonna have Kent Yelver Yelverton, sorry, I feel like I butchered that, North Carolina State Fair Director. Um, I'm a bit of a fangirl right now, thinking of all the many memories I have at the State Fair to welcome us to this beautiful facility. Um, so Kent. Good morning. I, uh, I know you have a full day today, so I just want to take a couple of moments to, to welcome you to, to this facility. My name is Kent Yelverton. I, I am the North Carolina State Fair Director. Uh, but in my previous role with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, I was Director of Property and Construction. And during that time, we uh, received the funding for this facility through the 2016 Connect NC Bond Program. And uh, we occupied the building in the summer of 2021. Um, Today, my role is very simple. I'm your host, and I uh, look forward to spending the day with you and doing anything that I can to make your uh, visit here uh, more enjoyable. Uh, we have uh, free reign of the, the public areas of the building. Um, there is a self-serve market upstairs uh, that you're welcome to, to utilize. If you have questions through the day about uh, the facility, if you would like to see some other areas of the facility, I'd be glad to, to take you uh, behind the door or two. Um, if you want to talk state fair, I always love to talk state fair. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome. And uh, on behalf of myself, uh, Commissioner Steve Troxler, and the entire Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, this building uh, you certainly note is named the Steve Troxler Agricultural Sciences Building. That naming was by a unanimous uh, proclamation by our North Carolina General Assembly. And I think all of us in the room know unanimous is not a word that is used in that building very often. <laughs> um, this building is uh, it's about 225,000 square feet. It's about 60% uh, laboratory and about 40% administrative space. It is a one-of-a-kind building. Uh, we know it's one-of-a-kind in the U.S. We believe it's one-of-a-kind in the, in the world. It's not one-of-a-kind in any single activity that takes place here. It is one-of-a-kind in the combination of activities that we do here. When we got the opportunity to replace 40 plus year old buildings, we wanted to do everything we possibly could while we had the opportunity. So we have uh, three labs that were in old buildings that have relocated here. And they do everything from run engines to test octane and motor fuels to we have a BSL-3 lab that handles uh, select agents, uh, hazardous materials. So. A lot of variety within this building. About 220 uh, state employees do call this their, their workplace. Um, but we do have our standards lab, which is weights and measures. We have our veterinary lab. They perform necropsies. They do pathology to determine uh, cause of mortalities for domestic animals, farm animals, and wild animals. Uh, wildlife to uh, to trace back and see what kind of issues we might be dealing with. We operate the only food lab in the state of North Carolina that is government operated here in this building. Um, again, please uh, please make use of the building, enjoy it. Uh, please seek me out if I can do anything for you while you're here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for that very warm welcome. I uh, just want to reflect a little bit on yesterday to hold us in uh, remembrance of some of the things we established yesterday, particularly our hopes for your retreat. Uh, you talked about wanting to have openness, to have good conversation, to establish shared priorities, to have a team ethic, 
come up with collectively designed strategies and solutions, relationship building, uh, getting to know more about each other, camaraderie and a game plan. Um, and we all agree that to kind of get those goals in place or to create an environment that makes those hopes uh, possible, some of the norms that we were going to follow was to be as eager to listen as to speak, um, to remember that if someone has a different opinion or a different view, um, differences don't mean defi deficiencies. Uh, it doesn't mean that something is wrong or right, and it's not an attack on a person. It's just a different view. Uh, we talked about questioning our own assumptions. Um, learning from each other, being present, having mutual accountability, and being respectful of the schedule. Um, we are running a little bit behind this morning, but we will pick up time um, along the way. Um, our first presentation this morning is really going to be about community, community engagement, board update. Uh, Taisha Hinton, who's your community engagement manager, has put together a very thoughtful presentation, um, and we're hopeful for some good discussion. Um, at the end of the presentation to give staff some guidance on where you would like to go. Um, so, uh, Ms. Hinton, your, your mug can sit here. Perfect. And you have your clicker, right? Perfect. Good morning, me. everybody. Good morning. You have cups. I have coffee in mine. What's in your... Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Can, I, can I raise a question before you get started? Yep. And I'm really excited to hear your presentation. Sure. Um, I just needed to take a moment uh, to share my thoughts. Um, I, I want to take space before we delve into community engagement because I do think it's, it's a really important topic. Uh, yesterday, and I appreciate the, the moment of silence, but it was really hard for us as a nation to experience last night uh, what we watched, and I want to give room for that, for that pain that we are all feeling. Um, and how I'm bringing this together is that yesterday I don't feel that we had the room and the space to how we're going to change that today. How are we going to talk about these things? Um, right now, I'm in a, in a, in a weird headspace because I, I want to talk about how we handle crisis management, how we put neighbors and, and our community at the forefront of our thought, and as city leaders, how are we ensuring that they are safe during this time? And I want to carve out just a few minutes right now to begin to answer those questions so that I can feel comfortable because I feel almost disrespectful knowing that our, our country is going through something that is very, very similar to what we did in 2020. And I want to know as a new council member, what do we do? What do I do? How do I guide? How do I lead? And um, I'm here. I'm so worried about everything being later. It's always later, later. And then here we are in a retreat where this is where we should be having conversations. And I don't feel that happened yesterday. I don't feel that the conversation portion happened. And I want to talk. I want to talk and listen to what your experiences were in 2020. I want to talk about what I want to see as the future. And as our goal up there sat as openness and conversation, uh, we didn't do that yesterday. And when I look at our PAC schedule today, I, when, do, when is the opportunity to talk? When is that? So looking at you all's uh, agenda design for today, uh, from 12.45 to 2 is that time for you all to really do exactly what you're describing because yesterday was a lot of uh, informing you all, presenting with you all, but today was designed to give you all that space to talk as a body, as a governing body, about what your priorities are. Um, so as one of your uh, norms was being respectful of the schedule, we'll definitely make sure when we get to that 12.45 that we respect that time from 12.45 to 2 for you all to do just that. I was just going to say, so you're saying the council priorities for the upcoming year will be more of an open discussion space, and that's from 1245 to 2? Correct. Okay, because we don't have the time in our, we just have bullet points. Okay. So that may be causing, okay. we don't, there's, I have no idea what time we're doing anyway. And I think staff really <laughs> wanted to do that to hold space for flexibility. If okay. we needed to go to a presenter and say, we need you to shorten your time, we need you to skip some slides, um, which we were doing behind the scenes yesterday to keep you all on track for your reception, and definitely going to do that today to, so that you can protect that time and hold space for you all to have time for discussion at your retreat. Uh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. So we, you want to go ahead and start off at the top? Okay. So let me let me just interject for a quick moment just to acknowledge the the moment that we're all currently experiencing. Um, 
to Councilmember Jones' point, last night was really rough. If you had the courage and the guts to watch the video, it took us to a place that for many of us in this room during 2020, never want to go back to again. As an African-American woman, as the city manager of this great city, during a time and a period when we are all struggling to be the best that we can be, it is hard. So I get where you are and how you're trying to bring this forward so that we can have an intentional <clears throat> conversation about how do we take the moment and make something out of it so that we continue to be the best Raleigh that we can be. I think that's what I hear from you. With that said, the agenda is an agenda. It is your agenda. It is the city council's retreat, not staff's retreat. We can go in whatever order that you all want to. There are no assigned times that is a best practice because it allows you the flexibility to be flexible, to adjust. There were lots of conversations last night about the tour. That was one of the things that we were going to raise early this morning, whether or not we wanted to have additional conversation and not have the tour. So that is totally up to you guys. I see you all nodding your heads. Um, Okay, so I guess, um, Michael, I think you got that. So you may want to tell staff who worked really hard to try to put that together that they're off today. Um, and so that will allow us a couple more hours, if needed, to be able to engage in some of the, uh, the other conversations that you as a body would like to have. So again, we're here at your mercy to do whatever and however you guys want to do it. And if you just got and direct how you want the agenda to flow, we will make it happen. Staff is really good at bouncing, and that's just what we do. That's what we did. Can, um, I, can I make another? Go back and say, <coughs> I would really like the chief to be here, and she talk, I talked with her this morning. She is at the um, new academy, academy. Um, and said she would be here later, and um, I think it would be good to have her presence um, and her knowledge and her expertise as we continue that was, part of the conversation. Was Chief Pat no, but she no. was in Charlotte. She was in Charlotte. She was in Charlotte. She, not only that, but she was heavily involved with um, everything in the DNC and um, really big, brings a incredible perspective. I, I can respect that. I think, I, but I'm, I think what um, Council Jonathan had his hand raised. I just want to finish this point. I defer. Yeah. Um, I think what Council Member. Uh, Jones is really interested in is like that peer-to-peer -peer learning that we were talking about yesterday where it's learning from the experiences of people who were in elected office mm -hmm. um, especially during the 2020 time and just the lessons that you learned on how what could be better and I think that is a relevant conversation to have with Chief Patterson but I think it's more along the lines of like learning from peer, that peer-to-peer -peer learning that we were talking about yesterday from each other um, so I don't know if that's necessarily a conversation that is like, if, if Chief Patterson was here, that's great. She can be an added voice, but I think it's really more along the conversation that she wanted to have with, like, members of council, especially members of council who were here during the, the 2020 uprisings and just, like, lessons on how to be better or what what could be different um, just on the reaction. So, so what I'm hearing is that she just wants to know, like, how to react in this sort of time and how to, how to be uh, an advocate uh, knowing the, the new role that we're all in. And navigating that space is, is that right Jonathan can I make a suggestion then yes um, hearing there'll be no bus tour and that you were anticipating from 1245 to 2 to be sort of this general council priority discussion um, and I'll defer to y'all because I want to center your voices in this but my suggestion would be like let's just get through the program stuff let, I know the community engagement update folks have been waiting for that let's get through some of this program stuff and then it sounds like basically from after lunch until Whenever we feel Whenever like leaving, we feel like leaving, we can just do <laughs> discussion yeah. together. And then I think if we do it that way, we won't feel like we've got to wrap this discussion because now we have to do all these programs. programs. So let's, let's knock out the program stuff, and then this whole afternoon I think will be open for discussion. Okay. okay. So we'll uh, start Jones, and then we'll come back to you, Councilmember. I Black. first want to say thank you. Um, I just want to say I appreciate uh, Council's willingness to hear where I am and I'm sure where our residents are, I really want to take this opportunity at this retreat to show leadership as a council and show that we are wanting and willing to, to 
converse with each other to try and solve problems and make sure our community is safe. Uh, I, I definitely respect your saying, Councillor um, Jones. If, are there anything, is there anything more programmatic in the afternoon that we could possibly move up to the morning and just like leave the afternoon for priorities and agendas and other deeper conversations? So I, I think as the manager said, we're completely flexible. Um, I think the only presentation that's not a part of your staff is uh, Mr. Uh, Isley with your legislative agenda. So if we could move him to the morning, um, Madam CFO, Budget Director, they're all part of your staff. If we don't get them today, I know you all have work sessions and such, uh, but they can be flexible. But I know Mr. Isley does have an afternoon commitment that he's been um, willing to be flexible. So that's really the programmatic uh, piece that's an outsider, that's external to your staff. So that we... Um some of this so we have the afternoon. Sounds good. It's, I'm seeing a lot of head nods. Yeah, right. um, so yeah. really beginning at, we'll do some shuffling. We'll have community engagement go up. I'm going to sit down with Michelle. We'll do some shuffling uh, to make that happen. <laughs> so I'm seeing head nods. So, so this is good. This was a collaborative uh, way to come up with a schedule that fits you all. So I hope everyone feels good about that because that's what retreats are, is to serve your needs. So, Ms. Hinton. Good morning again, everyone. I am Taisha Hinton. I have the pleasure of working in our community engagement office. If you have not seen from the theme today, you are at the community engagement cafe. Um, and we're going to tie that theme in throughout the day. Cheers. Um, so let's get started. During your council meeting in December, there was a conversation at the table, can you hear me okay? Yes. There was a conversation at the table around all things community engagement. And some of the things that we heard from you all is that you wanted to see a larger engagement puzzle. You wanted to see more in-person meetings. You wanted to look at a community-focused registry, some long-term and short-term fixes, as well as building out our portfolio and engagement. Um, one thing, and I think it was Councilmember Melton that said he wanted us to provide a menu framework of engagement options. So in front of you today, we made you a literal menu that we are going to talk through in this presentation. Um, so again, welcome to the cafe. In a moment, you'll hear from our board chair, Dr. Sarah Glover. She'll give you some updates around the community engagement board, their potential mission statement, their uh, potential bylaws that's still all in conversation with the city attorney's office. I'll give you an introduction of our team. Um, we'll discuss that menu. And then at the end, those place cards in front of you, you're actually going to place your order with us at the cafe. So stay in character, all right? Um, one of the things that I just want to make sure I mention is today's special. We're going to have fun with a cup of conversation. We're going to have some potential with a side of possibilities. And we're going to have collaboration with a mix of compromise. Um, Dr. Glover is, was elected the chair of the Community Engagement Board in September. Uh, she is a long-term Raleigh resident, a local business owner, and this is actually her first time serving on a border commission. So Dr. Glover, come on up. And if you are also here as a part of the Community Engagement Board, if you can stand up to be acknowledged, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Taisha. Do you want your mug? You're going to be sad if you don't have your mug. Ooh. Mayor, members of our city council, good morning. Staff, members of our community, good morning. I stand before you as a representative of the city's new community engagement board. And my first task is to introduce this board. One of the best things about Raleigh, in my opinion, is the community. The incredible, compassionate people who live here. Our community engagement board is made up of these people, your neighbors, who raised their hands and asked for the opportunity to volunteer, to focus their time, energy, expertise, and compassion on community engagement in the city of Raleigh. 
I've provided you with a handout today. It starts this, like this. To introduce you briefly to the members of this board. And I think you'll notice right away as you read through this handout, the diversity in experience, age, district, it's incredible the different backgrounds, experiences, and skill sets that come together in the room when this board meets. What you might not be able to see from that paper, though, is the passion. Each of these people, each one, is incredibly, incredibly dedicated to the mission of supporting community engagement in our city. Now, I'm not saying that everyone on this screen is always in agreement. I don't think that true impactful change happens in rooms where everyone's saying the same thing. And certainly in one of our community engagement board meetings, you'll see that we're not always in agreement. But that's what's so important. This board truly brings incredible people together, people who, with their differing opinions, are united in their belief that community engagement is essential. I also provided you with a second handout. It starts like this that details the activities of this board since it was formed this summer. And honestly, I provide this to emphasize how hardworking this board is. Our volunteer board was just formed. It's a brand new board formed this past summer. We've had six regular meetings. In addition to that, we've created a bylaws subcommittee, which has met three times, and then a separate work plan subcommittee, which has met twice. Our board has spent time reviewing the city code that created our board, reviewing public record and open meeting law statutes, and as you'll hear more about in just a minute, reviewing the public comment policy. We've heard presentations from Assistant City Manager Evan Raleigh, from City of Raleigh's many offices. We've heard from the Attorney's Office, the Communications Office, the Office of Community Engagement, and we also heard a presentation from Mickey Fern, who attended one of our meetings and reviewed his March 2021 Raleigh Community Engagement Report. And again, there's a, a handout in front of you that reviews all these activities, but something that I want to highlight for you is our draft mission statement. I'm going to read this to you. Our draft mission statement is to nurture a citywide approach to community engagement that promotes radical inclusion through trust, transparency, and mutual respect. As I mentioned, this is a draft. We created this draft by taking all the information that was provided to us about why council created our brand new board. We took all that information and attempted to distill it into a mission statement. This mission statement represents our understanding of why we were created and what we're being tasked to do. One of our main goals when creating this mission statement was to create something that could be put on a t-shirt. Not because we want to have t-shirts necessarily, but because our board wants to be out in the community and we know that the community deserves to understand why we exist, which is why we wanted a short, direct mission statement, something that would fit on a t-shirt. I mentioned this is just a draft. It's one of the many things we've created as we've worked on kickstarting our brand new board. When we were formed this summer, we voted to meet monthly, so we meet on the second Wednesday of each month. And as I mentioned, our subcommittees meet in addition to those regular meetings. We've established an email, community.engagement at raleighnc.gov, which is listed on the City of Raleigh's website. And anyone can email this, this address. We also voted to elect officers. I'm Sarah, I'm the chair. Apologies, this is me. My headshot needs to match my new haircut. Um, we have our board vice chair, Stacey Hua, who is in attendance today. And our board secretary is Tresana. Treshana Sanchez. And then our bylaws. From what I understand, it's relatively unprecedented for a group to form bylaws as quickly as we did. Our group came together after being formed this summer, immediately established a bylaws subcommittee, and worked diligently to create the first draft within a month. Our board then met as a group, reviewing, revising, making edits, finally arriving at a final version at our most recent meeting. This final bylaws draft has been submitted to legal, so we are working through legal's recommendations. If this draft is approved close to how we wrote it, then our bylaws will enable us to create three subcommittees, or I'm sorry, three standing committees, an outreach committee, a policy committee, and an equity committee. We would ask each of our board members on the community engagement board to join at least one of these standing committees, and our belief is that we can use these three standing committees to fulfill our mission. Each of these standing committees would be able to create action teams. Those are sometimes called task forces. We'd like to call them action teams. 
Each of those standing committees would be able to create action teams to carry out specific projects. And I can talk more about what mean, we mean there by projects in just a minute. You know, we, get, we need to get these bylaws approved before we can draft a work plan. A work plan is what we'll submit to you, our mayor and city council, to outline the projects that we're taking on. And our group is so eager to begin that while our bylaws are being reviewed by legal, we've also already begun drafting a work plan based on our mission. We understand that we will have to change this work plan depending on the feedback from the bylaws. Nonetheless, we are excited to have started the process and we ask that you look forward to seeing our request to join a future city council meeting agenda to present this work plan to you. Finally, I mentioned that our hope is to have these three committees so that we can carry out projects as part of our work plan. I'd now like to share an example of what it could look like when our board partners with you on projects. The Office of Community Engagement helped our board understand more about your request regarding a review of public comment policy. At our most recent board meeting, we reviewed public comment policy, specifically the city of Raleigh's policy, but we also looked at other policies in other cities. As a board, we discussed what it's like to share a public comment, something that many people on our board have done and something that many people on our board admitted to being afraid to do. There are three pieces of feedback from our board that I hope to review with you briefly. The first is what we're calling a customer service mindset. I'm a local business owner, and there are a few local business owners on our board. Many of us relate to this idea of a customer service mindset, the idea that we should understand and empathize with what our customers experience when they work with us, that we should focus on delighting our customers. With that mindset in mind, our board talked about what it's like for our Raleigh community members to share a public comment. And we agreed as a board, in general, the process of coming to share a public comment is incredibly intimidating. I can tell you that personally, I'm a trained speaker. I've been trained to speak to audiences around the world, and yet I was incredibly nervous to come here and speak with you this morning. There's a certain amount of formality speaking up in local government, and there's a concern for your reputation when you know that your comments will be recorded. There's a concern, an amount of pressure for representing yourself and your community correctly I probably don't have to say much more about what that feels like to a group of people who are well aware of what it means to speak publicly and on record. But here's why this is relevant. If we know that our Raleigh neighbors may be nervous speaking up and sharing a public comment, then we might consider things we can do. That's what we mean by a customer service mindset. The Community Engagement Board recommends that council consider how we can make the process of sharing a public comment, frankly, less scary and more engaging for the community. Specifically, we recommend that you consider creating a potential minimum, a minimum amount of time for public comment. So for example, you might establish that public comments can be up to three minutes, but at a minimum, 90 seconds. I can tell you that personally, as someone who prepares remarks, I would prepare for those 90 seconds, and I would have available comments ready in case the full three minutes were available to me. The point being, by making a minimum and making that minimum very public, you would help those who are nervous about speaking up, which our board is thinking of as a customer service mindset, the opportunity to not only understand our customers, but to delight. The second two items on here will take me a bit less time to explain. The second one is pretty clear, marketing. Creating a clear, easy to repeat, easy to understand policy. We think that it would be incredibly impactful if the process and options for posting a public comment were really clear, like radically clear. As I've watched city council meetings, I've noted that members of council and the mayor often remind people that they can finish their remarks by sending emails or leaving a voicemail. From witnessing that encouragement, it seems as though there's opportunities to help our community better understand public comment policy. It's our board's feeling that there can be increased marketing around these potential options for public comment. Perhaps more importantly, there might be an opportunity to simplify public comment options, to make them clear and easy to share so that everyone in our community can be aware of how to share a public comment. Finally, there was a third suggestion raised by some on our board of creating more focused spaces for public comment. Specifically, some on our board who have experience with public comment remarked that often comments related to zoning can take more time and that there are often more folks who want to speak about rezoning. Our board would like to suggest that there may be an opportunity to create focused public comment spaces. For example, a meeting that's specifically inviting public comment on rezoning issues. Doing so may help to split zoning comments from other meetings and might help to make overall a more streamlined process. These are three recommendations that our board has after reviewing public comment policy, but please allow me to draw your attention to the highlighted section on the slide. The board would love to continue investigating this policy and soliciting ideas and feedback.
from the community. I want to speak about that highlighted portion briefly. The Community Engagement Board, as I've mentioned, is filled with passionate, experienced people who are dedicated to community engagement. That being said, this board does not wish to be, please forgive my metaphor, a Jedi Council. For those who are unfamiliar with the Star Wars reference, a Jedi Council, as you can imagine, is a group of Jedi elders who sit in a high tower and offer wisdom and judgments. No one on the Community Engagement Board, I cannot stress this enough, no one believes that the Community Engagement Board itself has all the answers. The board is eager to go seek the answers in partnership with you. We do not wish to be the Jedi Council. We are not the ones with the answers. Instead, we hope you think of us as amplifiers. We want to go out into the community. We want to take problems or projects like the idea of investigating public comment policy and go out into the community and hear from voices who might not yet have been asked about issues such as these. Then in turn, we also hope to have a sincere partnership with you. We want to learn more about what you're doing and amplify that to the community. Something that I was reflecting on as I was preparing these remarks is your comments to Nick Robertson, the Hunger and Nutrition Director from the Urban Ministries of Wake County, who spoke at a public a comment at, a, I think it was the January 17th afternoon meeting. Uh, after you heard his public comment, uh, Madam Mayor, you mentioned that your hope was that some of the grant opportunities that are available could have more awareness, quote unquote, out in the community. This is a perfect example of something that the Community Engagement Board would also be supportive of. How can we, as the Community Engagement Board, do that, that really hard work of getting messages out into the community, especially into communities that have been underrepresented and underserved? How can we amplify messages from the communities across Raleigh and work to bring those messages back to you with a bias toward action? Hopefully what I just shared related to public comment policy is a helpful example. If we as a board take on projects like reviewing public comment policy, certainly we can come together as a board and propose initial ideas. But we feel that we'll be doing the most service if we're tasked with amplifying this question out to the community, collecting responses from across Raleigh's communities with a focus on underrepresented groups, coming together as a board to organize that feedback with a bias toward action, and then amplifying potential ideas back to council. That is what this board could look like. For a city as large as ours, it might make sense to some that not everyone feels their voice is being heard. But we as a community engagement board are challenging that notion. And we're emboldened to consider a different reality. I'll quote our mission statement here. Again, it's just a draft. We're emboldened to consider a reality, a Raleigh, that nurtures a citywide approach to community engagement that promotes radical inclusion through trust, transparency, and mutual respect. I'm here in service today. I want to thank you for this time. Next up, I'm looking forward to joining you in hearing from Taisha Hinton. Next, at the conclusion of Taisha's presentation, I'll be available alongside Taisha to answer any questions you might have about our board. Sincere thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah. And as she stated, we'll get through the presentation and then at the end, <clears throat> we will take questions. All right, so now I, we also wanted to provide the opportunity for you to meet members of the Community Engagement Office. We are small and mighty. Uh, that's me. I've been a part of the team since September of 21. My fun fact is that I met my favorite rapper, which just happens to be Sean Carter, also known as Jay-Z. So, if you would like a consultation about how to meet your favorite rapper, let me know. Um, this is Ellen. She joined the team in January of 22, and she's not here today because her daughter is graduating high school. So, um, hey, Ellen, don't watch this. We'll talk later. Um, but she, she sends her regards. We also have Deborah, who joined the team in September of 22. Um, her fun fact confused me, so I'm going to try. So she performed on stage at the um, production of Mamma Mia, and I did not know what that was. And she said, well, have you heard of ABBA? And I said, no. And she goes, listen, listen, thank you. And she goes, well, I know every word to ABBA. And so it just made sense for me to perform in this production. So... That's her story, and I hope it makes sense to y'all, because I did not. <laughs> She's actually not feeling well, but I will, I will add it to her performance measure. So, gotcha. Um, okay. 
and him on Halloween um, last year. He just joined us in November, and he's still hanging on. So um, thank you, Dale. And his fun fact is that he was a substitute teacher for a year. And God bless him, because that is not my ministry. But he did it for a full year. So um, that's our office. If you cannot tell, we have fun. We cultivate a culture of fun. We get the work done. But um, I really could not do this without y'all. So thank you so much. All right. What in the world is community engagement? When our office is talking about the term community engagement, we are referring to any process that provides the opportunity to involve the community members in how we solve problems and make decisions. Um, you'll see here, oftentimes you hear, and I say this a lot, engagement and outreach are different. Engagement is when you allow the public to participate in a process. You can see in this photo that the person is learning how to make that coffee or tea, right? Versus on the next slide, when we talk about outreach, the person's just getting the tea poured into their cup. So outreach is when you're allowing the public to receive information or a message. Um, our office, again, was formed in September of 21 when I came on board, and I want to talk a little bit about what we were charged with at that time. And it was to advance the city's goals of improving and reimagining our community engagement efforts. And then I wanted to just show you what that looks like. That's partnering with community groups, that's identifying processes and figuring out what works well and what doesn't. That's establishing this lovely board that you see and just heard from today. It's, it's still amazing to me how I get to go from having a conversation with you all about an idea and seeing it come to life. It's, it's really a blessing to have that opportunity. Uh, we were also charged with helping to encourage active participation in decision making and public policy dialogue. And for us, that's just establishing meaningful relationships with community groups. It's working with our peer departments of explaining the why in our messaging. Why are we doing this? What are we trying to obtain? Sharing information and outreach. And so although we did have a September work session with our office and we talked about some of our projects with the new council, I just wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to share this information with y'all as well. So this is what our office has done so far. Um, when I say consultations and partnerships, this is with my lovely colleagues over here. I, I do want to acknowledge them too. Thank you, everyone who's worked with our office so far. Thank you for taking risk. Thank you for having uncomfortable conversations and doing things a little bit differently. We appreciate it. A consultation is when we meet with the department to talk about what their project is, what are their engagement goals, we talk through anticipated questions and stakeholder concerns, and then we help them to create an engagement technique. So uh, we don't want every member of the public to just come, listen to a presentation, have a Q&A, and then go home. <laughs> so um, thank you to my colleagues for that. Um, so the items in green we've completed already. You'll see we work with the Raleigh Police Department, Raleigh Water, Transportation, Parks and Cultural Resources, and Budget Management Services. Uh, we've also worked with planning and development. Uh, we are a partner currently on the More Homes, More Choices events that we're having. Um, we have worked with the city manager's office, the public project community support front. The, uh, we were actually accepted by UNC's for the Local Government Language Access Collaborative. The City of Raleigh partnered with um, a local community organization, which is the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. And so we're working with UNC and build it integrated communities to create a language access plan. We're really looking at how are we communicating with community in their language and how we can be better at that. So we'll be bringing that back to you soon. And then you'll see um, all of our involvement with the city's strategic plan. And when we're not doing consultations or partnerships with city departments, we have our own office initiatives, believe it or not. Um, on the screen, you'll see that we are working on a drop-in youth program with PRCR, where we want to help reduce barriers to participating for parents, whether it be in the evenings or on the weekends. And so we want to standardize the ability for people to have activities for their youth at our events. And so we'll thank you to 
Parks for being our partner there. Our Community Connectors program is up and running and they support the community, the public project community support fund. Uh, there are some items we did under the Vote Local initiative. We also led the City Council Terms and Compensation community meetings the board, which you just heard from, and then our office supports all of the staff liaisons who support boards and commissions. Um, that has been such an experience and just learning for the needs of board and commission members and um, their experiences as serving as a volunteer to, to your boards. And so one thing that we've heard regularly from board and commission members is the need and or the option to have their meetings remotely um, due to accessibility, due to transportation, due to in some cases just convenience. So currently all boards and commissions in their committees are meeting in person. And so um, we wanted to bring that to your attention and then I'm gonna turn it over to the city attorney to kind of have a conversation with you about what the options there or the potential are for your boards or commissions. Oh, okay. Um, well, we've had a question over and over. Can y'all hear me? Yes, uh, we can. Again. I don't know if the public can. Yeah, it's just not up. Is that better? Yes. Um, yeah, the question has come up again and again about remote meetings outside of a state of emergency. If you remember before the pandemic, we didn't really ever have um, remote meetings or remote public comment or an occasion someone may call in. Um, after um, COVID-19, the legislature actually passed uh, a statute that governs when uh, city councils and other government boards can um, have remote meetings and remote public comment. Sorry, I'm just trying to make it easier for me to, to speak. Those rules are very specific and they apply in a circumstance only when the governor or the general assembly has declared a state of emergency. And what that statute does that was never allowed before is to allow public participation remotely, two-way simultaneous communication. So once the state of emergency was uh, repealed or ended, we go back to the rules that were in effect before the pandemic. And under that situation, and I've had a lot of people tell me, why don't you, why do you disagree with the School of Government? Well, I don't. Everything that I'm telling you is consistent with their publications and their professors. I've had discussions with them. I've done seminars with them. I've read everything they've ever written. And the consensus is that the city councils and a governing board cannot hold a remote meeting and have remote participation absent a state of emergency. Now, when it comes to boards and commissions, the rules are potentially a little bit different. Um, there is a statute that was enacted in 1979 called electronic meetings. And it allows, um, I'll get the exact wording here. It allows you to have an electronic meeting when a public body meets by telephone or electronic means and members of the public are allowed to listen to the meeting. So that, if you'll notice, listening to the meeting is not simultaneous communication, okay? So that electronic meeting statute was actually passed way back when. It was not intended at the time it was passed to be um, a regular type of meeting that took place. It was more like an emergency. There's a hurricane, we've gotta to get together, that kind of thing. But I think the consensus now is, is that given the change in technology, that it could potentially be used for boards and commissions if they wanted to have some type of electronic meeting as long as they were willing to do that and allow the public to listen but not participate. So that's, uh, you may have a board or commission that just needs to conduct business and doesn't have a public comment period, and they could potentially do that electronically, and that's consistent, I think, with the interpretation of the School of Government. Now, um, I think there's some considerations to that. I think we can look, look into it and see what the options are. There are some boards and commissions, first of all, let's just pull out quasi judicial. They, they are not, they can never meet remotely or, any, or electronically unless there's a state of emergency. There are all sorts of due process issues. But if an uh, uh, advisory board wanted to do that, um, the question would be, 
you know, do you do it every time? Do you do it every other time? Do you do it when, the, when you feel like it or you don't? And then you got to think about notice to the public. You know, they want to know, are you going to be electronically or in person? And if you want to hear from them, you want to be in person that time. So I think those are kind of issues to think about before you say, oh, all the boards are going to meet electronically to make sure that you decide or the board decides or council decides what that looks like and what the, um, what the purpose is. There are a lot of people that, and I hear from people too, there are a lot of people that really want to meet electronically. There are other people who say, we don't know how to meet electronically. We want to come in person. So I think that there's things to think about, but that is a potential option that's out there. Now the other question I got um, was if you can't do remote public comment in electronic meeting, could you do the voicemail public comment option that the council now has where there is uh, an option to call in and leave a voicemail which is simultaneously transcribed and then provided to the council before the meeting. I think that that's a possibility. We're looking at it more closely just to make sure before I tell you 100% it's, it's okay. I think it would be okay. I think the question then was to talk to, I see Lou's over there, not looking over here, about you know the, the logistics <laughs> of having that voicemail for every single every single meeting for, you know, numerous boards and, you know, how do you staff that and do that, but I think that that's an option. So in sum, the council is uh, outside of a state of emergency, needs to meet in person. Uh, board and commission could potentially use an electronic meeting option um, with the knowledge that they could not allow the public to call in. Um, they could potentially allow them to do public comments through a voicemail option, and you can always have the email option for them to communicate. So that's basically a summary of everything. I know there are people who disagree with me. I respectfully, uh, I respect their disagreement. Uh, that is my position, and um, <laughs> I guess I've, I've had a lot of arguments with me, but you know, I'm not going to change my opinion. But you know, y'all can decide what you want to do based on on my advice and go forward from there. Just a question for clarification. Um, so a board or commission can meet electronically, but the pub, that's only if they do not allow public comment. So if they need public comment, they would have to meet in person. Yes, yes, the statute says that there's a place to listen. And let me, let me just explain, you know, this, if we could do, all of the things that you did during the state of emergency under the electronic meeting statute, we wouldn't need a new statute. So um, before the new statute, when we were first starting the pandemic, we were trying to shove that theory into the electronic meetings. And then, I mean, I guess our lobbyist is here, and the General Assembly basically said, no, you can't, that's, that's not going to work. We are going to let you do this during COVID because of safety issues, and we're going to tell you how to do it, but you can only do it during a state of emergency, which we are in essence controlling. Follow-up question, which boards do public comments? Do you know? Does anybody I know? don't have that full list, but we can look into it and get it for you. Yeah. Now, the Planning Commission is a big one. They, you know, they're the zoning review board. Um, right. And I, so I think they definitely like would, and you know, I don't know whether even what their thoughts are on that. I will say something else is that the statutes don't contemplate a mix. You're either electronically or you're or you're not, and because the rules are are somewhat different, you have no, one kind of notice rules over here and another kind over here. So we can't. There's not an option for like a hybrid. It's just uh, not under virtual. the statutes right now. There isn't. Can I ask a question about the statute? So thank you so much for the clarification on what is legal right now. How, as a council, can we help advocate for a change in that? What, what does that process look like? Is that something we, that we we've can do? done that? Actually, I, sh I was just talking to yeah. Philip about that. Um, Philip, could you um, speak to this for a moment, please? Yeah, please. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. Totally up to you. Do you mind? Yep. How are y'all? Thank right. you, Christina. Very good. Uh, when this, when we had the pandemic, uh, Robin and I, and by the way, I'm Philip Isley, I'm a lobbyist, former city councilor. Raleigh resident. Nice to see everybody. Um, Robin and I met with the Press Association in particular, and effectively, Robin and I worked out 
what the best we could do within the guidelines that the General Assembly was allowing us sort of the lane to travel in. And there was a ton of pushback for four or five days. Yeah. We had iteration after iteration. And the Press Association was primarily the driving force of limiting how broad this could be because they were scared of notice issues. They were scared they couldn't get folks there to, to cover the meeting. Um, and that's really what happened in 2020, <laughs> April, May of 2020. Uh, we did a lot of work on the quasi-judicial. That yes. was the thing that was the most difficult. Um. Well, you know, we have a very robust board of adjustment. And Raleigh is different than many cities in the state. You know, a lot of cities didn't have the same issues that we had, just the volume of things that we deal with on a week weekly basis and a monthly basis really put us in a different sphere from the standpoint of what we needed to make sure that if the Board of Adjustment is meeting remotely and there's a due process issue, that all of a sudden someone's not a year into their building project and there's a challenge and the challenge is upheld and all of a sudden you have a building project that stops in the ground. So those were the real, the, the, the things that mattered a lot to sort of us as a community, how we build things, how we approve things. But it, I was just telling the mayor, uh, trying to fix this outside of a state of emergency. I think the press association would not like that at all. There would be pushback from that. There are a lot of open government transparency groups out there that also don't like this idea of remote meetings. But, you know, we can certainly try at any time. I just, I, I would not give this a high set success probability of passage. And there's been bills on the, um, that have been filed by other um, cities, um, the Mujib's bill has been filed. This is a lawyer from Monroe. Um, uh, several sessions, and I don't know that's ever got a hearing. Then that's to ask what you're asking. Others have tried. There we go. Thank you. Um, I had to step out for, for a minute, so I missed a little piece of this. And I think everybody who serves on our various boards and commissions, they're all doing great work, so I'm not trying to minimize it. But, I, uh, but there is a difference, say, between the Planning Commission or the Board of Adjustments and BPAC or the Community Engagement Board. Um, and we talked yesterday about the risk management of decision making. And in my opinion, letting groups like BPAC, Community Engagement Board, Police Advisory Board that aren't doing sort of this either quasi-judicial work or this work like the Planning Commission does in making recommendations, I don't see the harm in letting them meet virtually um, until someone tells us to stop, in my opinion. Like if BPAC wants to meet, meet virtually, if the Police Advisory Board, Community Engagement Board, I'm, I would be fine with that. And I also think from a staff perspective, we know that we're extremely limited in the Raleigh Municipal Building with facilities that can live stream and we're over-programmed in the council chambers right now. It's because all of those groups also, because they want to promote access, are meeting in there. And so I think from a staff standpoint, it would be easier to let some groups meet virtually, um, but not all of them. I don't think we can say we want the Board of Adjustments or Planning Commission, but our the ones that are constructed just to serve as volunteers on like specific topics, I would be fine if they met virtually via like the city Zoom account or something in a way that it can be recorded and people can watch it back. I will say that that you do have to provide a way for someone to hear it when it's going on. You don't have to you don't have to pull them in a um, in a Zoom meeting, but you would have to have some kind of some way to listen. What some places have done and even did in the pandemic was have a number that you can call and listen to. So it doesn't have to be big and fancy, but you do have to let somebody listen as they're as they're. Um, I, I served on a board during the pandemic, and I know you guys used a like a system that allowed the public to join and listen they couldn't like say anything but we could see there's like oh there's five people in the listening room and then like we just continued with the conversation so is the software like still available is it something that we got rid of during the that's above my pay grade <laughs> <I'm> sorry <laughs> i apologize yeah. it's still available we uh, renewed the licenses for webex so okay. that it's still webex. available yeah. webex is still I was curious. We we are often told that there are um, cities, 
city governments who are, uh, like governing boards who are still operating in a hybrid model. I'm curious what, if you're aware, like what rationale they're using that allows them to, to like be operating differently than? Uh, they're aware of the rules and they're deciding to do it anyway. Um, I've talked to them, they are just like, we're, we're gonna take our chances, you know. I'm also aware of some of our own groups doing that. Some of our some of our own like BPAC like groups, but not BPAC, that are doing a hybrid. So, well, and as I said, I'm here to give you um, advice, and you know you can follow it or, or or not. You know, I'm I'm giving you my interpretation of the statutes and trying to give you the best options that I can give you um, that I think would be safe. But you know. Again, like Jonathan said, you know, it may be if the cemetery board meets remotely and takes public comment that it's not going to be the end of the world. So, not to diminish their work, just saying. Right. Well, right, 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 right. <laughs> well, and Philip, I know you're going to do an overview late, later, but, you know, s some of what we rely on is your relationships and what you do. And, you know, one of the things that I have heard and sort of experienced and, you know, hear it from my delegation, folks pay more attention to what happens in Raleigh than what they do what's going on in Carborough. And so Carborough could be, and I'm not saying it's Carborough, I'm just using them as an example, <laughs> but Carborough could be out setting the whole thing on fire and they don't care, but the second we just strike the match before we light anything, they're on top of us is, is my understanding, so. Well, and look, I'm, you're exactly right. Um, I can get into all this when I speak, which I think is right after community yeah. engagement. <laughs> um, so w w why don't we hold that? But that is absolutely true. And I'll get into some of those details why I don't care what any other municipality in Wake County does. They don't live there. They live here for three-fifths of the week in a legislative session. They pay attention to what Raleigh does. They, pay, they watch our news. They watch our news. They, they read our newspapers. They're effectively residents and constituents of every one of you for the three-fifths of a week they're here during the long and short session. So that is different. And no other city in the state has that. So, you know, I'm their city councilor. They look at me. I mean, I, I truly have people still calling me saying, hey, my garbage is getting picked up at the apartment complex. I'm like, well, it's a private company, not the city's problem. You know, talk to your apartment manager. But, I mean, that's truly, that is not an exaggeration. That's just the way it is. But you're right, and we'll get further into that when I speak. I just want to say how much I appreciate you doing the research into the statutes and giving us your point of view. I do want to go on record saying that I think it's something worth pursuing, but I don't want to like say that like that's going to necessarily be like what happens with the considerations from council. But I do think um, one thing that I hear a lot of is that these meetings need to be live streamed. So if we can't move forward on necessarily having them be virtual or hybrid or whatever, I do think we need to sit and think intentionally about how we can get these meetings live streamed and recorded um, because people would like to be able to engage with it who may not be able to come to the meeting. So if we can't do the boards and commissions, yeah, the boards yeah. and commissions meetings, if we can't do um, virtual because so, of the risk associated with that, then I would, I would love to, for us to figure out a direct way for us to get, and I know it's a logistical issue and we've talked about it, um, and as you mentioned, it has to do with just like the capacity of people at the city to be able to record the meetings, but I think we should be intentional about that if we can't do the other thing. That, that's all I'm going to say. Do you mind if you go, to go, go ahead. Go ahead. And then right back to yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to uplift what uh, Councilor Melton said, and even if it's a, that we start small and we say, here are some boards and commissions that I don't think would push the envelope to the extent, like I'm not asking for all of them to, to do it. And, and so I just want to uplift what you said because I completely agree with that. I was going to say, I think we need to identify which boards and commissions we're really talking about because like Planning Commission, you can, it's, it's on TV. Yeah. It's, it's live streamed as well. So I think what we need to do is figure out a subset, because I think we got almost, what, 40 boards or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we really need to identify which boards we're talking about and look at it from that standpoint. Because some of the boards are already, you know, I, I can go online and find a meeting from, you know, 1972 if, yeah. if I wanted to. Um, I'll go to Gail's office. <laughs> Gail will tell you what happened. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, I think the last thing I'll add is some of our boards and commissions are meeting in the council chambers at the municipal building. Yeah. And that is the only facility, something I learned when I got elected, where we can live stream from, right. which is a whole problem we have with the current building. So if you're meeting at the municipal building, not in council chambers, they, they don't have the tech to do it. And so that we're over-programmed in council chambers, which makes it hard for us to schedule our committee meetings and stuff. Um, but I know like the police advisory board, they meet at the Pathway Center. There's no way to live stream that. And before they were meeting at the Pathway Center during COVID, they were on Zoom. So it was a lot easier to watch. And so I do think that I don't want to say rank because I don't want to say any board is more important than another. But for purposes of risk management, I think it would be helpful to send directed to staff to say, will you bring to us a group of boards and commissions that you think are low risk that we can just get set up on the city streaming and let them meet that way? And then the ones that we know need to meet in person, make sure they have priority for the council chamber so that they can be live streamed there. Well, so just a point of yeah, clarification, okay. <laughs> obviously we're live streaming today from here, yes, so right. it can be done. I think um, to better clarify that is logistically with a very small communication and production staff, it is impossible for five meetings to be going on on one evening and it all be live stream. We just don't have the staff resources to do it. Yeah, um, I just meant the municipal built chambers is where it's built in. Like the yes, cameras are in the room. Easy. It requires no setup. That's yeah. the easy. There's a couple hours to make, to pull this off this morning. They were here at seven o'clock setting up after we broke it down last night in Durham to bring it back over here. So it is a lot of work that goes, not to say we can't do it. We just don't have the people to do it right now. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things I was going to um, suggest um, based on this conversation is that we ask staff to, first off, we have to look at capacity issues um, and weigh all this, but come back to us with a list of um, boards and commissions who you feel could be live stream, but look at the bigger issue too. We talked yesterday about staffing and capacity and, and other things and balancing all that. So um, if you could do something like that, bring it back to us and take all that into consideration, then we would have um, some good feedback. Thank you. Council Member four. I think the city manager kind of addressed it. I was going to say, I know we do have some meetings that are live streamed, like in conference rooms and stuff in the municipal building. So the staffing seems to be more of an issue than anything else. And I feel like that's where you can question, yes, we can live stream some, but where can we utilize a, a hybrid mentality in that sense? You know, which ones, if they can't be live streamed, if we don't have the staff for that, is that a board that we can use the virtual format, you know, that won't push the envelope with, with the General Assembly, you know, uh, like, again, not ranking, but saying this one won't push the envelope, so maybe we'll put this one hybrid to, to alleviate the taxing on the live streaming, which is clearly an issue because we're not staffed properly. And it's equipment as well. Yep, yeah. staff and equipment. So I have staff and money. capacity slash resources. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Good conversation. Okay, so we are going to, um, we do have a couple of slides just to show you the types of events that our office has attended in the community. Um, you can see all of the work that we do with departments and with community groups. So we love the chance when we get to go out into community. Just looking at the list, that Soul Food Juneteenth celebration at Roberts Park was so fun, right? And, and we <laughs> wish we could do more of that. Um, and then this slide here just shows you different groups that we've either presented to or had in com informal conversations about the work of our office. All right, menu time. Yay. Um, so we've talked about everything that we've done. Let's talk about the things that we want to propose to you as options that we can do. So in front of your menus, on the left side, you'll see items for selection. Um, and then on the right side, you'll see a price range and potential staff impact that ranges from low to high. So I'll keep that theme in conversation as we talk about the menu today. 
We're going to start off with the complimentary items, those that are on the house, i.e. you already paid for it and it's happening, right? Um, <laughs> so we've talked a lot about boards and commissions. Uh, we've talked about community connectors. Uh, these are just different forms of engagement, outreach, and education that currently happens. You all, we, we just talked significantly about public comment meeting, public comment periods at you all's meetings, at board and commission meetings. There are also, um, I will say the majority, if not every single city of Raleigh department has some form of outreach or engagement that they do on their own. And I just want to overemphasize how hard the departments work to get out into community, whether it's engagement, outreach, or education. We have the Raleigh Neighborhood Registry, Planning Academy, Neighborhood College, Leadership Academy. Um, as far as um, software, we use Engage Raleigh, which is also called Public Input. Shout out to Communications for their great work on social media, the city's website, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the things that are happening on the house, not really because it costs, but we're going with the cafe. You're with me? Okay, going with the thing. All right, so we are going to chat about this appetizer portion of your menu. These are some options that can you all could, if you so choose, take immediate option on with the cost ranging from low to medium. There are three pieces that we'll talk about slide by slide, quarterly town hall meetings, an engagement campaign, and then access to community centers for longstanding groups. So the very first one, currently uh, you all have town hall meetings twice a year. It's a recommendation that we look at um, increasing those to once a quarter. Um, you talked about wanting to have more in-person meetings with community, and so um, that is an option that we have on the table, something that's interim or immediate that can be done within zero to six months. We also are proposing an engagement campaign, and so what that means is just really streamlining our offline engagement options outside of city facilities. We do a great job like at community centers and things like that, but what about libraries? What about um, social services? What do we have at different bus stops and bus stations? And really working hard with communications to make it easier for members of the community to know not only what's going on, but how they can get involved outside of our website, outside of social media. How can we get to them to put things in front of them so that there's an opportunity for them to engage? Another option that we're putting in this appetizer section is access to community centers for citizen advisory councils. Um, we are saying that in the interim that there's an opportunity to offer some predetermined community centers for use. Uh, we work with PRCR, Parks, Recreation, Cultural Resources, to talk about if this was an action that council wanted to take immediately, what are all of the impacts? And those impacts are programming. Parks does programming six to eight months in advance. Summer camp is about to come up current usage, capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we're coming to you with these specific centers in the interim, if that's an immediate option that you all want it to take. Again, thinking about the, the items that I just named with availability, usage, and programming. This is one um, neighborhood center per district in the interim that would allow that immediate access that you all have heard of before and that you are familiar with. In the main course of your menu, we're talking about short-term options. So we just left what can be done in the interim or immediately. Now we're talking more um, six to 12 months. You're gonna hold me to that, but six to 12 months is what we're saying. And we're looking at um, the uh, potential staff impact and potential costs ranging from medium to high. Earlier or back in December, you all talked about a registry or a network for community groups. So we did some work to think about what that could look like. And it would be what we're naming right now an engagement network, an engagement network that would support um, organizations that extend beyond place-based interaction, meaning it's going to extend beyond where they live. Um, these are the types of groups that were or are formed around similar interests, values, and cultures. And it would provide the opportunity to expand the knowledge of city resources and services. 
Let's break that down a little bit more. What what kind of groups are we talking about? We're looking at self-identified grassroots affinity groups. It could be students. It could be churches, CACs, small nonprofits. Um, and, and we could work at defining what we mean by small. The IRS has a tier. They started like small at 100 and then 500. So we could work through that stuff later if that's something that you wanted us to move forward with. And the benefits that we've identified Yes, ma'am. Um, just a question. You said topics oriented. So could we have something, say, um, based, um, I'll just say commuter rail or transit or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then some of the benefits that we've identified so far uh, in doing so would be uh, our office would assist these groups with their coordination of meeting locations, and if they needed to request city staff for participation, um, they would also have access to predetermined community centers up to eight times a year. So that community center list would, that you saw a couple of slides ago would have to grow at some point. Uh, we would offer capacity building, like smart goal setting, strategic planning tools, we would offer partnership and collaboration, and then very similar to the Raleigh Neighborhood Registry, assist them with mailings and getting information out to their uh, determined group of people. Uh, we, want, we thought it was important to show you all the difference and, and similarities between the Raleigh Neighborhood Registry that currently exists and what we're proposing in this engagement network. So in both instances, there would be access to city equipment. Uh, there in both, um, instances, they would be the ability to apply for funding. So right now, that's already set with the Raleigh Neighborhood Registry. You see a lighter check under us because there's a potential for it, whether that be through the Public Project Community Support Fund or different grants that the Human Relations Commission does. There's just a lot of collaboration, especially because our office supports the staff liaisons of the boards and commissions, so we see that as inevitable. Um, they would have an analyst assigned to help them uh, the neighborhood cleanups would stay on the Raleigh Neighborhood Registry side, mailings, and then access to city facilities. I will admit that the folks in housing have way cooler equipment like snow cone machines and popcorn machines that our office does not have yet, but um, the city equipment may vary. And then just to show you the difference in the types of groups, right? So the registry currently supports HOAs, neighborhood associations, community watch groups, garden clubs, et cetera. And as I just defined uh, here today, the engagement network, engagement network could support the, the groups that you see on the screen. Some things for you to consider um, if you would like us to move forward with this. Uh, if there would be two different registrations for the public, which to some could be confusing. Um, our office that's small and mighty would need additional staff to support us in doing something like this. Uh, and then developing mechanisms to vet groups. So we talked about a, a small nonprofit. There has to be a process in place to actually confirm that that group meets that requirement. And then the support of those departments listed on the screen and probably more. So colleagues, if I call on you to help me, don't say I wasn't on the slide because I still need you. Um, and then <laughs> we're also on this main course, we're recommending uh, a regular meet and greets for service departments. A lot of your service departments already do this, right? They already do it. It would just be a matter of making it um, more regular and robust and doing so in a way where residents can continuously and regularly ask questions about city services. So this is nothing new. I'm taking no credit for this. Just how do we grow it? How do we expand it? How do we put our departments in front of community as much as possible without impacting operations? If you're still hungry, we're at the dessert part of the menu, right? And this is the, the really... Um, the stuff that, that's fun. It's all fun, but I'm excited to, to share this with you. Um, on the dessert, again, that, that potential staff impact and calls ranging from medium to high. Back at that meeting in December, we heard that you all want to see an external piece to our office. And so this external service unit could be dedicated to leveraging city services in collaboration with community groups to support community identified assets 
and address community identified needs. That word assets is critical. You have to be inside of community, right, to see what those assets are. You don't always know what it is unless you're a part of that group or that area. This would be the opportunity for us to really bring together individuals in the institution to work towards a common goal, and it's something that's bottom up and not top down. So with this external service unit, we would look at promoting asset-based community development, not just what the problems are, where the issues are, but where are the assets. And again, I talked about leveraging city resources to support those. Um, our office would co-develop the steps between this bright vision and the long-term implementation, uh, which is something often referred to as change mapping, and there would be education and utilization of city services and programs. Also on the topic of this external service unit, those city services, these are just examples on the screen. It could be more, it could be less, but how do we organize our resources around these community assets that exist? Um, our office will be a partner, really, in working through the problems, the options, and the implementation that's identified by community and support them in getting that brought to life. And then in order to do something like this, you all access to come to you with what it would take to happen. And these are just suggestions, but we're saying that it would take one coordinator per district to work with these groups. We would look at having community planners, community strategists, and then adding um, like an equitable impact manager in our office to make sure that the work is done in a way that's both efficient and equitable. And then lastly, on the dessert, dessert portion of your menu is looking at hosting a City of Raleigh Expo. So versus individual departments who do things, how do we bring the organization together regularly for people to come out to an expo, open house, something like that at the convention center where we would promote our services and stress opportunities to participate. All right, so now we're having our cafe conversation, which is just fancy for a question and answer session where we're gonna discuss the items that are here on the menu. And then after we have conversation, you have these table cards in front of you, and we're gonna ask you to go through them, check the ones that you like or would like us to look into, and we'll collect it in our to-go boxes. Get it? Y'all with me? Okay. I'm gonna allow you to facilitate, and then I'll answer the questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Taisha. Your group is phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, my eyes may be bigger than my stomach, so. <laughs> You're full? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I love your menu. There's so much here. Um, and I just want to lift up a couple of things. Um, on the appetizer menu, the engagement campaign, I just think would be fabulous, especially given the low resources we could get that going. Um, I would like to see access to community centers for CACs. These groups have been longstanding. They need opportunities to meet in person, which we've talked about, so I'm really excited for that. On the main course, your engagement network sounds fantastic. I love this idea, so thank you. Um, and I just want to bring up one of the complimentary items that I think could use some improvement. So this is on the public comment period, and I really appreciated the earlier conversation on that. So how to make people feel comfortable, confident, um, uh, feel capable to make a public comment. Um, I think one piece that we are missing in our meetings um, is that when we give our um, council concerns, so currently we do that in the afternoon, um, which is kind of interesting. A lot of times the public's not there for that afternoon meeting. So I think if we could actually give our council concerns um, just prior to public comment, it starts the conversation. It shows folks where we are, some of the issues that we're seeing. Sometimes it addresses the topic head on that the public has come there for, and it's more of a conversation conversation perhaps. Um, I think we also are dealing with a time constraint issue. So right now with public comment being attached to public hearings, our last public hearing meeting on Tuesday, 
was four and a half hours. Um, if we had had it on our regular January 3rd meeting and done public comment for an hour and a half prior, that would have been at least a six hour meeting starting at 7 p.m. That would have ended at one in the morning. I like to go to bed a little earlier than that. Um, so I really think we have to find a way to split those up. I'm personally willing to have one more meeting a month to do that so that we have ample time for both and we don't feel constrained on either side. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Thank you. And I will say I also have Dale from our office taking notes. So if you don't see me writing, we are capturing it. I think Councilmember Jones raised your hand up first. Oh, please go ahead. I forgot what All I was right. going to say. Um, I had a couple questions. Sure. Um, well, one of them, I think Councilmember Harris um, um, hit because it said splitting zoning comments. I think my question was, is the recommendation to create a separate meeting for public comment? But it sounds like that that's the route we may want to go. And I kind of like this idea that if we create a separate meeting for public comment, putting our council concerns on there as well, because those kind of mer are good together. Um, the reevaluating restrictions on the um, time limit for public comment and a potential minimum, um, a recommendation on that, because it could go two ways, right? It could be like the minimum is 90 seconds and then moving forward, the decisions made that's only 90 seconds. Um, and so I think that minimum is going to be important, but I do understand that I have given public comment before I was a council member, mm -hmm. and I'm a lawyer who speaks publicly in front of judges. I was terrified. Mm -hmm. And so I know how that feels, and a lot of people have to rehearse or write or practice. Yeah. And so if you practice for two minutes and then you're told one minute, that adds to your stress because now you're like, how am I going to get my message across in a minute? And that's another layer of anxiety. So I love this idea of a minimum amount of time, but I think it needs to be, we need to talk about what that looks like. Okay. And, and then the other piece is I ran a small nonprofit, LGBTQ nonprofit, and we didn't have a lot of money and everything we brought in, we gave to the LGBT Center of Raleigh back then, and we had to pay for community centers, and we were very program-based. And so this... Um, Engagement network is something I've been talking about probably for a year where other than the groups that qualify for the neighborhood registry, I'm very, very excited about that. And I think it'll do a lot of good for our community. Um, and so I would love to see that be a top priority. Um, the other thing that you mentioned about it may be confusing to have two different registries, I think we know on a back end for staff that they're housed in different departments, they're run by different people. But on the public facing side, on the website, I don't think they have to look that way. I think it could be a website that says, do you want to register your group for the city? And the first question is, are you this type of group? Or are you that type of group? And then it's going to split you off into a different area. I already know that people are trying to register for the neighborhood registry, go through the process, and then are told they don't qualify. So there is already some intake process. And I think if that happens, then they can just get sent to the community engagement office. Um, and then to the point about how do you verify I'm speaking from the nonprofit world. I mean, we all have, you have to register with the Secretary of State. Like, you could just ask for a copy of their tax form or something. All, quite honestly, all that's publicly available. Nice. And so, I mean, the, if staff had the capacity, y'all could probably jump on and just pull it. But maybe a volunteer. I don't know. <laughs> so no, those are my right. thoughts. With, with capacity, we could definitely do that. I think the mayor was next. Or I'm not sure who was next. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I have a few other points. I really think this conversation is great. I don't want to derail it, but I wanted to just bring up uh, two other questions that I, quick, hopefully quick questions. Um, I'd love, uh, after discussion, to learn more about the Community Connector program and how that works. Uh, it is a new program that we established, and I don't think I understand fully what those uh, individuals are in charge of sure. and how they connect to this. So I'd really like to understand that program a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then um, down at the dessert side when we talked about host city of raleigh expo i did just want to confirm we we used to have a neighborhood expo is this just an expansion of that or is it something completely different um the neighborhood exchange, exchange housing and neighborhoods yeah, yeah. yeah so it's, it's relative to like there are some city departments and there are other a lot of community groups that are there um the city of raleigh expo will be all city services related so this is an expansion of that X or of that, or is this an additional program? Well, it was thought of as something different, but we could definitely explore it as an expansion or a partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so You're much. You're welcome. And do you want me to answer your connectors question later or now? Um, I, I think it'll take a little bit more time, and okay. I don't want to derail the conversation, sure. so maybe a little later. So, a um, couple of comments. Sure. Um, I really um, like what 
Council Member Harrison and Council Member Melton said. And um, when I was taking notes, I thought the engagement campaign, the engagement network, meet and greets, um, you know, I was looking at trying to balance the cost um, in the investment, but those were three things that stood out to me. I know when we do ask a planner, um, especially when we're in a public space, there are people lined up waiting to talk. And um, so I think that that could be a really useful um, tool as well. Um, one question I had, and I've been trying to um, figure out how we get this done. We were talking about this before COVID hit, and that is actually going out in neighborhoods and door knocking, like dropping things off for people. I know we did that during the Dick's Edge study, but there are things that we discussed yesterday, such as um, the programs we have for people who might need tax assistance. Um, they don't know about it. How, are, how can we get the word out on those types of things, especially in key communities? And then the other thing I wanted to mention is just um, if, um, if we move public comment to its own meeting, I think that eliminates the issue of time. Every, everybody would get three minutes. And so I think that could be a good solution just all around. Can, can I just, just point something out? In your notebooks, our office did a um, kind of a benchmarking on many, many um, local governments and what their public comment rules are. So if you're kind of wondering what other places do, um, you've got that information in your notebook. Sorry. So first of all, Cut off. <laughs> oh, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. You're at large. Go ahead. Um, I did want to lift up the, the, meg, the regular meet and greets. Um, and I really would say not just for service departments, but really for all departments. Um, I think the public finds it challenging at times to get information from some of our departments. And so I think if we're out in the community um, doing presentations and giving folks an opportunity to ask questions and access um, staff, that would be great. And then this is something that you don't have on your board, but I, th I think we, um, the city manager and I had, may have had a conversation about it at one point in time. Um, but having at least one um, event per year for the boards and commissions to kind of come together, yes. one of the challenges is you've got different boards and commissions that may be doing some overlapping in terms of work, but because they don't have an opportunity to uh, interact together, um, there could be some concerns. So certainly trying to add at least one meeting a year where they can kind of come in and have some conversations about what their you know work plans are, what they're mm -hmm. thinking about doing in the future would actually eliminate some of that overlapping. So. so just to follow up on that, we did something, again, before COVID, we did Raleigh Unleashed. We brought all um, representatives from all our boards and commissions together, and they came up with all these ideas. Um, that all, it, that is still in my office. Mm -hmm. And I will share that with you, Taisha, but it, that all kind of went away during COVID. And the, one of their top priorities was just that, meeting um, on an annual basis, bringing them all together so they could learn from each other, learn what the other's doing, what overlaps, what they might um, collaborate on, what not. So I would really like to see that happen. Yeah, thank you. They're actually having those, so we meet with them every other month. Uh, with the staff liaisons and we're having that conversation now um, there they've lifted up what you all have talked about and they've also talked about how do they get together to have fun um, so we're trying yep. to figure out so how to make that work <laughs> yep so thank you so first of all thank my fellow council members because they've said a lot of things here that I've written notes on a um, couple things I want to mention too in, as well as as far as CACs and, and meeting in, in community centers um, not all of our CACs are meeting. Um, some have not met in since pre-COVID. Yep. So how do we bridge the gap in those communities in those areas to make sure those residents are still receiving information? So that needs to definitely be addressed and looked at. Um, also, when we talk about boards and um, commissions and, and meeting, um, I think it was our first DIA chair came together, put a proposal together about having some of our boards have liaisons. I remember like human relations and the fair housing board or any, and things of that nature. Um, that may be something also to revisit um, where we can deal with that overlap of how different boards communicate with each other 
um, I do remember um, that conversation. Also, pre-COVID, um, it's funny, we're talking pre-COVID and living with COVID mm-hmm. now these days. But pre-COVID, um, I had in-person um monthly meetings, district meetings, um, and I purposely didn't use community centers. Um, I used, I set it up and I did it myself and worked and brought people in. That is something that I just want to put out there as fellow council members. You can do. You can have your meeting, and one thing that we always said is that if we want to bring city staff or city one into our meetings, um, just let the council know. Um, so everybody knows what's going on and sharing it. Um, I know in District D, um, Councilwoman Crowder, um, both Crowders, they had district meetings. And that's where I kind of got the idea from of doing that. Um, we first met at my district meeting. Um, so that's something I want to talk about. I definitely want to put out there that it doesn't necessarily have to be quarterly. I'm hoping to bring them back in person sooner than later. Um, but that's kind of where we are. But I like the idea of formalizing the engagement network um, because I think sometimes things are too haphazard and we have to be intentional um, and being intentional and working towards that I think is key and I want to go back to um, the comments that were made um, by the chair when we talk about public comment mm-hmm. and reviewing it thank you and I do challenge and ask that our community engagement board does continue to look at that public comment piece because it's not just public comment at our meetings. It's how do we look at it overall? You know, how do you talk to that teacher who just worked all day with, with these children? And, yeah, I said it like these children out here. <laughs> and, you know, they don't want to come to a meeting, you know, or they're trying to do dinner. They're trying to get things set up. I know we've made some changes and adjustments. Uh, one of the questions that we had when, on our 1 o'clock, on our 11th, uh, yeah, 1130, our second meeting of the month, public comment used to be a little later. That was intentional because they said, well, people leaving lunch are going off, we come in. Now we move it up to the very beginning to help give people some um, predictability of that time. So I think that's very key and being intentional. And then that's the other question. If we go and decide to have, which I do agree, have a separate public comment meeting, is that going to be just that one meeting per month? Are we still going to have it? Like we have to be, make sure we're clear in the direction that we're going um, as far as that. If we say, hey, we're going to have one special meeting only for public comments, and it's just going to be this time once a month, are we still going to look to have public comment throughout the regular meeting? Is, um, is that so, something that our community engagement board can come back to us with? On, on that's why I'm mentioning it. Yeah, that's why I'm mentioning it, so that they can go back and think about that as you're looking at this um, wholeheartedly. Um, and I think that's everything I have because I just want to get it all out there while I had it now. And just, again, thank you all for your work. I know some of you have been in this for many, many years, and some have been it for a few months. But I just, again, thank you for your work and thank for our um, quasi-judicial member, uh, I see former councilman um, Stevenson, Russ Stevenson's here, that he still shows up at our meetings recording us and taking pictures. So uh, I definitely want to thank you for everything that you continue to do. Yeah, he probably... <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I'm Pat. I want to say thank you to Talisha and Dr. Sarah and the rest of the Community Engagement Board for all of the work that you've done. I actually had the pleasure of attending the Community Engagement Board meeting last month. Um, and so I know I got the I got this presentation before everybody else did. <laughs> so I know that this um, conversation has developed and grown in a very short amount of time. It's only been a few weeks since then. Um, So I just want to thank everybody for that, for the work that's been done to make this conversation happen today. Um, I think minimum times for public comment is important. Uh, As somebody who also has come to speak to council before, it's very difficult sometimes uh, just not knowing what your time is going to be when you get up there. So sometimes you can plan for that one minute and 30 seconds and just keep it keep it moving from there and know that that's all you have. 
I do think that it offers partnerships for deeper alignment with the communication, specifically something I'm thinking, because I've done public comment to the utilities councils. Um, and we, when we did it, it was specifically talking about, of course, environmental issues. But we had an infographic on how to do public comments and the do's and don'ts of how to, how to engage with people just like that process of teaching people how to do public speaking and informing them on how to do things. Um, and I thought it was very interesting because members of the Community Engagement Board didn't even know what the public comment process was like during the meeting. They were like, what is this? How do you do this? And I think it's very interesting that the members of the board were also not that aware of this process. I think it speaks to the ongoing issue that we have around the city. Um, so I just think there could be deeper alignment there for what we are doing and how we're being creative, creative when we're talking about radical inclusion and specifically radical communication. Um, also, I wanted to note something else that I talked about or heard during the community engagement board, I did not talk, uh, was uh, public comments is also about we, how we as council engage with the people who are coming to speak because it's a lot for us for people who are coming who are planning for a specific time and their time is reduced because we have time constraints and then they're talking to council about issues that are very important to them and we're not really get, like paying attention or like looking at them. We may be looking at our phones. Um, I just think there could be some decorum that is set on our end in the same way we have decorum for the people who are coming to speak on how we are engaging and making sure we're paying attention and just giving space for their concerns and letting people know that we care and we're not just like, okay, next person, that's nice. Um, as far as the community engagement network, uh, I think we have to be intentional about who we're sponsoring um, and maybe just get some more feedback on what are like the rules of who can come into this network? Because my fear is that we're just gonna get like some people that may wanna use our services for using public spaces and being in our community engagement or our engagement network that aren't, their, their vision and their mission may not necessarily align with the vision and the mission of the city as a whole. Um, hate groups is something that I think of. Uh, so just like making sure that we're able to mitigate the possibility of that, but, but also leaving it open to, because we had, it's pretty open use like church groups, community groups, student groups, and just making sure that the vision of these organizations can ultimately align with the city as a whole. Um, and I had one more point. Oh, as far as the external services unit, I think it gives us an opportunity to work with nonprofit organizations in the area that we didn't really get to work with before. So I would love for us to, because I hear a lot about like the very traditional nonprofits that the city works with. Maybe like we can work with some different types of organizations that could provide other sorts of services and just bring us into new networks and right ways of being with communities that we hadn't really had the chance to interact with on deeper levels. So those are my initial thoughts, just listening to the presentations. And I just want to say thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I co-signed co so much of what I'm hearing from my colleagues, so I don't want to, um, I don't want to like belabor the conversation by saying, yeah, that thing you said, and that thing you said, and that other thing you said. Um, I think we're having great conversations here, and there's a lot that we are all hoping um, to bring. I especially, um, I especially want to lift up using process changes that are available to us to create consistency, so something like altering our meeting structure so that we are creating consistency for ourselves as counselors for good governance, but also for our citizens, um, so there's plenty of time and space. Um, so I'm really loving that vibe. Um, my my question is more of just like a technical one. Um, Brentwood is no longer in District B, and I was not sure if that was an evaluation. Like Brent Abbotts Creek could not support the services suggested, and Brentwood was intentional, or if that was just a, uh, an old map that we were. I could have just been an oversight. We can get that fixed. The, I just wanted to follow up on um, Mayor Pretend Branch's comment about the person who can't come down and do the public comment. And we had a discussion about what other options do we offer. And the option we settled on based on the guidance of our city attorney was the voicemail public comment. I promoted that a couple times. And quite frankly, the feedback I got on, online was just like terrible. They're like, we don't want this. This isn't good. Council Member Black gets 
elected, tweets about it, and everyone's like, this is amazing, this is fantastic, thank you for this new service. So I'm like, well, she just needs to be the one, the one that promotes this. <laughs> I do think it is a good option because the voicemails are transcribed, they're put in our agenda material, we all read them, I read them, they're in there with the agenda. Yeah. So my, my question to the voicemail public comment is, when the Community Engagement Board looks at public comment in general, let's look at that too. Do, if we do a separate meeting for public comment, do we want to play the voicemails? Do we want to keep them transcribed? Um, if we do a separate meeting for public comment in person, do we want to do the voicemail option for the afternoon meeting? Um, so like, I think we need to be thinking about that, but better ways to promote it, um, and then how we want that piece to interact with this idea of a new meeting for public comment. In better ways outside of council member Black, because we could just use her to promote her. <laughs> she is now the spokesperson for voice for all public comment. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, just a couple items following up. Um, it would be wonderful to get a recommendation from the Community Engagement Board in February on this new public comment meeting um, and ideally starting it in March. I'm just going to put that out there. Let's get it going. Um, so if you all have the capacity, um, I would love to get your feedback. I think that would be very helpful on how do we establish this new meeting. Um, I would also put it out there for that kind of meeting, you know, it could be that council members, you know, provide some initial, hey, this is what I've been seeing in my district or across the city. Then we have our public comment period, and then every counselor has maybe we get timed uh, two minutes each or something just to respond broadly to what we've heard because sometimes there's someone from my district that I don't get a chance to have that direct communication with, um, but I want them to know I'm going to look into this. I will follow up, um, you know, or something that another counselor knows about better than, than someone else. So I think having that time perhaps mm -hmm. at the end, not responding to every single person every single time, but at the end would be nice. Um, I also wanted to bring up the location of the community centers for CAC meetings. Um, I realize that there's only so much capacity right now uh, in space. I'm glad um, Council Member Patton reminded us uh, where Brentwood is located. Um, I just want to say that maybe into you know the interim, maybe not the very short term, but the interim, we think about are there additional spaces that we could also use just because some neighborhood groups um, community groups are going to have a harder time getting to a further uh, spot, you know, if that's not really in their neighborhood, and it will probably affect their attendance and their ability to engage. Um, and I think that's all. I did have a quick question about churches being part of the community groups for longer-term engagement. Are we talking about worship activities or something else? I just want to make sure that it does align with the city's mission and that we're not um, I don't know. Uh, you know yeah. I'm thinking about separation of church and state. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the thought was not for worship services, and we can better define that and clarify just an additional meeting space um, to conduct business relative to that group. I don't know who was next, so I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> that was for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> add me, add me. Um, I wanted to add really quickly, uh, as we talk about the adding a meeting for public comments or public hearing, I love the idea of separating them, but to, and I forget which one of you brought it up, but you, to the point that we, it needs to be an extra meeting because it can't be that we do public hearings on the first and the third and then we only dedicate one to public comment because right now we get six minutes, residents get six minutes a month uh, that they're entitled to and if we limited it down to one time, they'd only get three. So I really want to emphasize that it has to be two for public comment and I think we, we will need more public hearing which will necessitate us having an additional meeting every month in order to accommodate those two things. So I just wanted to make sure we see that and, and, and highlight that. Thank you. Just um, I just wanted to mention one of the things I think um, Council Member Harrison had um, talked about was potentially um, the second meeting of the month when we do our work session. I think, oh, would that be fourth? Or no? Second? second. The second yeah. meeting of the month, maybe looking at public comment at that time. That's, yeah. I think that's I'm what you had so. yeah. suggested. I okay. Just want to um, piggyback on comment that Councillor Black said, and I just want us also to be careful when we say groups and values, because it also goes with that First Amendment thing, but it's been a government entity of access, um, making sure that we 
you know, trust me, there's probably some groups out there I don't want them using our community centers. But as far as governance and, and everything, we have to look at balancing that um, equal opportunity. And I so, can respect that, yeah, but I, I was so. specifically talking about hate groups. I know. Like, so just just when we are talking about who has the opportunity to come in and use the services from the city, just making sure that they're not a hate group or something that falls under, like, so that's where a I value say, that would that would erode what the city is about so in other areas. So that's why I, I want to go to make sure our legal team is engaged, involved, because... <laughs> I'm not an attorney, and I think attorneys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why I was like. To the legal team. <laughs> on, on that matter. Yeah, we can comment on it more, but as a governmental entity, we can't pick and choose who we can provide our facilities to to uh, engage in, in activities. Um, I mean, there can be guidelines, but we can't discriminate based on their point of view or their religious beliefs and that type of thing. And, you know, there, there are a lot of cases out there. I, I don't think it's been a problem. I don't think we really need to worry about it. Um, but um, I think we would have to look very closely at um, someone would need to ring me up pretty quick if there was an inclination to say you couldn't use the city facility because of, of your point of view. So can I ask a question to that? Like, when I think about it, I'm thinking about, like, here's a very left, far out there hypothetical question, but, like, if the KKK or the Proud Boys was like, we want to sign up in the community engagement and we want to come and spread hateful messages and use community facilities to do it once a month, we couldn't be like, ah. I don't know about that. That's about the way that's what the Constitution says. I'm sorry to inform that's you, but <laughs> that, that's it. You know, and, it, and it's probably better to talk more about that off, offline, too, and we can go through it and show the cases there. You know, it's... Uh, so I wrote that down with uh, how do you ensure ability to join but align with this vision and First Amendment. And I'm sure that's going to be more Balancing. conversation. So I had Joan French. No, Joan French Nelson? That's what I had. I think I'm up. And I know where this conversation is going on, but it's been really, really helpful because this has been a huge topic over the past several years, and this is some of that group think that I, we, I feel like we all want to be doing. I just wanted to add to Councilmember Jones, I agree. I don't think it should just be the one public comment meeting a month. I would think we keep the afternoon one that we do, and then we just bifurcate the one we're doing right now in the evening and separate it from public hearing. Um, and then... Um, and say something else. Oh, and then to the voicemail public comment, that's kind of why I brought this up, because if we separate it, then maybe the voicemails could be played at this new public comment meeting. Um, do we want for the first meeting of the month to, like, I just want that to be looked at, like how, how are the voicemail options being promoted and how are they being utilized? Then there was something else I was going to add about, or, oh, to council. Or council Melton, we could just print them out and the clerk could read them. Yeah, or the clerk can read them. But something where they're, like, actually said out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that may be easier than playing them. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, we'll only if Gail acts, maybe. <laughs> she'll, she'll make them theater. Um, and then the... Hire a reader with um, a good voice. Could tell us what they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have then a the theater. other piece was... Jonathan, um, I have a theater oh, degree, so I will read Harrison them out loud. ...having the opportunity to um, respond or interact. I actually think our rules of decorum right now talk about um, not reacting, but I think it's meant to be like being combative. And to your point about making sure folks feel heard and there's some follow-up, I like this idea of doing council concerns at the same time as this new public comment period. And if we do that, then that's the opportunity. Maybe we do the public comment and then we do council concerns last, because that's an opportunity for each council member to go around and kind of jump in. And I think that's all I have on this topic. <laughs> what, how are we on time? Are we about reached? We are on you all's time. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Do you all want a break or feel right after? We're going to go break. 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 And break. we have our takeout yeah. boxes. Yeah, just before, yeah, before we break, if you could take your menu cards and just check the options so I can come collect them in our take-to-go box. And By Taisha, the way, this can I ask you? You can pick as many as you like. Taisha, can I ask you a clever. question? Thank you. Um, yeah. You had mentioned that uh, I think I'm a little bit unclear as to with all of these options, which would fall specifically under community engagement, and can you remind me one more time what resources your department needs in order to ex execute these properly? Yes, thank you for that. So all of this that was presented to you today would fall under our office 
um, the Office of Community Engagement. Um, resources, remember, we have four people. Um, so anything out from the um, main course and dessert option would require additional staff capacity. And, and we'll work with the budget office and the city um, manager's office to figure out what that looks like. But anything that is already on the house, we're supporting and covering. <laughs> and then the immediate options we can manage in the interim, but main course and dessert op options are going to require additional people. Thank you so much. And lastly, I would love the opportunity to give Miss uh, Glo uh, Sarah Glover, uh, Glover, uh -huh. sorry, Glover, my bad. Um, I would to give you the opportunity to come back and make sure that we've addressed everything that that maybe you can that you're representing the board for. Is there something that we still need to discuss before we move on from this topic? Thank you, council member. Um, just representing the board, I'll say that we would be happy to continue talking about public policy. And in fact, that was something that the board was very eager to do, to have the opportunity to pre present these three recommendations to you, but then to ask, can we take this back, uh, throw the ball back in our court, let us go out into the community. Um, so that's, I know what the group wants to do. Um, I'm gonna throw someone under the bus here since it's last minute, uh, sorry about that, Dr. Lane. But we have, uh, as an example, Dr. Lane is a member of our board. He was appointed to the board specifically to represent our senior members in our community. So something that Dr. Lane has taken on is, as an example, going and going out into the community, joining community groups like AARP, making sure that he feels very connected to that community. So I feel confident that at our next meeting, it was suggested that our next February meeting, we talk about public comment. I feel confident that when Dr. Lane speaks about it, he won't be sharing just his opinion. He'll be a representative as he was appointed of the senior community. That being said, and again, I'm putting you on the spot, but I would like, uh, I think that Dr. Lane would like potentially more time to make sure that we are going out into the community and as we were appointed, talking to the groups that we are meant to be lifting up. Um, and so while we would be eager to get started, we are happy to jump in and we don't mind the work. I'm concerned that we can talk about this in February. I'm not sure that we'll be able to go out into the communities that we wanna hear from and get their feedback in time in February to then bring that back to you and have a change done immediately. So, so how what about I, in March oh, then? Sorry? How about in March then? Yeah. I, uh, I'm gonna to look to the community members who are here. I'm seeing some nods. Um, so I think if you just give us that little bit more time, we'll talk about it at our February meeting and at our March meeting. And, and this is for public comments? Okay. This is specifically about that public okay. comment. Yes, ma'am. Can I just add to that? Um, we wanna provide predictability and we don't wanna constantly be changing the system, but we don't need to be striving for perfect right now. And, and systems change, um, organizations change. And so I think, if we could get the new public comment system up, March is fine. But then if y'all come back to us in six months or a year and say we need to retool this or maybe we find we're issues changing. and we say that we're having this problem help. Like I think because, you know, we did, we did public comment change a couple, three years ago. So it's time for a refresh. But yeah. so I, I don't we don't need it to be perfect. We just need to get it going and the, willing to be nimble. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, more to that point, I just want to bring up something that I we have been thinking about and utilizing since my last time coming to the Community Engagement Board meeting was something that Mickey Fern brought up was this idea of minimally viable product where you put something out and knowing that it's not completely perfect knowing and for the opportunity to get feedback on how to improve it. If we're constantly waiting for the product to be absolutely perfect before we get it sent out, then it, we're going to be waiting forever. So doing something as soon as possible to then like come back with the understanding that it may need to change because the discussion around it and the perception of it and the uh, the ideas of what could be better will be there now because you have the product out for consumption. So, And I want to highlight some uh, concerns that I've heard that I want to make sure that we address as a council for you guys. Is I want to make sure you feel that you have the guidance necessary. I don't want you guys to think and go back and go, I'm not sure what council wants us to do. So before you leave today, I want to make sure that's crystal clear and I don't want to move on until that's done. So I just want to open it up to the board. It, it, do you feel you have direction or do we still need to work on being clear with it? Thank you for asking that. You know, based on our most recent meetings, I would not say that all the members of the board feel confident that we understand exactly what's being asked of us. I think we're unified in our mission to support community engagement, but I think that the reality of the situation, there are some new council members 
there, uh, there is some history, some deep history related to the communities that we're connecting with. And we all care a lot about it and want to get it right. We also want to be in alignment, in alignment with what you're working on. So hopefully from my remarks, you heard that focus on partnership. I'll say we'll welcome any opportunity. Um, as the council member mentioned, she was available at our last meeting and true to her word, she did not speak up. She was just listening. That was incredible for our group to see. So um, I won't say that we necessarily have all the information or feel like we have all the information. We do feel supported, I think, and I do think we feel a bit of a spotlight on our group right now. Um, but we would love to have additional partnership with you. And I would say if you're available to meet with us or if you'd like to get in contact with us, if you're not available to come in person, we would absolutely, absolutely welcome your feedback. And we are very focused on partnership. Great. Thank you so much. And what I guess I'm hearing is, are, are we specific? I want to make sure they're going by with, with tools and with data points to start working. So what I heard was public comment. Um, and, and, and I don't want to overload you as well. I don't want to give you a laundry list of things. Some are immediate and some are, can, can be done later. So I'd just like to summarize, you know, what all are we sending to them so that I'm on the same page? So I hear public comment. I'm going to ask, that, do you have what you need to address the public comment issue? Is there an understanding there? That's a great question. I think we do. Um, I think what we're going to do, uh, to your point about not overlaying, I think we're going to wipe our agenda for February. We had some things, that, as you saw on the slides, we have some things we're working on. This, it sounds like, needs to be our immediate focus for a lot of reasons. So this will become our immediate focus. And then as you'll see from us, we'll probably try to keep other things going in tandem and we'll reach out to you and, and try to ensure that we're leveraging staff support, which has been amazing. We all know Taisha is amazing. Um, to make sure that if there are other things coming down the pipeline that we are able to uh, also be keeping those active as well. But our immediate focus will be on public comment. And so to your point and to save time, I do think we have what we need for our next meeting and to take immediate action related to the public comment piece. And council member, Mayor Pro Tempore. So I, I want to share too, because I remember I was on council when we initiated and had the conversation about community engagement board and moving forward. And it was really around, honestly, the CACs and how do we get overall community engagement. I think right now we need the public comment part first, but I think long term, the big picture, and it goes back to the comment when I said, you know, not all CACs are meeting. Not all CACs are still around. So how do we go and get our staff in front of and this community and the staff back together and meeting and having conversation. And then on a completely separate part, this is Pat's favorite part, we got to figure out the rezoning piece. Mm -hmm. I think they need to be handled separately, initially, and then we figure out how to go from there. Because a lot of the contention around the CACs, honestly, was about zonings. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of information that happened at CACs from parts and rec, from public works, right. from utilities, solid waste, all of that that is being missed mm -hmm. because of what I think started the major uproar engaging with some of the CACs. So that's I want to come from my voice and my lens of what I know because I had eight of the 18 CACs. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'd like to follow up with that because it's a great point. Thank you, Councillor Branch, for bringing that uh, that up. When you in your presentation have the five um, district areas that we would start in. Oh, I didn't do mine yet. Hang You're on. Oh, man. Um, when, you, when you have that. That was very clever. Are you waiting for resources to be able to staff that, that meeting schedule, the five district meetings? Um, how does that look? That would begin the next budget cycle. So when do we need to have decisions on the longer term community engagement plan in order to make sure you have what you need if it's changing from where it is now into your department? Yes, thank you. Um, and that's in reference to the external service unit piece, right? So um, now is the time when we're all being very kind to the budget office um, <laughs> and our supplemental requests. So we, we need to know this information now so that when we're having conversations with budget, because we said here we're looking from one to three years. So now is the time for us to begin planning out you know, staff and space and admin support, all of that, those discussions are happening right now. So we need that from you all as soon as possible um, so that we can plan for that to implement these things. Right. And I'm sure when we get to the budget discussion, they'll talk about the budget process. I know you have some, maybe some of you all for the budget process. There's going to be time for when they release the manager's uh, recommended budget 
for you all to see what's in there, what priorities might not be in there. So it's almost like a back and forth collaborative process. But sooner is always better than later so they can uh, build assumptions into their balanced budget uh, proposal to you. And we're using the to-go box to help inform that. So mm -hmm. make sure <laughs> I have all your ideas here. Council and I'm going to grab Christina. Council Member Harrison. Yeah, and just to clarify um, on the community center access for CACs, I saw that as an immediate option, zero to six months. Is this the kind of thing that would be available next month or w in six months? Or where is the yep. thought on that? Do we need to make a motion from the table? Did my menu check do the trick? I'm yep. not sure. <laughs> You want me to take that? Yeah, um, you take it and then I'll follow up. Okay. So, yes, we are ready to go with it as soon as you tell us to. Um, and we've, we were working with parks. We're ready to go on that end. But we do need clarity from you all as to that action. And so can I go ahead and make a motion here? No. Can I just I'd say we bring it back on February. Bring it back. Okay. And, and the, the other thing is we have to understand, too, like as this – um, with the engagement network, what is the cost um, related cost impacts? Because there's going to be a loss of revenue um, if we allow other nonprofits to use this too. So just so we are very clear on where that is. Oh, co loss for for the centers. The rental fees for right. the BRCR. But what we've done, if, and help me if I'm incorrect. You guys have worked with Stephen Bentley and PRCR for the immediate next six months. Correct. Figured out the facilities that we could do that will not upset programming. Correct. Um, to be able to accommodate the groups for the next few months. Correct. Correct. And even on the permanent level, we're working with Stephen and his group to identify what those centers are, right? Like when you think about Chavis, that's a high demand center who makes, you know, has a lot of reservations and costs and fees that people are paying. So we don't want to disrupt yeah. that type yeah. of stuff. All right. That's excellent. Thank yes. you. Yeah. on the minimum time needs to give more predictability as people prepare to give their best presentation and what is a frightening situation even for lawyers when they come before counsel. So, um, engagement network. Lots of discussion here of values, how do we align it, make sure it's constitutional, open it up, access to facilities. Um, the registry process of, yes, it can be two different registries, but what can we do from a community or customer focus of making it look like one from the front. Uh, Council Member Jones wanting some more information on the Community Connect program, uh, exploring opportunities for door knocking to engage, even for some of the things that you all talked about yesterday. Um, meet and greets, not just for service departments, but for some of the internal departments. Uh, boards and commissions, you are working on what an annual event can look like so they can understand what each other are working on and have fun. Um, I did get board liaisons who have them, doesn't potential education of public on how to engage or use public comments. Council Member Black talked about an infographic that she found that was useful. Or video. Um, or, or video. Um, council decorum, but the public comment can help when you explore that of how do we let people know they've been heard and not that we're just sitting here on our phones. But the sequences of council concerns might address that. Uh, the, the board's going to come back in March. You all negotiated an additional month. Good for you all. Um, in March. And um, let's see. Yes, are there temporary locations? We talked about temporary locations. Is that for CAC meetings? Mm -hmm. That's, the, okay. yes. Um, you're bringing back February 7th a more formal direction on. That's what March. they're not going to do in March. In March. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just one more thing. Councilmember Black brought this up and the city manager. People are having issues hearing us in the public, uh, staff and council. So, like, we're going to have to, like, I don't think these mics are very sensitive. So, we're going to have to, like, really 
speak into the speak mic. Speak into the mic. <laughs> And then I have one more thing just to look in as we go forward is okay. how are we using our communications department to amplify all of these meetings, all of these messages? Uh, I know that that was a struggle in the past for me. How can uh, we utilize that? And I'd like to see how we can connect the communications department to what we're doing with, with community engagement. And as we look to hire a new community, um, I mean, communications director, I think that the coordination and collaboration um, should be an important part of that consideration. It absolutely will be. More, more importantly, I think it's like a long-term strategy. I don't think, you know, we should be looking at communications as like an element that is happening in, within this and rather like the strategy that is guiding and being the foundation to the work in general. So just that long-term strategy of communications throughout the community. Yeah. Perfect. And Brentwood is also on the map. Uh, someone made a comment that they, that needs to be updated yep. and how are folks who do not have an active CAC I don't know that um, <laughs> sorry, it needs a spec I think they need we'll work on that this one it's written down I didn't mention it but I did get, get it written down about how are we engaging uh, so okay we're going to take a break it's going to be a five minute break though, so let me tell you what time we're going to come back uh, let's do 1116 okay. thank y'all thank y'all so much
blood drawn. That moves in? How? Yeah, the map's changed. Some sort of federal huh. that, that was the last little bit. There's a little bit of lemonade. Not that much lemonade in that room. Excuse me, could you get that door? I know, I was trying to figure out who it is. Happy to be up here again. Uh, y'all. Um, I'm going to be sort of the realistic cold water guy. As always. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna set it for I'm gonna set it for 15, and then if we have 15 for questions or something like that, we'll, we'll be very flexible. Um, I have lived here since 1991. Um, my my mom grew up here. Uh, her family is actually from Eastern Wake County. My great grandfather was the mayor of Wendell in the 20s and 30s. He owned a bank. He was a farmer. He owned a, a textile mill. He owned a jewelry store. So I mean, I've got really deep roots in the area. When I moved here, I started practicing law. Uh, I ran for Raleigh City Council in 2001, was elected, served for eight years. So I have done what y'all are doing. I served with Mary Ann, was at large my last term. I served with Russ, you're still here. Russ and I sat beside each other for four years. We drove each other crazy, but <laughs> it worked. You know, we had a very, very uh, fine council. I know this is gonna be a fine council. But I will, I'll be honest with you, it took me a while Coming in sort of cold, I had no public service at all in my entire legal career. I served on some school, uh, you know, government meetings. I was a prosecutor for our honor council in, in law school. I served in some of those roles, but I really had no idea what I was doing when I got on Raleigh City Council. But I can read, so that's good. I listen, which is really good. And as a lawyer, you're sort of trained to think critically and read and understand. So it was pretty easy for me to sort of get my feet wet, but it also took me six months to get my feet wet. One of the amazing things that I realized when I got on the city council, and of course I was top of the mountain, you know, I won all my precincts, I was ready to go, and you know, I was gonna hit that ground running. It took me about a meeting for the city, the, the then city attorney to contact me and said, let me give you an education on what we can and can't do in the city. And the way I like to describe it to folks now is the state of North Carolina is our mother and father, and we are children, cities. Uh, we are creatures of the state. Mm -hmm. And we can't do anything that mom and dad don't let us do by statute or other, other process. And so that really blew my mind when I became a city councilor that we have to ask permission for everything. And you know, that's just the reality that we exist in. And that's tough to, to understand. It's tough to explain to constituents what your role is because you're elected for reasons. All of us have reasons that we ran, reasons why we were elected, who our natural constituencies are, who are not our natural constituencies are. But once you're elected, you gotta serve everybody. And so that's how I came into this. When I got out in 2009, I was still being a real lawyer and doing stuff. And, in 2010, the world changed with respect to state politics, and that's when the Republicans the of lawyers, which is what got my start in lobbying. 
Shortly after that, I began picking up what I would call more blue clients. Um, the city of Raleigh, or actually the city of Asheville hired me first. Uh, Robin was the city attorney there. I then got hired about a year later for the city of Raleigh and was able to work on the Dorothea Dix acquisition project, which is still probably the greatest thing I've ever done as a lobbyist for any client. Uh, us acquiring that was a big deal. Still very proud of that. If you ever want to hear the stories and the secrets, I'll tell you offline. But there are a lot, and it's relationships that mattered that got that done. But again, that's, that's for another day. Um, my clients right now are all pretty progressive communities. I have Wake County, I have Raleigh, I have Asheville, and I have Cary. Um, that means of all of my, my clients, uh, we don't have any friends in the General Assembly from a registration standpoint. Let me explain to you what that means. Uh, today, the General Assembly uh, just had their election in November. There are 120 House members in the state. Uh, of the 120, there are 71 Republicans that got elected. They are one shy of a veto-proof majority. Speaker of the House, Tim Moore, who has a very good relationship with many of us on this, or, or y'all on this council, uh, has given 12 gavels to Democrats for committee assignments, which is truly unheard of. That just does not happen. And I have a belief why he's done that. Um, yeah. And that's really interesting. And I will just say uh, at the outset, uh, one of the things that drives the, the effort that I put into Raleigh, which, look, I'm your, I'm your lobbyist, but you're really, I'm your advocate. I try to protect you and promote you. That's what my job is. And it's the city I live in. It's the city I love, the city I served in. But you have to recognize when everybody comes to our city, three days, four days a week sometimes for a long time, they see our cranes, they see our tall buildings, they see how good or bad our roads are, and they, they live here. They watch the news, they read the paper, they listen. And so they either really like being here because of where they're from or they're a little bit jealous because we have everything and why should we help Raleigh? And Wake County has the same problem. You know, they, everybody thinks that Wake County is Raleigh. They don't realize that Wake County is A to Z, Apex to Zebulon. There's actually farms in Wake County, which no one really understands. So, you know, so that's the mindset of the General Assembly. So in the House, you have 71 Republicans, uh, 49 Democrats. In the Senate, you have 30 Republicans out of 50 and 20 Democrats. That is truly a veto-proof majority. So that's the world that you're operating in for your two years on this council. You're, you're in the same biennium as the North Carolina General Assembly. And it's important that everyone recognize that. And one of the, one of the things that matters a lot is how we are perceived. I say we, I'm not sitting at the table anymore, but I'm like Russ, I feel like a granddad, you know, I can, sort of come in and come out and babysit the baby and say, all right, see ya, I'm going back to home to go to bed, and y'all, good luck with those diapers. So, you know, thank you for your service. But they really do. I mean, truly, you'll find out, Megan. <laughs> so it, it, it is, you, you have to appreciate sort of that dynamic that we have to at least be perceived to be working in hand in tandem with the General Assembly because we don't have the power to go around them. There's a, a, a limited times when cities and counties have sued the state over certain issues, but it's been a while since that has happened. And so that's, that's sort of the world you live in. And we're a pretty blue city. We're a pretty blue county. But the state uh, who, who, who is our mom and dad is not. They're at least purple to reddish, you know. So that's important to, to understand and realize. Um, we have been really successful over the last few years of not being perceived as misbehaving. And that is another just, you know, there's no definition of not misbehaving, but, <laughs> you know, I think many of you, at least the people that have been on the council know what I'm talking about. For the new folks, I, I think it's, again, the perception of are you outside your lane or are you sort of traveling in what you can do as a city council? And, again, remembering that, there are things that cities and counties like and want from the General Assembly that it makes it easier to obtain if they like you than they don't like you. And, you know, I've got some clients uh, that have been more challenging than others. Um, 
and that is not just on the municipal level. I, I tend to represent folks who are challenging, at least to Republican ideals. And, but we've been successful and able to navigate that uh, a lot. And you know, the Dorothea Dix project really is sort of the, the culmination of, of that, where we had a lease you know, that was torn up by the Republicans, our 99-year lease, you know, people went you know, bananas, uh, ultimately because of right place, right time, who we saw, who, what, what, what happened. We now own 300 and close to 307 acres of land. That's just incredible because things simmered down and people wanted to help us. And that was really meaningful and it's meaningful for our community. Um, you know, as we, as y'all move forward, I think it's important just to constantly realize like, you know, if what am I saying or doing, how's that gonna impact us and, you know, with, with Republicans and Democrats in, this, in, the, in the General Assembly. And, and let me just sort of also disabuse this thought that this is a partisan issue that Republicans hate all cities. It is not partisan at all. It is truly, it's amazing. Uh, Robin and I, since we, she's been in Asheville and since she's been here, we are really a two-person SWAT team on all things bad against cities, even though it might not be our client. I mean, it might not be Raleigh, it might not be Asheville. There are bills filed every year. And there's gonna be a bill filed that's gonna take away our tree, uh, local, uh, our tree authority. There'll be a bill filed that will really dramatically uh, impact how permits and inspections are, are handled. Last year we were this close to having a 21 day permitting process for all construction in the city. You think about the 10 or 11 projects that y'all had on Tuesday to talk about, you know, I personally wouldn't wanna live in one of those projects with a 21 day permitting process. And yep. it's a big deal, right? And so, we are constantly fighting land use issues. We are constantly fighting a lot of taxation issues or how you spend money, power bill funding, how you pay for roads, where, where sales tax goes. And it's important for some of the things that y'all want. I don't think y'all finalized your legislative agenda yet, have you? Or is that sort of still a work in process? We don't have okay, well look, I, I like that. <laughs> Legislative agendas typically are a list of bad things that go in a naughty file, like, oh my God, they're never gonna get this. And so I, I do like having some degree of being nimble, picking two or three things. The county just did that. They've got a list of things they like. They've now picked two, uh, Medicaid expansion and increased school funding. You know, Philip, I think one of the things is a carryover from last year, and that's that civilian um, enforcement unit. I've got that great news the on that. Chief. I, I, is has been advocating for um but also after the mass shooting two of the things we talked about was um funding for safe storage of weapons um the state is um looking at an education program that they're collectively working with us on mm -hmm. and the other thing is um increased funding for mental health those were two things that came out of the headingham incident that we said we wanted to um, advocate for. Well, I've got some good news on the civilian police uh, issue. I was on a meeting yesterday. It looks like the Chiefs uh, Association is gonna file a statewide bill over this. And I've had multiple meetings with folks really since early January on this issue. I'm not gonna predict that it's gonna happen, but it's certainly much better having the statewide bill versus local bills that are just in big urban cities without any help. The, the other dynamic, just to remind y'all of sort of the, the, real, the realism of Wake County, we have 19 General Assembly members in the Wake County delegation. There are six in the Senate and 13 in the House. Of the 19, there's one Republican from Fuquay Farina. And that may not sound like a big deal, but it, you know, if you're down to building enough, you sort of understand which bills that get filed by certain members move and others that don't move. And so not having uh, a Republican, at least in the delegation, it does hurt us, but we've done a really good job of making friends in smaller counties uh, that are a little more rural, but are close enough to Raleigh to where they're actually enjoying coming to our city. They're, they're enjoying coming here for games. They're, you know, they're state fans or they're, Chap they're Carolina fans and they spend the night here. And so 
We do have really good friends in some of the fringes. John Bell's the majority leader. Um, Robert Reeves is the Democratic uh, leader. He's in Sanford, but he's also really, really close friends with John Bell, as y'all remember from last year's presentation. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky from that standpoint, but it does hurt us from the standpoint of having a go-to who's in Raleigh that can actually be the sponsor. We had like Johnny Mac Alexandra, Tamara Beringer, Neil Hunt back in the day who served with me. Uh, I don't think he served with Rush. You took maybe his spot. Right. So, you know, we had people that were respected that could help, but we don't have that anymore. And so, again, you know, I'm the bad news guy, but how you're perceived really does matter. Um, Philip, yes. could, you, could you talk a little bit about, like, there's a way, like, when you're asking for things, you're playing offense. But one of the things that we have found is that we really are playing defense because what we're trying to do is prevent bad things from that would really impact our city from happening. You, yes. And one example that we have is when the city, I mean, when the state changed the funding formula for light rail, that basically killed the Durham light rail project. But commuter rail was also in that bill. And it was Tamara and Johnny Mack who um, helped us. make that right. happen. Right. Um, we played defense. Can you explain just the importance of that, and especially in this upcoming session? Well, and again, you know, I sort of alluded to this earlier about the bills that I know will be filed that will negatively impact us. I mean, w we play defense most of the time. And, you know, a lot of it, again, is because we're the capital city. People love to go back to their districts and talk about Raleigh. I mean, you know, it's not the General Assembly. They just use Raleigh. Ah, oh, Raleigh told me this, and Raleigh said I can't do that. Like, Let us fight Raleigh. And so, like, they, they're, it's ingrained in their brains, like, to hate on Raleigh. I'm like, come on, man. Raleigh's great. What are you talking about? But it really is a big deal. And they, they I don't know, now my watch is running, so I'm at 15 minutes now. Um, they... We play defense a ton because most bills that get filed that hurt cities, in Raleigh in particular, there's an issue in a different jurisdiction over a member or a donor to a member who had a bad experience in trying to get his building built, you know, or they didn't like the fact that they were charged a fee to run this pipe for their sewer and they just don't think they should pay for that. And so lots of stuff that comes out of these filings by Republicans, which means they might move, are all based on their own personal experience in their own jurisdictions. And they're always statewide bills for the most part. And so that means we're fighting something that happened because Conover, North Carolina, denied a building permit for a dog kennel in an area that was not, you know, prohibited from doing that. So they want to do away with the zoning all of a sudden. Like, you know, this is clear out the zoning. I mean, but, you know, I made that up. But it is, it's not too far-fetched. I mean, it is 100% made up. But I promise you that's, that's sort of the stuff we deal with. And, and, and so always being on defense and having some offense, but it's, it makes it difficult for us to stop the bad things that people want to do for a reason that we do it you know, better. I mean, right now, y'all just finished a, um, y'all did a really awesome permitting update on the, the ability to get into the system, how transparent it is. Uh, I don't know who was in charge of that, but it's awesome. And I sent it to the one senator who has been sort of jonesing us on hey, y'all should have 21 days to turn on every permit supplied for in, in, in cities, generally. And I said, well, this is what we've done. This, I think, is best practices. And so when we do it, and we do things well here. Our staff is incredible. Y'all need to, you know, really get to know the staff because they're the subject matter experts and everything that happens. And we are constantly talking to our state counterparts to where there's a great connection between state and local uh, uh, folks. But the fact that we do our planning better, we're able to show that to senators who are mad about this issue in Conover. And again, that's a made up you know, issue. And say, look, this is what serious people do. This is what adults do. And like, don't punish us because we're 
you know, we're, it, we're part of this zoning issue that this one bill uh, impacts. And if we are at a position where we're taking, you know, we're taking a position on something or we're doing something that someone perceives as illegal or unlawful, it just, it hurts our ability to sort of successfully push back and look like, you know, serious folks, that we care about what the law says, we care about what processes are in place. Because I promise you, they may not be from here, but it's really, every trade association in the state is headquartered in Raleigh. You know, the home builders, the, the developer crowd, I mean, they all they have to do is walk down the street and whisper in somebody's ear, golly, I think the city of Raleigh has lost their mind on this issue. And that's just, it's unfortunate to have to deal with, but it's, it happens all the time. We are viewed, in my mind, um, really well right now, and I think we'll continue to be viewed very well. And I, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this session. Uh, I'm not uh, going to make any predictions as to how long it's going to be or what's going to happen, but I do think there's going to be testing of this veto-proof majority pretty soon, so I don't know what that means, but, you know, you know hang on, buckle your seatbelts. Hopefully it's not going to impact us. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'll end before we take questions. Um, I, I really feel honored to do this job. I, if you can't tell how passionate I am about what I do for y'all, I, I am. Uh, I love this city. It's, it's given me everything in my life that I've ever accomplished. I'm really proud that this is, I'm in the capital city. I represent y'all. But I also, like, I'm a city guy. Like, I'm just like city homer. You know, I, I love this municipal stuff. And I can walk into any committee meeting. They may not even be my client, but I know so much about how to run the city because of my eight years I spent here. And with all the staff help and all the peers I had, whether I agreed with them or not on lots of issues, you know, I got really educated into why I think our state, our state is, is a good state to, to operate as a city. But, you know, it's really meaningful to me to be able to represent you all and try to help as, as best I can. Uh, I'm sort of rambling now. I know I think we have about 10 minutes left for, uh, yes, for, uh, for questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer any pointed questions publicly if you want to or privately so yes Megan thank you thanks um, thanks for this um, thanks for your service to our city um, to stretch your metaphor uh, it seems like in, in this metaphor we have to ask mom and dad for permission to do everything and some of our compatriots are, are rebellious younger siblings but we are we are um, we are asked to be the oldest sibling setting the good example um we i find this tension right because our constituents will say just rebel like just just do do the thing that everyone else is doing um and we also face guidance it's like maybe maybe don't rebel or they'll take away you know they'll reduce your curfew so <laughs> in finding the <laughs> magic middle like what can the oldest children be doing to get our curfew extended, so to speak? Like, what can we be doing as individual council members and as a body so that we can get the things we really want to serve our constituents? Um, so the first thing is, and thank you for the question, and I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, we have to make our case. Why? That's the first step. Why do you need to do this? Why is it broken the way we do it currently? Is it because of convenience? Is there a due process issue out there? So always asking why is really important to have, you know, because they're going to ask that. Like, why do you need this? And so us having, you know, five things to say back to them is really important. The second thing is you have to always ask yourself, and again, it took me six months to figure this out, so I know y'all are in your, what, third meeting? Well, fourth is special. Everything costs money. Like, there's a massive budget component to anything you think about. Every, every time. And, you know, it's free money. It's taxpayer money. Hey, you know, we'll just shift this here and there. But that's not, you can't think that way. Like anything that you want to do. Let's just, I mean, like re these remote meetings, for instance. I have no idea how much it costs for this equipment. But just think about it, if you did one of these in every community center, how much that would cost. And what does it cost to take money from, to do that, to take something away from somewhere else? And so... And the legislators always ask that question. How much does it cost? Because they're drilled in their brain. 
So I, I think really presenting your facts the best way you can then allows me to go and say, hey, this is our experience. We want to do this the right way. We don't want to have a situation. And again, there's a lot of litigation going on within the development and planning community right now. The, the laws have been changed. Robin and I worked on 160D changes. Well, she did it for a lot longer than I did. I just helped her get over the line. But Robin really is the subject matter expert on all things zoning and planning. And as things got built in us, they constantly are trying to eat away and nibble at it. You know, anytime anyone sues the cities now, there's a potential to get attorney's fees. And so you really have to be even more careful on things that you do. And so the fear that I would have, and I'm a pretty little C conservative risk averse lawyer. I like no one ever getting in trouble. I'm that guy that wants to step over the line because, you know, when you are wrong, it is usually painful. And, you know, us doing things the right way, you don't ever want to put yourself in a position to where, okay, you've crossed over into the gray and then somebody, what, and it won't be someone that wants, you know, you to be in the gray. It'll be someone who's upset that you've gone into the gray and then they litigate over it. So that's a long explanation to your question. But as you think through these things, you know, let's put down on paper why you need it, what it's going to cost, if anything, and let's use real life examples of why we think this would help. And that's how you build support within the caucus in Wake County as well as, you know, outside of Wake County, which is where it's going to have to, to fly anyway. So this General Assembly is going to be going to a presidential election year, and it's budget year for them as well in the long session. What do you believe? I know the governor will do a budget. He'll present it. Um, but what do you see as the top maybe three items on from at the state level on this year's budget that may impact us? directly and do you think those items may get funded or won't get funded so right now the, the the big discussion they want to continue to ratchet down our income tax and make us more competitive with other neighboring states um, I think ultimately I don't know if we'll ever get to a zero increase or a zero uh, cent tax rate for uh, our income state income tax but I know that they are uh, and I think the, the numbers and our economic development efforts really play this out. And I would credit both the executive branch and the legislative branch that we have a pretty business-friendly climate in the state now. Uh, but taxation is always the big deal. They want to reduce taxes and increase the rainy day fund. Um, so I think you're going to continue to see things like that. Medicaid expansion is another big deal. Um, the House wants to do it in one way. The Senate wants to do it in another way. Now they are brand new people there, so no one's really gotten into the mix now. But that is, that's something that I have, I don't think I would have said this four years ago that I'm encouraged by the movement, but that's, that's a big deal. It doesn't help the cities as much as it does the counties, but it's still really helpful. Um, you know, the other, the other sort of big hot button issues that could fill the coffers of the General Assembly relate to uh, alcohol beverage control measures as well as medical marijuana. That bill was filed, uh, I want to say it was either SB2 or SB3 by Bill Rabin, uh, who's the rules chairman from Brunswick County. He's making a huge push on that again, which will be uh, a pretty significant tax in, in influx as well. But the General Assembly, I, I think the House goes first on their budget. Uh, I may have that wrong. The, the governor will pass his budget or will propose his budget, and the, the, the ladies and gentlemen at the General Assembly will look at it, and they'll put it on the side of the room, and it will never, ever really do much of anything after that. So they just they ignore what, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican governor. Yep. Their budget is ignored, and then they do their own thing and hope it doesn't get a veto. But... I haven't, you know, no one's really telegraphing their passes on the big budget items, but I do think the taxation is all, always a big budget item to make it more business-friendly climate. And as, as well as we see inflation increases, they're trying to ratchet down personal income tax rates. They know, and I will say this, Corey, they know um, because they live here and they listen to me and they know Mary Ann that we have an affordable housing issue, like substantial affordable housing issue. But they all figure that I mean, that's a that's a message that we've been on point for a long time. I think 
that there are the that are most cities in the state also are having similar issues. I don't think there's a fix necessarily like within the first five months of the session. It may be a long and short term issue, but that's certainly something that the League of Municipalities is absolutely promoting. And I think Jonathan, you're the liaison there, but that's a big deal, you know. If it's on your legislative agenda, great. If it's not, I'm still going to lobby for it. So, you know, hooray, you get that for free. Um, but that's that's out there. Um, I, I think that they're going to continue to look at that. That's a really complicated issue. But they also recognize that as stuff is going up, supply chain issues still abound. They've got to figure this out. I was just going to add... Um, I know Councilmember Black and Jones were talking about what are some of the experiences you had for those of us who have been on council. And I always say that my calls with Philip or Robin are my most frustrating <laughs> because you go in with this is what we need to be doing and then, you know, it's their job to explain to us the risks and the path forward. And I will say that there were two, I think, major issues that I worked closely with them on last term, which were the idea of the subpoena power oversight for our police advisory board and then our non-discrimination ordinance. The oversight issue did not go anywhere despite um, the help we tried to get in the General Assembly, but we were, we were able to get our non-discrimination ordinance through. It did not happen quickly. Um, I took a lot of external heat for that. Council Member Fort did as well. Um, and we were working together on that very closely. And I would say that the biggest tension point you will probably feel is um, this need to do what you know is right um, and the public pressure to do it and then how to get it done. And I will say my experience is, is that Philip guided us very well. Um, and then it's sort of as the elected official, you kind of just have to take the heat for a little while. I mean, I got called all sorts of names for not getting that non-discrimination ordinance out the minute we could legally have done it. Um, but I ultimately think the way we did it was better in the end. Um, I think some of the advocacy groups also agree that the model we have with the county ended up being better, but that doesn't take the personal um, kind of guilt and pressure off of you. And so that, I think, will be a big piece. And um, so I just wanted to flag it. That was probably one of the biggest issues I had last term. Uh, I was wanting to do what I knew was right, what my constituents were asking me to do, but trying to do it in the right way. And you received major kudos you and Stormy um, for after 10 months of torture. <laughs> <laughs> it was 10 months of torture, but um, I think the advocacy groups, but also the General Assembly all said what a great job we did with that. So that's, that could have turned out very differently, um, but it was handled really well. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Melton, thank you for that, that uh, insight. It's very helpful. Um, uh, the question I have is, as I write down, you know, when you say legislative agenda, you, I, I'm brand new to this. I'm like, what on earth? What are you talking about? And uh, I have the things that the mayor said that they have been working on, and then I have things that you are working on. So what is the timeline? How does this process work? If there's something that I'm like, oh, I really want to work on that, what, are, what time constraints do you have? How does that whole process work? That's up to y'all, um, what you want the process to be. Uh, you know, typically, I mean, in the past, well, when I was on the council, I think we only had federal legislative agendas. And um, my first municipal client was Asheville, and they had, gosh, how many? Fifteen on their legislative agenda. And it truly, it was it was the list of naughtiness. And, like, I was like, this is, like, what? You know, this is never, this is just, I'm going to fail at every one of these but one. So I don't like those lists. Um, that's really, you know, as, as y'all converse between yourselves and you figure out what's important to the council, uh, then you talk to me and let's, let's figure out what we want to do. But, you know, I'm a real litigator, too. I'm in court. And so I, I love the, the KISS metaphor, keep it simple, stupid. And one or two big things is really helpful versus a long list of naughtiness. And... Right, and to that point, is it something that's ongoing throughout the session, or is it like you have to submit everything you want no, by no, no, May 15th? No. So there are deadlines for bill filing. Okay. I mean, and, and maybe offline we should do, like, legislative day for y'all, too, to sort of, like, you know, let's go to back to School of Rock time, um, or School of Rock, um, Schoolhouse Rock. You're too young for that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so there's bill filing deadlines. 
uh, in the House and the Senate. The crossover deadline is May 4th. Those deadlines, they're on paper. You can always get something filed if you have the wherewithal and the votes and the support and it's the right person filing. So those are real deadlines. But, you know, we've been successful well past deadlines, just whatever, you know, some of the issues are. But, you know, it's nice to know earlier for me if there are two things that y'all really want to work on. But, you know, the, the civilian police stuff, I, I'm, that should be on your list, and I, I'm, I'm really bullish on that right now, given what I learned yesterday. The affordable housing, uh, the mental health stuff, I mean, that's, that's easy, low-hanging fruit for us. But you may want to just limit it to some of those really distinct items because you, most of your time is going to be spent in disbelief of what we're fighting against. <laughs> that happens much more often than the positive stuff. It blows my mind still. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, just what's the last date for filing? And then even if something's already filed, couldn't it be amended? Always amended. Yeah, um, and how long does that last? At any time. Really long. I mean, it's, there, there are no rules. Like, there are rules, but it's not like being in court where a person with a black robe on and there's a list of rules, <laughs> and you usually are following those rules. There are rules here, but there are rules that they can suspend. You know, they, they stop the clock. On June the 30th. The, the clock does not run in the General Assembly if the budget's not been passed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if we, if we want something proactively, getting it filed as a local bill or a statewide bill is always much better. I think the House local bill rules may be in the February. The Senate mm -hmm. might be March. I, I sent the list Just to Robin uh, and Marshall, I think, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. But I, I can find that out, Jane. So I wanted to acknowledge, too, Bo Mills Bo oh, yeah, right. is here. Right. Um, Bo right. is, um, uh, we work with him through the Metro Mayors. So he's one of our um, lobbyists who assist us, works with Philip, um, and also is part of the League of Municipalities. So uh, another great resource, um, not only on the statewide level, but also on the federal level. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, and... Um, Bo, we haven't talked about this yet, but it, this came up yesterday when we visited Durham. They took us to Willard Street, and that is a um, low-income um, tax, you know, credit project. And they were saying that they had to go get a waiver because the parking requirements, I think it's like 1.78 um, parking spaces per unit, and when you're dealing with one-bedroom apartments, sometimes that's not even realistic and efficiencies. And this, it's the same for rural areas as it is for urban areas, where urban areas might have access to transit and whatnot. And um, they also put a dental, nonprofit dental center there. Well, they could not own it. Hmm. And self-help came in. They own it, but it's part of the building. And my question is, with these low-income um, um, tax credits, is there any way that we can um, maybe have a voice on changing some of these so it can reduce the cost and build the amenities when we do do affordable housing? I'm not sure where that all falls in, if that is more an agency right. determination or a legislative determination. Well, you know, one of the things that happened to us, 15, 16 era, they got rid of the historic tax credits too at state level, and that might have been under McCrory's administration. I, I can't remember, honestly, but that stunk because <laughs> that was really helpful to us and all a lot of communities down east that had, you know, really cool downtowns that were not flourishing at, like they used to. But, you know, those are, again, you know, why do we need it? What's it going to cost? And that would be to the state. You know, what are they going to lose if they have a tax credit? And so I'm happy to have that conversation with anybody. Uh, if Mike Woodard is a senator in Durham, uh, I'd be interested to know if he had anything to do with what the Durham project was because he's really well liked uh, in all, both chambers and both sides of the aisle. He's a great guy, former city councilor. 
Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you, you find your, your allies, whether they're you know, the same team you're on or the other team, but anyone who's ever served in city government is really helpful to things I work on. Right. Uh, the, the, the House just got Steve Ross back. He was the mayor of Burlington for a long time. Uh, he, he will be great for us. But they're few and far between. You know, you have a lot of school board members. You have a lot of county commissioners. You don't have a ton of, of well, city yes. council officials in the House and Senate right now. But the ones that we do have, man, I, I lean on them heavily. And they're really important in their various caucuses, uh, the Republican and Democratic caucus, of explaining why cities need this, that, or the other if it relates to water or road improvements or gas tax issues. So. Uh, yeah, I just have a few, uh, a comment and a question. So one, this is the first time I've heard legislative agenda, so I'd love to be included and educated on that because I have no idea. So all of the, the priorities that have been listed, which came from prior council, um, I'd love to learn how we add to that. Um, and then just a question, I don't know if this is the place for it, but you let me know. But as we're talking about what we can do, we in the last council they discussed uh, term limits and, and got recommendations. And as we discussed possibly doing four-year terms, is this the kind of thing that would go into there? So if we go, if the, the next step is to do four-year terms, is that something that we would do on a legislative agenda? I think, yeah, y'all, I mean, I, I worked. Yes. Okay. Y'all can so do that. That's not this. Got it. Uh, and, and let me just uh, apologize, perhaps, on the legislative agenda. Um, I don't like them, All right? So just please, that's my Philip Isley opinion. But it is nice to know what your priorities are. So maybe there's a, a, a word difference there. Um, but, we, you know, y'all can talk between yourselves as to what you want to focus on. Um, and, and one priority is not letting bad things happen to well, us. Well, that's, that's right. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, that's the value of what we do is we protect y'all from the really scary things, we hope. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is I think we can also better leverage our um, affiliation with the League of Municipalities because some of the things that we may want, the other cities may as well. Uh, and so, you know, I'm as our, I guess, appointee there now, I can help sort of bring information back and forth. Uh, I can think of a couple things off of the top of my head that we discussed last year that I will be chatting with the league about that may be helpful for some of our... In uh, Metro Mayors. Yeah, Metro Mayors. So um, one thing we learned, especially with the non-discrimination discussion again, is if it's not just Raleigh doing something, um, we have right. a better chance. Right. So I think that, that leveraging those relationships uh, I think will be helpful too. And look, the league and the metro mayors is great. I mean, I couldn't do the job without having them, you know, attached to our hips. And we've got a really fantastic relationship with those guys. Um, we're very fortunate to have very good association representation. But I think they have, what, 535 cities or something. So that's a big association. Uh, Megan? Yeah, I just wanted to um, – this is more a comment for – for the table, um, I just wanted to kind of upvote Councilmember Jones's point about um, having us like curate a moment amongst ourselves where we do talk about those legislative priorities. I'm hearing that it's not not your preference to have it be this sort of like formalized list, but um, it would be nice for us to all agree as the new assemblage to like what are our top three, and then what are maybe six other things that we. We we want we want our own room and more allowance and a later curfew and then you're, you're just like ready like oh, okay I didn't think this was gonna come up but surprise there's a, there's an opportunity to ask for our own room and good good thing I knew you wanted that so here I can pull this off the shelf. Sorry, and y'all can figure out. Too <laughs> you know oh, another one of my clients has they call it the legislative funnel and it's a bunch of lawyers so I mean yeah, wow. Right. So that's, it's really meaningful for, for them. But it looks at, you know, what's our mission? Does this impact our mission positively or negatively? Is it within our mission? And what's the pros and cons? And that really, it, and it, that takes out a lot of stuff like resolutions against legislation that doesn't matter to the lawyers. I mean, it's just, it's more of a social issue. And so that's been very helpful. Every Everybody does it differently. Um, and again, I'm happy to help you and participate in this in any way, but you know, 
we, we do play defense a lot more than we play offense. So I would, again, use the KISS analogy, you know, keep it simple. Hi, Philip. Hello, Mary. That was loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you. Thank you. <clears throat> One second. Except the only mic that works. <laughs> nice to see you again. Thank you. Um, I can't express how, I think when I first met you, you asked me like one of the things that was most difficult about this like new space. And I think this has been the most difficult um, directly because I am coming directly from a community advocacy background and I have worked as a lobbyist before too, and for a little bit of time right out of college. Um, and it's just like navigating the things that you would like to see happen with like the actual reality of getting it done um, and knowing that certain things should be happening but the reality that it may not need to happen. Um, and I think that like was something that was really highlighted in the first couple of weeks of me being here. An example was used was from how we don't need to poke the bear and the example was that Charlotte had uh, put together a non-discrimination ordinance shortly after the House bill a few years back and the General Assembly like struck them down because of them basically not being as like the, the not not being as discriminatory as they would have liked them to be essentially and I thought I took I took fault with that but um, it's just been interesting navigating this space so I know one of the first things I spoke to you about when I saw you and I was like I know this is a long shot this is like, you were like, that's never gonna happen. And I was like, we'll see. <laughs> I, would, I would like to just uplift it. Um, and it's the reason, I'm I'll give you the reasoning first. And the reasoning that I am talking about this specific point right now is because the things that I've heard from members of councils is that in terms of affordable housing, density bonuses don't work. Inclusionary zoning doesn't work either. So as one of the only renters on council, it's like, what can we do to do with control or rent relief or something that can help us? Because we have these long-term goals of building more housing and in the long term, hopefully that will make the housing cost like more affordable for people across the board and stable across the board. But as far as like what is happening right now, I know my lived experiences with being a renter in this city is that my rent has gone up every year since I've graduated college in 2016. And that's the reality for a lot of people around me. So I guess my question is like, where do you think there's space to support tenants rights? And I'll start there. I have a couple other things that I wanted to say. Okay, so this is what, I mean, you and I, we should meet with the Apartment Association at some point. I mean, that'd be the first thing I would tell you, whether I'm doing this in, you know, for all the public to hear or whether we were talking, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but start there and listen to why they would be, they're going to be against that. <laughs> so, but listen to why. Listen to the people that build these apartments and listen why. And so that's where I would start to really get to the, the actual basics of what does it cost to build an apartment building? What are the constraints? You know, one of the things I used to say when I was on the city council in the, the zoning and planning stuff was just as contentious then as it is now. So nothing has changed. It is, there, there are more now than there were when we were on the council. We had a pretty big recession when we were on council, but they're equally ugly. Neighbors hating on neighbors. I mean, it's really unfortunate. And it's the, the, the worst part of your job is to deal with that. But one of the things I always said is like, I wish all of us, I wish as a condition precedent to run for city council, someone would give you a million dollars and say, go develop a project. Start to finish. Like that would be so incredible to learn what, how hard it is to navigate through the site selection or your contractors or the permitting or the neighbors and like, Obviously, no one ever did that. I mean, we had some developers on our council, but if I had had that, you know, limited experience or $100,000, whatever, pick the number, you would come into this really understanding the economics of growth. And I had no idea. <laughs> I, mean, I had no idea how anyone makes money, the risk involved. And so the, the rent control issue really is just based on the economics and once you start peeling back those layers of what goes into apartments, you know, whether they're new or old, and then you can get to, okay, well, if, if we pick on the economic aspect here, does that improve over here? So I would suggest to you, Mary, that it's a, you know, spend, let's spend a couple of months sort of getting to baseline knowledge and then seeing where there might be some issues because the affordable housing crisis in North Carolina is not going to go away. We could actually be a leader in this space if we come up with a solution that doesn't sound like you're going to tell people what they can rent their property for. Like, you know, it has to, 
they have to buy into this and, and realize this is a good thing, not, hey, the government's taking it to me and I want to fight back and raise Cain and, you know, come down to the city council and yell, yell at y'all, go to the General Assembly and yell at y'all. But that's how I would probably approach that. And I'm happy to help you any way you want me to. Thanks. I would love to have further conversations and understanding because as a person who lives here and is my, my rent, it's just, <laughs> it's really more for me. <laughs> Well, I'm so, I, and I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's, it's for the community. Part. It's <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm joking, I'm joking. No. Um, jo I'm, it's a joke, y'all. Please, please, but, please take but, it But, I mean, truly, you, you, but, did, um, you did so, say the quiet part out loud, but this is <laughs> politics. I mean, like, you, you just hit it. Like, your lived experience is is what you know. And so that's not a horrible thing, <laughs> right? I mean. I, I mean, just don't want them to take it out of context. Half the city. Yes, half half the city. So um, Actually, the next more thing, than half. Yeah. Really? Wow, yeah. it's gone up. Um, so the other thing that I like just wanted to uplift, and I know the uh, Robin and Robin's wonderful team has been working on this over the last few months, is the tree ordinance. I know it's something that we talked about a few days ago. I think it's something I'm going to just go on record and say it's something I think it's worth pursuing. Um, as we're talking about the future of our city and sustainable development and just with looking at the urban heat islands and climate crisis, I think it's something worth pursuing. We're talking about building the city for the future. It's, I don't know. I don't know where the, the state would be on like trying to give us more tree rights. Um, and then another thing is investigative power for public housing violations. I know other cities have gone through the process of going to the peoples, the proper too. peoples, to do yeah, it. I'll, I'll you. Yeah. Oh, like, no, I'm, like I'm, look, yeah, I, I'm quite so, aware of that. That came yeah. up when I was on the yeah. council, too. Yeah, so those are uh, like the, th the, th the three things. And then the one thing that I heard from my friends, again, this is from the community, y'all, legalization. So I'm just going to go ahead and well, just so, you know, we, it, go forward you know, and just say that. I'll, I'll introduce you to Bill Raven, who would love to meet you. Okay. Um, <laughs> seriously, no, I mean, like, like, I'm not kidding you. This is a big deal to him. He's a cancer survivor. He very much believes in this. Um, he's mad it didn't pass last time. Um, we have friends that could use it and need it. Um, I'm 100% on board with uh, connecting the two of y'all. Y'all would be interesting bedfellows, and you, you never know <laughs> how that connection can benefit. And that's another thing. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm going to proselytize now, but you got to you, you have to understand in your new position like relationships really matter i mean russ and i uh, i keep hate to keep picking on russ but there's not a lot we agreed on at city council meetings but we were polite to each other we sat beside each other for four years we saw each other at the beach we can still have a normal conversation and that's the way to conduct any in life and I, I really, I, I look forward to us being able to step back to how nutty it's gotten over the past few years. And COVID, obviously, was a big part of that. But, you know, even at the General Assembly, as crazy as it gets and some of the things that they are yelling and so mad about, they still refer to each other as the gentleman or the lady. And there are all these, you know, very odd things and rules. And the rules of decorum are very important down there. If you've been because you've lobbied some, Mary, but if you've never been, it is sort of cool to go see like a really contentious issue and how that is uh, handled because everybody leaves, they might be mad, but then they'll go to dinner with each other. Mm -hmm. Do you have something, Megan? So I just want to, I want to be on that meeting too because I actually used to be a constituent of um, Bill Rabin, so sign me up too. Well, he, he's, a, he's a good man. Uh, he's very important to us. He's the rules chairman of the Senate. Mm -hmm. So he is the guy that says green light, red light on everything that goes through the Senate, so. And can you speak to, just specifically on this topic, oh, just because yeah. I'm really interested in it as well, what were the hesitations from, why didn't it pass? The medical marijuana? Legal, yeah. <laughs> um, well, there's some religious aspects, there's some the teetotaler aspect, there's some folks thought it was taxed too much, others thought it was taxed too little. I mean, if you want to pick, pick an issue, it had it all. And it's just a drug. You know, I mean, so those were fascinating hearings to go to, um, but he's still got his work cut out for him. Sure. I'm here all week, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Tip your waiters, yeah, waitresses. Right, 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 right. Yeah. 2.30. Yeah. No, I'm here with 3. three. I'm here okay. with 3.30 is my heart. Got I, I, I got to be here about 3.30. Uh, so really hearing um, a desire for you all, almost like a legislative one-on-one, -on -one, uh, Robin, and Robin, what are the seasons? Long season versus short season, 
getting this council the list of the priorities from the previous council, just so you can all affirm them. I'm so sorry. Uh, just so you all can affirm what's on there, review, edit, amend as you see fit. Um, a couple of you all are going to get directly with Philip on uh, some of your interest areas. At some point, you all will need to come, not an agenda. Um, you all will discuss, like, the formality that's appropriate for you all. Um, not necessarily legislative agenda, but what are those priorities? Funnel, I think is the term what, that you what, use, what, funnel. Um, so it sounds a lot more to be discussed on this um, a um, couple of things. Um, first off, we have the head of the apartment, um, well, the government affairs person from the apartment association here. Dustin, could oh, you? Nice. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, second, I would suggest that we make this um, a topic for our four by fours. Four by four? Okay. Got it. Manager update. Manager brief. <laughs> Briefing. Manager briefing. Yes. Thank you for being here, Philip. This was very helpful. Thank you all. Definitely. Thank you. So I think we have, we're waiting for lunch to arrive. Um, so if we could roll straight into the strategic planning update, that would be great. Uh, I feel like we just got a break, so y'all are okay. I'm reading body language. Y'all seem to be okay. So RTN, to, short notice. Stand up. <laughs> uh, but if we could bring up the strategy and innovation PowerPoint, that would be great. And yeah. do you know about the clicker? This is it. Let me get you the microphone. Here you go. Sorry. Monica, don't have flashbacks. Hello? Monica, don't have flashbacks. It's a strategy. I'm going to go sit in the corner. I don't know nothing about this topic. Well, she wasn't. Not. There we go. I'm not familiar with any of this stuff. Excellent. So for those of you who remember us last year, we were armed with paper clips in a fun challenge. This year we brought with us a box of Play-Doh, but in the effort of time, we are here to be nimble and agile. So we're going to cut to the chase and give you the strategic plan 101. We'll get to come back to meet with you again in April, and we'll continue this uh, exercise with Play-Doh. But I have with me Alex here, who's our new strategy and impact manager, and he's going to go over the 101 with you. So hello, uh, <laughs> Major and Council. My name, like Heather said, is Alexander Vasquez. Mike, closer, sorry. Um, I am the city's strategy and impact manager. So my goal for our time together is twofold. One, I want to provide you an overview of the strategic plan process here in the city. And two, I want to provide you an overview of the major components that make our strategic plan. For those of you who have served on council before, the information I highlight might sound very familiar, but I think it's really important for us to have a common understanding of how things operate in the city. Something that is particularly important given the different approaches that organizations can take when doing strategic planning. So let's get started. So what exactly is a strategic plan? In simplest terms, it is a document organizations use to point the way forward for, for their organization it establishes future goals and describes the work that needs to be undertaken to reach desired outcomes. In the city of Raleigh, the strategic plan is a five-year document that translates council's visions for the future into actionable strategy. It is a document that also allows us to bring in new ideas and innovations to city operations with the ultimate goal of making the services that we provide our residents better. It is a living document that guides our efforts as we are uh, our responsive to community needs. There's three primary reasons why we have a strategic plan. The first is that the strategic plan allows us to be transparent about our goals and our desired vision for the future. This allows us to be clear with city staff and the community at large about the direction that the city is going. And the transparency allows us to have conversations 
with the right people to make our vision for the city a reality. This also, in turn, allows us to foster stronger collaboration with our city departments and with external departments when appropriate. The strategy plan also gives us a North Star to follow. Uh, we are able to focus on our true priorities as we make decisions about resource allocation and projects that we're going to pursue in the future. Finally, the strategic plan provides a framework for raising awareness about the results that we generate. And because, it, because the strategic plan clearly describes the work we are doing, it's easy for us to report on the successes, the successes that we've had, as well as the outcomes that we're still working to achieve. The city's history with the strategic plan is relatively brief. The first strategic plan was implemented in fiscal year 2016 and ran through fiscal year 2020. As a matter of fact, Monica was responsible for producing that strategic plan. She sure was. <laughs> the current strategic plan is our second iteration of the strategic plan, and we began implement implementation of it in fiscal year 2021, and it runs through fiscal year 2025. For both plans, staff followed a simple formula. And that's outlined here on this slide. First, we started with council, looking, uh, working with them to identify their priorities, something that we did through council committee meetings. We all used the biennial community survey to collect resident feedback. We took particular uh, time to focus on finding areas of concern and opportunities for service improvements. We also took time to complete an assessment of essential efforts that we do in the city and see how they push our city and our, mis our city's mission and vision forward. We also took time to align our plan with other existing plans, which included the 2030 Comprehensive Plan, as an example. And finally, we looked to staff to uh, gather ideas about how we can incorporate emerging technologies, innovation, best practices into the strategic plan. Because we recognize that we need to be flexible in case there are synergies that arise or that we need to pivot because our priorities changed. We've developed a regular update process that allows us to make those changes. And when we think about potential changes, we think about the same formula up here. We look to council, we look to our residents, we look at our essential operations, and we look for staff for ideas. Our strategic plan is comprised of four key components, and they're outlined here on this slide. The first are key focus areas, also known as KFAs. And these are the cornerstones of our plan. They expand on our mission, our vision statement, and add structure to our priorities. In our current strategic plan, there are six key focus areas, which I will describe in more detail shortly. And historically, City Council has developed the key focus areas. Under each key focus area, we have objectives, and objectives are statements that describe what we're trying to accomplish, and it's usually to meet an operational need. In our current strategic plan, each KFA has three to five um, objectives, and historically, objectives have been developed by staff with significant input from council. Under each objective, we have multiple initiatives. Initiatives note the specific actions that staff will undertake in order to reach our objectives and ultimately the goals that are outlined for each of the key focus areas. The final component of our strategic plan are performance measures and targets. Performance measures are the data points we use to track what we do and targets provide context to those performance measures. They describe an expected or desired performance level. So together, performance measures and targets give us a sense of how successful we are at reaching our outcomes. They also help us determine how to iterate and make improvements to our city operations. And they also help us make informed decisions uh, about our resource allocation so that we can generate the biggest impact in our community. This slide lists the six key focus areas in our strategic plan. Note that council committees align very well with our key focus areas, with the exception of organizational excellence. While we don't have an arts and cultural resources committee, uh, a lot of, of the times when we do have to discuss arts and cultural resources initiatives, we do so through the EDI council committee. So the first key focus area in our strategic plan, it's arts and cultural resources. This is a KFA that is focused on promoting Raleigh arts, culture, and tourism, enhancing awareness of Raleigh's history, and providing diverse and accessible programming. One of the most popular and successful projects in the city is actually part of this KFA, and that's the implementation of the Dix Master Plan. EDI, or Economic Development and Innovation, 
is a KFA focused on building workforce development opportunities, supporting innovation and entrepreneurship, and encouraging business development throughout the city. Some of the major successes in this KFA include work the city has done to assist startups and small and minority owned businesses. Growth in natural resources focuses on protecting our environment, improving environmental equity and justice, and utilizing emerging technologies to support sustainability. Noteworthy projects being pursued under this KFA include the commissioning of the bio canopy initiatives in the future with a particular focus on social equity. Organizational excellence is focused on providing efficient and effective services to residents, making the city an employer of choice, building, an operational, uh, building our operational resiliency, and advancing social equity. Examples of this, uh, or examples of initiatives that are being pursued under this KFA include the work that Taish is doing with community engagement, as well as the work that we've done to mitigate recruitment and retention issues, efforts that have totaled over $20 million since April 2022. Safe, vibrant, and healthy community focuses on promoting safety, preserving and increasing the supply of affordable housing, supporting programs that encourage healthy living styles, and building trust, transparency, and accountability with our policing services. Examples of activities being pursued under this KFA include the creation of Access Hub, a referral hotline for eviction prevention and other housing services, the creation of the ACORNS team, which you all learned more about during the January 17th council meeting, and the work that is being done with community partners to mitigate food insecurity efforts that include the creation of community gardens that are funded through ARPA funds. The sixth and final key focus area in our strategic plan is transportation and transit. This KFA focuses on the implementation of a unified transportation and land use vision, promoting multimodal transportation, supporting an inclusive and equitable transportation system, and improving safety with a particular focus on bicyclists and pedestrians. Examples of the work being pursued in this KFA includes work to make Raleigh a vision zero city, our efforts to promote bus rapid transit, and the work that is being done to promote affordable housing and equitable development among our key transit corridors in the city. To ensure that the work outlined in our strategic plan is completed, we have built a pretty robust structure around our strategic plan, and this slide highlights our structure. At the top, we have the city manager who gives direction to everyone involved in the strategic plan, and she also clarifies council priorities to staff. Core teams are responsible for helping move work forward and providing general guidance to initiative teams. Core teams are aligned with each of the key focus areas in the strategic plan, and they're chaired by the deputy city manager and assistant city managers. And they are joined by department directors and assistant directors based on their expertise. Initiative teams, like I mentioned before, are responsible for developing and implementing action plans and work plans for each of their initiatives. And representatives from the Office of Strategy and Innovation, Budget Management Services, Communications, and the Department of Equity and Inclusion provide general support for the core teams. It's important that organizations create a reporting structure and processes that uh, promote discussion, accountability, and collaboration. And in the City of Raleigh, we do this through what we call City of Raleigh Statistics Meetings, better known as CORSTAT. CORSAT meetings are semi-annual meetings that um, bring city leadership together with initiative teams to review initiative progress, follow up on previous action items, discuss resource allocation, analyze performance measures trends, and collaborate troubleshoot issues if they arise. To communicate information related to the strategic plan with our community, we utilize multiple avenues. The first is regular presentation to council, like today's. In addition to allowing us to keep you all informed, we hope that these meetings create recordings and backup materials that are easily accessible to our residents. We also publish annual performance reports, something that we have done since 2017. As a matter of fact, Heather presented the fiscal year 22 performance report back uh, to the former council back in November. 
And finally, we also maintain and update a dedicated strategic plan site. You can see a screenshot of that homepage at the bottom right corner of this slide. As an office, we are actively dreaming up new ways to inform and engage the community on our strategic plan efforts. Some of the ideas that we're refining right now include the creation of short videos and even a podcast that highlights the successes that we've been able to generate um, through the strategic plan. And finally, this slide summarizes some key figures about our strategic plan. These numbers do not only reflect the breadth of the work that we do in our strategic plan, but more importantly, they highlight our collective commitment as a city to make Raleigh one of the best cities to live in. So with that, that concludes our formal presentation. I know that we are before lunch, so I don't know if lunch is ready, but we uh, do want to open up for any questions that y'all may have. And one thing that we do just kind of want to reiterate to you, and we'll do this again with you in April, but we view the strategic plan as a living document. Um, you know, something that is from the creation, from the shaping of ideas, and what I would like to also do is really point out our departments and the excellent work that they do. But this is where you will also be able to come in because as we see as a community, we have different needs and concerns that may change and shape throughout time. Our strategic plan is very uh, thorough, very resilient, and can adapt to this. And we can, again, address some of these issues as we go along. But we just wanted to give you kind of that 101 so you knew the basics of it. And then when we come back to you in April, we'll discuss a little bit more in depth and any of these initiatives that have actually been completed. When do we get to play with the Play-Doh? Yes, we have boxes of Play-Dohs that we will bring. And so that will be, uh, right now it's April 18th, so you can mark that on your calendar. It may change, but for now you can mark it on your calendar. So uh, the food is not yet here. The caterer is having issues. Mm -hmm. Council Member Graham, I assume you mm -hmm. have a question. Uh, so I don't know if yeah. time for Play-Doh or not. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any food yet. Uh, Council Member Graham. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you for letting uh, helping me to begin to understand the strategic, strategic plan. I know that uh, for me, being in committees that are based on the strategic plan, mm -hmm. I'm still going in blind. So um, I don't really understand exactly, to your point, what, what those initiatives are, what I could mm -hmm. send to those committees. So this would be a really big help. I know that you presented, as you said, it to the previous council in November, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if there's any space, especially for the new councilors here, how we can get that update so that we can begin to do the work of amplifying the, the, the message yeah. in yes. our committee. Yes, and so the, um, the update we have available, we can get that to the new council members. The, um, the report is actually posted on the website, and you should also, you have the strategic plan in your packet, but the report is on the website. But, um, you know, so in general, you know, your role with a strategic plan is, is a continuous process. And so the committee work that you do, you may have been introduced to some amazing ideas that could help us um, you know, uh, with any of these initiatives. So, for example, you know, one of our initiatives is thinking about creative ways for people to further engage with public transportation. You know, it, it's an ongoing process. It changes and it adapts. And so we're constantly working with our departments. That And one of the best features is that they are cross-departmental um, representatives. So they're bringing in their insight, their expertise, their talent to shape some of these initiatives but with the community and with council as well, um, you know, we're always open to, um, to uh, ways in which we can adapt uh, with these initiatives. I appreciate that. Yeah, just uh, as we sit at the table, these are the things, the questions that I've had in the past of mm -hmm. how do I know what this, community, this committee does? How do I know what to send to it? I, I think having a well-rounded understanding, me, I know we haven't even met yet um, in any of the committees. So those are places that I would like for us to push a little harder so that we understand what we're doing before we get there. Yeah. Good. Thank you for this. Um, very kind of you to, to present to us. I appreciate your time. Um, I wanted to kind of a ask, and I'm not sure if this is quite a question for you, so, so push it away if it needs to be. Um, there are a lot of sort of like guidance documents and a lot of like language for for our community to, to consume and they're you know sometimes they're coming at it as a consumer like I just how do I get my trash collected but sometimes they're coming at it from a broader lens of what's my city all about and then we have like 
mission and a vision and, a, and this plan and the UDO and the comprehensive mm -hmm. plan and, and like there's just sort of like got documents on documents on documents mm -hmm. and you know, the Dick's Edge study has its own set of themes like and and so I, I guess um, We've been talking a lot about how we tell our story mm -hmm. together, a lot of storytelling, a lot of like sort of underutilization of available programming. Oh, and, I, and I also um, find myself wondering if we're creating duplicative work in these different areas. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering like how, if you've given any thought to or what conversations have existed around, like how we kind of create this hierarchy that's easy for everyone to digest, like here's where you start and then we can drill down into how this this one value led to this one study which led to this one action like how do we help make it visual and digestible for our community to understand how all of these different guiding documents and language create the city that we want to see so I, to answer that question there's two pieces one as part of the development of the strategic plan, we did look back at the previous plans that we have created, and I mentioned in the presentation one of those examples, the 2030 Comprehensive Plan, but we tried to align other work to this. I think as an office right now, we are working through to do exactly what you're proposing, being able to connect and, and figure out a better alignment for all the documents that do exist, but then also communicating around what those say. So that is something that we're working on. Yeah, just thought of an idea based on your question. Um, probably a third item to add to our community engagement board is that outreach and lining up piece. And I said the third item, it might be fourth or fifth, but I know the first two are already hot. But that may be a piece because, again, it's connecting all of this and making sure we have some type of streamline. Um, as far as going forward. So I think the work that you all do, working with community engagement, you know, so when they go out in the community and talk about a topic, it's always connected to one of the items in the strategic plan, and that I keep it all connected. Absolutely, and what we've talked about as well, so right now are, uh, we have the two meetings a year that are currently internal. So the departments and the initiative teams come together, they do report outs. We're shaping that a little bit differently. So um, upcoming, we've got speakers from the community, such as Maggie Kane, to really connect the work that we do to the actual partners that we have. But for our summer session, we're looking to have a component that would be open up to the community. So actually, it builds really nicely with what Taisha was talking about. You know, we're, we've, we, we love to think about uh, placemaking and gathering for creativity. So we've been playing around with like a creative, you know, collisions in which the community and our partners come together and they can see some of the key um, advances we've been making and, and have that better engagement. And so we, we absolutely would work with Taisha and her team to really celebrate the work that we do, but invite community partners to come in and, and as you're thinking about you know, the suggestion on particular themes that might really resonate with people. But again, allow those further touch points and engagement because that is again how we shape the work that we do is through again this partnership and collaboration and you know, consistently building, reimagining the work that we do. That also collides with the whole idea that um, we had discussed earlier about our boards and commissions and bringing them together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. Considering, um, so, all right. You all, the food is not yet here, um, but I feel like we need a, a break. Um, so let's take a break and um, send good vibes that the caterer finds us, okay? Um, so yeah, let's take a break and we'll see how long of a break. Was that weird? Having me in the audience? Yeah.
permission official permission to break out the play-doh so that's what we're going to do I have a couple recommendations um, so we have brought enough to share with the management team as well I do recommend you clear a space so that you have um, some room to create all right so for this particular activity we're bringing in some of the science behind creativity and innovation so what we're doing here is tapping into the left side and right side of your brain we're allowing you to actually build something, and we're gonna allow you to have that freedom to let it take whatever shape that you would want it to. So we're gonna give you, we've got a little extra time than originally, so we're gonna give you about four to five minutes, and your job is to build the best flower. Build the best flower. You have, you have different uh, containers around you with different colors. Please do share resources with your friends. 
But we're going to give you now time to just create. So the theme again is to build the best flower. What? Lawyers, lawyers can build flowers. <laughs> All right, so we can, we can give a, a recap as we kind of go on. So I see that uh, Councilmember Branch has really started in, digging into some of the colors there. We've got our departments over here, definitely. We've got uh, City Clerk's Office is really digging into this as well. And we certainly hope that parks will represent well in this activity. <laughs> yes, so IT is asking us for clarification of the process. <laughs> All right. So for those at home watching, we've got people who are creating here, using different colors, coming up with different ideas. <laughs> no, it's definitely not a competition. So budget might be actually collaborating on a team there, if I can, uh, if I can see correctly. All right, so we're going to give you about two more minutes, two more minutes. <laughs> okay, so some people are asking more time for their creativity to percolate. We can probably accommodate. We can probably accommodate. All right, we're still busy working, and I do see, ooh, Raleigh Water is, you, okay, so for those that don't know, there is usually a competition with Raleigh Water and the other departments, and so this might be yet another arena in which Raleigh Water is usually out ahead. All right, and our city attorney is uh, shaping up to be, have a very good flower over here. So again, once you allow that creativity to go, you'll be surprised at what you can come up with. <laughs> oh, that's what I was just going to do. <laughs> okay, all right. So we've got people uh, talking about working in teams together, partnering together. All right. It's, it's very impressive, yes. <laughs> All right, I see Councilmember Jones has some good colors over here with her flower. And you can have a second creation already. Okay, yes, um, the city clerk's office, yes, I think Gail would be very proud of the representation today. Wow, all right, yes. 
<laughs> All right. And yes, Parks. Parks is holding true to its reputation. All right. So for those at home, see what you miss out on when you don't come to these events. All right. We will give you one more minute to wrap up. One more minute to wrap up. <laughs> yes, you may absolutely keep the Play-Doh. All right, and we're coming to the end of our time, so I'll give you about 30 more seconds to make those finishing touches. And it is too bad we don't have a mobile camera to uh, go around and see what we've created here. <laughs> All right, so we're coming to the end, so please, I encourage you to kind of look around, look at your neighbor's creations, and see the different perspectives that people brought to this. And we can see some really fascinating colors. I do have to kind of draw our attention over here to Cassidy, because her... Uh, oh, there, oh, yes. All right, so if you can see over here, Cassidy's is, is multidimensional. Yes. <laughs> All right. And, and Parks. Parks also has a standing one. Yes. Yes. So representing the beautiful sunflowers of, of Raleigh. Anyone else see of your neighbor something that you want to point out that is quite spectacular? All right. Oh, oh, actually, Assistant City Manager Evan also is working on a, um, a three-dimensional one as well. <laughs> All right. So I do encourage you to take out your cameras, take some photos, maybe post that for today. But the, the inspiration of this little activity was, was twofold. One was researched by the Kauffman Foundation and their work on what makes a thriving innovation ecosystem. And what their research shows is that governments cannot be lonely little flowers in a desert, right? That just try to do their own things, that keep their ideas to themselves. What they need to do is work with their community, work with their businesses to create multiple flowers right, that come together and they flourish together and they create this really wonderful garden. So as you can see around us, people have different perspectives and viewpoints on what something is. And that is what makes our city of Raleigh so wonderful, is not only do we have these different perspectives and viewpoints and experience, but we come together and share that. So what Kaufman talks about is as a local government, this is what we want to do is, is keep creating these opportunities for people to come together to create, maybe to be challenged to do something they didn't think that they were capable of doing. But if you do that, you start to build these very dense gardens, right? And they can become more resilient. They can withstand maybe conflict or, or other challenges that might come their way. But also, certain flowers need perhaps different attention at different times. And that's okay to be able to shift your attention and your resources perhaps to some of the flowers that might need it at that particular time. So our Office of Strategy and Innovation, we, we are kind of known in those, as those strange places, like literally all of our trunks are full of canisters of Play-Doh and sticky notes and writing materials. But you know, where our hope is, is to really, really capture the talent that we already have here within the city and the talent that we already have with the community and keep bringing these opportunities to bring it together and to create, to innovate, but again, make sure that our city is very vibrant. The other thing that kind of sparked this particular activity would be some of the wonderful murals around our city. 
And some of you may have seen those, the beautiful paintings all around town of flowers. So I would encourage you to kind of travel around the city and to go see those. What you may not know about those murals is that all of those murals are typically a partnership of multiple departments and multiple community members. So as what I've really enjoyed about Raleigh the last couple of years is we just keep continuing to create. We come up with different perspectives. One of these murals is, is on a stormwater drain, right? And so we just keep thinking about ways to make the city more beautiful, to celebrate its past and its future. So what's our status on lunch? <laughs> I just love the whole symbolism in that activity, Heather. So I'm glad we were able to do it. Um, we have a short video that we're going to share about departmental uh, accomplishments. Like Heather said, you all have so much talent in your staff. You as council have said that too over the last two days. So this is a video that's really going to highlight um, how they're serving the community.
lots to celebrate there. Don't know if council wants to take it. Food is here. That's a disclaimer. <laughs> but lots to celebrate. Just looking at some of the slides, just thinking about some of those things in the planning mode and to see them completed and accomplished. Um, things from like a psychologist for fire departments. Things are like on the forefront and best practices that other communities are just starting to approach. And you all are already doing them. Um, as a government, local government person, I'm just like in awe right now. Um, so just congratulations to you all and your staff um, and to this council for the leadership and support that you've given staff to be able to do those types of bold things. Um, not sure if you all want to say anything before you eat. I just want to echo that and say thank you. Thank you. I'm new, so I had nothing to do with any of that. But to watch and, and the list of accomplishments go on and on and on, I am so excited to work with you and to learn from everything that you guys are doing. So thank you. Yeah. I'll just add another thanks for, for staff. Um, I know there's so many new faces up here at the table this year, and you all have been um, so patient and welcoming with us as we ask um, roughly 600 questions about each topic. Um, <laughs> thank you for your patience, your guidance, your, your neutrality, your visioning, and all the things that you've already provided us. Thanks so much. Yes. Councilmember Black. Oh, uh, yeah, echoing. Why is my mic always so loud? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it likes you. <laughs> they turned yours off. <laughs> Echoing the, everything I just heard, um, very appreciative to staff for our uh, 11 million questions. Expect some more, especially after um, everything that we just watched. There were some things I was like, I don't even know what that is. So I'm going to find that person and ask them some more questions. So just get ready for more questions. And thank you for treating us with grace during this process over this last few weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and shout out to you guys. Mm -hmm. Nice. I just want to say thank you because I know you all have done a lot of work and you're not fully staffed. Mm -hmm. Some of the departments didn't have directors. Um, you had a lot of people stepping up throughout last year as interims. Um, and, but still the work in the city kept moving. We kept moving forward. So with that lens of knowing all that you dealt with, I just want to say thank you for continuing to show up um, and show out. Um, and I just look forward to us continuing to collaborate and working together over the next couple of years. Um, I know you said 600 questions, trust me, that's a short list. Um, <laughs> yeah. when, when you look at everything that they get from us and they get from constituents. Mm -hmm. I know we get a lot of emails, but I know a lot of them email you all directly. Um, so again, I say thank you. And um, we can't pay you enough. We get budgets coming up. We can't pay you enough, but I can say, you are appreciated, and we're going to do everything we can to continue to show you that we appreciate you. Mm. But I will say, too, to the staff, um, certainly we appreciate all the support you give for us, but there have been incidences, and Christina and I can attest to a meeting a couple weeks ago where staff really... Um, took it on the chin for the city and had some very, very tough conversations. And so we definitely appreciate all that you do for us, but then we also want to recognize that there are times that you're dealing with people who are frustrated with us, but they may not be able to get to us, and you're the closest person that they can get to. And so those conversations can be very heated and challenging and sometimes very unprofessional and rude. Um, and so for those folks who have to stand in the fire sometimes on our behalf, unfortunately, um, definitely appreciate that because that's at times more than what you really are obligated to do. So just want to acknowledge that. I was there. So. Uh, Mayor, do you want to close this out? We probably have the best staff in the world. And I cannot tell you... Since I've been on council 2007, um, the work the staff has done has really changed the city in such a positive way. And I just want to encourage everybody to keep bringing forward your big ideas. Let's continue to innovate. Let's continue to be leaders. And that's it all comes from you. So um, keep up the great work, and thank you, thank you, thank you. As a 
local government staff this like words you wish to hear so yeah. all right with that we are going to break to lunch which is across the room where breakfast was um, I know that's a distant memory of eating um, over here um, so let's do 30 minutes um, so we will be back here at 204 all right <laughs>
Okay, so your next presentation is going to be from your budget and financial uh, teams, two departments represented here. Uh, you have your chief financial, financial officer, Allison Brasher. Um, we have Sadia Sattar, who is your new budget and management services director. I feel like you're new. Well, you're I'm very new. Okay, awesome. Uh, so they are going to go through a pretty informative uh, presentation for you. So we have about an hour scheduled. Um, so I'll turn it over to you all. Are you going to stay over there, or do you want the mic? Are yeah, you going to come take, here? I will take the mic. Okay. Um, I wouldn't mind turning it on because I like to walk around. Okay. There you go. All you. So, 
It's on. You don't have to do anything. Hello. Oh, okay. Well, good afternoon. My name is Sadia Sattar. I am your new Budget and Management Services Director. It's a little late in the day than we had thought that we would be talking about budget and finance. I get it, it's a dry topic, but we're gonna try to be as engaged as possible. Here's a quick agenda for all of you. Um, we're gonna go over a quick overview of budgets, what budgets are, the different kinds of budgets, what our goals are, especially for this session. And then we're gonna talk about this current fiscal year's budget, most notably your current revenues and your current expenses. Allison will be speaking to all of you about revenues and I will be speaking to you all about our current expenses. And then we're also going to do a deep dive into our enterprise revenues. From there, we're gonna be talking about some fun capital and financing models, as well as giving you all an ARPA update. And last but not least, we're going to wrap up with what's to come, and that is the fiscal year 2024 budget process. Talk to you all in depth about some of the cool things that we're doing for fiscal year 2024, but then also look ahead. You know, what does the future hold for us? And then end with some next steps. So I'm going to kick us off with our overview for this session. And most notably, we wanna talk about what our goals are. So our goals for this session are, we want this to be a period where you provide us with some feedback. We want this to be a period of reflection. We hopefully aim to educate you about the city's budget as well as the city's finances. And then last but not least, we want this to be a period of engagement. So we definitely have questions, uh, time reserved at the end for some questions. But if you look at the FREE, we want you to be free. And I know this is after lunch, it's in the afternoon, but I'm trying. So here we go. So what is a budget? For most of you, it is a spending plan, it is a forecast, but let's think about it a little bit more, right? We produce a four or 500 book every year as part of the budget process. It's more than numbers. It's an expression of our priorities every year as a city. It's also a reflection of our values. And then I really, really wanna talk about the different kinds of budgets. So we think about the fact that we have this huge city budget, but different budgets have different purposes, and that is the purpose of this slide. So we have here listed the different, three different kinds of budgets, which are your operating capital and enterprise budgets. So when you think of your operating budget, think of your day-to-day -day services. When you think of your capital budget, think of the stuff that you can see and touch, which is your community centers, when you think of a huge fire like ladder truck, so these expenses are over $25,000 and also have a useful life of 10 years. And then you also have something called enterprise funds. So an enterprise fund is run like a business. The fees that it charges pay for its operations. So most notably, we're thinking Raleigh Water here, your solid waste services, and your storm water. We also have what are called special revenue funds. And those kinds of budgets are budgets that are dedicated for a specific purpose. So think about a grant that the city receives. An example would be a safer grant. So that is for four person staffing at a ladder truck. So that grant will be used for that specific purpose. Similarly for ARPA funds, the government has pretty strict guidelines on what they wanna use it for. Granted those guidelines do keep changing, but again, specific purpose, special revenue funds. And last but not least, there are also services that we provide to other departments within the city, internal stuff, and that is your internal service funds. So for us, it looks like something like our risk management, health and dental insurance, all of these things are part of our internal service funds. But then what is the end game when we come to budgeting every year, right? We obviously wanna be balanced, and by balanced I mean we want our revenues to equal our expenses. We don't wanna be in a deficit where our revenues are less than our expenses. We are not the federal government, we cannot print money. I wish we had a mint in Raleigh, but we don't. And we would love to be in a surplus, but that is more and more uncommon, um, especially in these post-COVID times. So after this overview, we just wanna dive right into the fiscal year 2023 budget. And this is your city's budget. 
Your overall budget for the current fiscal year is $1.14 billion. And to the left of the slide, you will see all of the revenue. So that's all the funds coming into the city. And on the right-hand side of the slide is how you are spending that money. So you'll see that the largest portion of your revenues is your real and other property taxes. And the majority of your expenses as a city are set aside for salaries and benefits. Here's another look at your general fund. So what we showed you in the prior slide was all funds, but this is your general fund. For fiscal year 2023, you have an adopted budget of $590.4 million. And again, on the right, sorry, on the left, you'll see where the money comes from, which is your revenues. And on the right, you'll see where the money goes, your expenses. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Allison to talk all revenues with all of you. going to talk about property tax, which uh, is a general fund revenue, and it is the largest revenue source for the general fund. Um, <clears throat> it is $292.4 million and is about 53% of the total revenues. Uh, the tax rate is set annually uh, as a part of the budget process by you, the council, um, and Wake County collects taxes on behalf of the city. Uh, the next revaluation here in Wake County will take place in calendar year 2024 and will actually impact the 25 budget. And this process would cover all residential, commercial, land and structures, homes, apartments, condominiums, everything. Uh, there are three programs that have been authorized by the General Assembly uh, relative to taxpayer relief, and they are listed on the slide there. Uh, WakeCounty.gov's website is very detailed on what programs are offered and how folks can apply for that uh, if you search need help paying your property tax bill. Uh, the application is online and in printable forms in English and in Spanish, and there is also a help number to call as well. The current city tax rate is 39.3 cents for every $100 of value. The median home value here in Raleigh is slightly less than $258,000, which translates to a tax payment to the city of $1,013 annually. The city also has two municipal districts, uh, downtown and Hillsborough Street, that have incremental property taxes on top of the 39.3, and those really go back into the districts to enhance the mission and for services um, and the districts to activate those corridors. So on the left-hand side of the chart uh, is a, just a few key points about property tax. We do have an assessed value here in the city of $73.5 billion, and we have tax bills that go out 100, 174,000 uh, tax parcels. We have a very good balance of residential and commercial properties here, which is uh, excellent and creates a strong tax base for the city. So the sales tax is actually the second revenue source for the city, and for the 23 budget, it is $130 million. Uh, this revenue is by far the most volatile because it is really based on consumer spending and overall consumer confidence. Uh, sales tax is levied at the state and county level, and then a portion of the county piece uh, comes down into Raleigh. Um, and I think Philip actually brought this up earlier, but there are a number of uh, what are called uh, articles that talk about how the, that sales tax is allocated. Uh, there are a couple that are just highlighted on the slide, 39 and 42 are point of sale, and what that really means is transactions that occur within the boundaries of the city. And then Article 40 is a formula-based and is uh, looked at as the per capita or the population here. Uh, sales tax, uh, just due to the processing of how long it takes to be reported, we receive this information three months in arrears, so we always are sort of looking behind us. Um, at the same time, we are looking at economic trends as we think about the forecast. Uh, the graph there um, is a really interesting one, and the bars uh, represent the budget, and it goes back to FY16 all the way up to FY23. 
The line graph there in green actually shows where our actuals have been since 16. And what you can really see from the start of the pandemic through 22 is how they spread. So our actuals came in significantly higher than where we anticipated our budgets. We were not the only local government to lower our sales tax expectations when COVID and the pandemic started, just because no one really knew what was going to be taking place, and so we lowered our budgets. But you can see just the way that line graph really shot up over that time period, and there's really two factors that go into that. Uh, first is just the unprecedented amount of federal stimulus money that was uh, distributed to American households during that time frame. So bottom line is consumers were able to keep on spending during this time frame. Also, the other factor that I think we all see when we go to the grocery store is just inflation and how much more stuff costs than it did. We're at historic highs. And the translation there, it's a math equation, right, means we bring in more sales tax as a result. Now, we are seeing, so the, the chart at the bottom, um, I know that's probably pretty hard to see, but is really saying that uh, inflation is starting to slow down a little bit. It certainly is not back to um, the levels that I think we're all accustomed to, but it's going to be really something we watch because that is going to impact our sales tax collections as we move into the future. Uh, the next chart, and I won't spend a lot of time on this one, is um, our user fees. So here in the general fund, we have two. We have development services and our parks and rec fees. And those two bar graphs are the same. So the bars are the budget, and the line graphs show our actuals. Um, and you can see that uh, the development activity, again, much like with sales tax, we expected it. You can see that bar graph goes down when you look at 20 and 21. We expected not knowing that uh, developers would have a hard time getting capital and things like that to continue their projects. And what you can see from the line graph there is that is not the case. And we are continuing to see strong development uh, activity here in Raleigh. Parks and Rec is a little bit of a different story. You can see where the line graph really kind of goes down, and we're slowly edging our way back up on Parks and Rec revenue. I know, for example, we just did Holiday Express for the first time in a couple of years since COVID. So the programs are coming back. They are just not at the levels that they were uh, prior to the pandemic. The little dots there on the FY23 are there just to symbolize where we are year to date uh, for the current year. And you can certainly see on the development user fee slide that we are, we are well on our way to making the budget. In fact, I believe we're going to exceed the budget, and I'll talk about that in a minute. In Parks and Rec, we're about 50%. We're right where we would expect to be under our current year budget. The other, the, the really the last bucket, um, which I just call other general fund revenues, because there's not necessarily one revenue in here that is um, significantly high. In fact, the highest is vehicle tax and tag. Uh, represents about 21% of the budget, and a lot of this was actually what was mentioned earlier. These are state allocations that come to us. So it's the Powell Bill, which we use for streets. It's a franchise tax. Again, this is by legislation that we're allocated. And then, again, the largest piece being, being our vehicle tax and tag, which is the property tax on vehicles here. And if you go to the next slide, um, so just really in summary, so this is just the general fund piece. We'll talk about the enterprises uh, here in a second. Uh, we are expecting our property tax to uh, meet the budget for the current year. We are anticipating that sales tax is going to exceed the budget by between 5 to $10 million as we stand here today. Uh, user fees, again, with that strong development activity is going to surpass the budget. I am anticipating that all other revenues, that large bucket, is going to be right at our budget. So ultimately, for the general fund, we are anticipating uh, revenues to be slightly higher by 8 to $15 million than we had anticipated. We are going to continue to monitor the economic conditions. Saudia has a chart on that in a, in a couple of slides, uh, because there is a lot of unknowns uh, when we look into the future relative to the economy. Talks of recession, we're certainly seeing again the continued inflation, high interest rates. So there's a lot of unknowns still to go as we look into the, to the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Saudia for the expense side.
Sure. So I wanted to just touch base with all of you on city expenses for the current fiscal year. Again, reminding all of you that our general fund adopted budget for the current fiscal year is $590.4 million. And of the piece of the pie, you can see that the majority of our budget is in that public safety uh, bracket. So what is that? That's your police, that's your fire, that's your emergency communication center. And then, I think I need my glasses. We then have infrastructure and public services as well as capital that we devote the majority of our funds to. But what we really wanted to do was to show you how our budget has changed, especially since before COVID and now. And the next slide really represents that. So it might be a little hard to see, but I'd be happy to describe it for all of you. You'll see, pardon? Thank you. <laughs> Trying to look at all of you. So the majority of our budget, as you can see from fiscal year 19 to current day, has been spent on police. So our police department's budget has grown $19.3 million over the course of the past five years, followed by parks and recreation with $11.2 million, and then the fire department with $10.6 million. I'm not going to go over each and every department, but I also just wanted to point that you'll see at the bottom a little negative where the Office of Economic Development is. That's simply because we move the functions of that department into other departments, such as housing and neighborhoods. So this is just a really fantastic representation of how the shift of our share of our budget has changed pre and now post COVID. And again, if you kind of go back to the fact that budgets are forecast, but they're also a reflection of our priorities. So this is a fantastic representation of that statement. So where are we now? You will have all have uh, in your packets our quarter two financial reports. So kudos to staff for really hustling and getting that to all of you. But you'll see that in comparison to last um, fiscal year's quarter two, we're actually spending more. We're spending more in our personnel, that's that blue. We're spending more in benefits, that's the orange. We're spending more in operating. So where you're operating is your fuel, no surprise there considering how insane fuel, diesel, gas prices have been. And then of course, the other category, that's your capital expenses. Um, so we are definitely spending more. And what does that mean for us? So the next slide is a really fantastic projection of where we are now and where we anticipate to be. And I just want to reiterate a couple of terms with, in front of all, um, with all of you. So I started this part of the presentation talking about our adopted budget, really sim uh, signifying that our adopted budget, which is what the previous council adopted on July 1st of last year, or previous, prior to July 1st, was $590.4 million. Currently, we're right here. We're at that 620. So what does that mean? It means that things change throughout the year. What you adopt in July and you start the fiscal year with in July 1 isn't necessarily where you end up. And that's what we're really trying to signify over here. So currently, this is our budget at the moment, which is 620 million, and I'm talking about general fund. And this is where we are projected to be on June 30th, which is $583 million. Now, what does that mean, right? It means that we plan, our budget is a spending plan, we plan to spend a certain amount of money, but that doesn't happen. Why doesn't that happen? Well, we don't invest in a project that we thought we would because of timelines. We don't have enough staff in our departments because we're having recruiting issues. So all of these things compounded one on top of the other is what determines where we end up at the end of the fiscal year. All right, back to me here. So um, as Saudia highlighted in the beginning, uh, we do have six funds that uh, essentially run like a business and, and they are enterprise funds. And ultimately what that means, as Saudia mentioned in the beginning, is these funds are really designed to have their user fees pay for their operations, including their capital investments. So I'm gonna talk quickly through each one. Uh, the first one on the list is Rally Water, uh, by far our largest enterprise and is fully funded by user fees. As you're aware, Rally Water is a regional provider. Uh, so we have uh, folks outside of the city limits that are supporting Rally Water and paying for their services. 
because of the high capital infrastructure needs in Raleigh Water, we will be, and you will be seeing on a future council agenda, we will be issuing debt uh, in order to begin to finance those capital funds. And I've got a few slides on that as we um, go through the agenda. Uh, Stormwater, uh, they're on track. They are also 100% supported by the user fees charged for stormwater. Uh, solid waste, again, they are also on track as we look at our FY23. They do have a combination. They are not 100% supported by the solid waste fees folks pay here in Raleigh. They do receive a general fund subsidy. Uh, this year it's $7.7 .7 million. The Convention Center is also on track. Uh, they have quite a combination of uh, revenues that come in to the Convention Center, and this is really the full complex, so it's the four venues. It's the Convention Center itself, it's Red Hat, Walnut Creek, and the Performing Arts Center. So all of that is in that line. They have user fees. The PAC, or the Performing Arts Center, does receive a small general fund subsidy, and they have other sources, which primarily is funded by the Wake County Hospitality Tax, uh, which is the prepared food and beverage and occupancy tax that's collected at the Wake, at Wake County level and funnels into Raleigh. Uh, that primarily supports the debt uh, on our current convention center as well as operations. The two funds, enterprise funds, that are what we call on watch, meaning nothing to get alarmed about, but just something that staff continues to watch, is parking and transit. So specifically for parking, uh, they are, by the way, fully uh, funded by user fees, but we have not gotten back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so our revenues, um, again, just haven't gotten back. I think everybody is probably aware of that with remote work still occurring, et cetera. So it is just an enterprise that staff will watch over time. Transit uh, is as well. So as you're well aware, uh, the fees have been suspended since COVID. So there are no user fees uh, coming into the transit enterprise. They are subsidized by the general fund as well as other sources, that being primarily grants. Um, and I do know that you have an upcoming work session, I believe it's in February, to specifically dive deep into transit and talk about fare free. All right. So we're, we're halfway through. Exciting. All right. Now we're going to move into the really fun stuff, which is your capital budget, your financing models, which is how do we finance those massive capital projects in the city. And then we're going to end this section with an update on ARPA. So the slide's a little finicky, but I think I'm going to get it. So this is your current capital budget. So just like city council adopts a general fund budget every fiscal year, you also adopt a capital budget every year. And this year, our capital budget for fiscal year 2023 is $554 million. Again, you can see that the largest piece here is Raleigh Water at $22.8 million, followed by investments in facilities and infrastructure, and then transportation. But I also really wanted to emphasize that while council does pass an annual operating and capital budget, each year you are actually passing a capital improvement plan. So the current capital improvement plan is actually $1.98 billion. And not to put Raleigh Water on the spot here, but the majority of that is actually Raleigh Water. And you'll see that in that next slide that we have. So like I said, the key pieces or the biggest pieces of the pie in our capital budget are transportation, facilities and infrastructure in Raleigh Water. And we really wanted to highlight some of those big projects that our council approved as part of the fiscal year 2023 capital program. So what does that mean for transportation? Well, we've invested $11 million in a two-way conversion project. We've also invested $2 million in bridge repairs and inspections. $1.5 million in neighborhood traffic calming, and a million dollars in pedestrian and bicycle improvements, as well as a half a million dollars in Vision Zero spot and safety program. The next is facilities and infrastructure. We've set aside $10 million for a police evidence building, $5 million for fire station one and an admin office. 
There's also a million and a half dedicated to public project community support fund, which you've heard about prior to lunch. And then there's also $1.4 million dedicated to a public safety facility maintenance, as well as for building system improvements. And then, like I said earlier, we have Raleigh Water. So for fiscal year 2023, we have $222.8 million. But like I said, that $1.98 billion, 1.2 of that is Raleigh Water because they have some really, really big projects to do. Two of those are highlighted here. There's plenty more, but I, that would have been many, many more slides. So, for example, there's this sewer interceptor project for $104 million, all budgeted in fiscal year 23. And then one of those other projects is the expansion of the EM Johnson Water Treatment Plant. So like I mentioned earlier, capital projects, big ticket items, take quite a few years to complete. So I really wanted all of you to really keep that in mind. And now Allison's going to talk about how we pay for all these things. Yeah, so as Saudia said, those are certainly some big, big numbers. I can certainly appreciate that. And so what this slide is designed to do is really just to elaborate on how we go about funding that capital initiative of almost $2 billion. So on the left-hand side is PAYGO, uh, which essentially is cash. Um, we know we don't generate enough cash, right, in order to do that level of capital infrastructure. So much like households that borrow for a mortgage or a car, uh, the city does the same. We actually borrow money, right, in order to invest in those capital infrastructure needs. And we really do that in three ways. We do that through general obligation or geo bonds. Uh, those are voted on uh, as a part of the referendum. Everyone will recall we just voted a $275 million parks bond in November. That's an example of that. Uh, and those uh, debt service payments are ultimately paid for by the Raleigh taxpayers. Revenue bonds, very different, are actually backed by the enterprise themselves. In this case, they are backed by Raleigh Water. So as I said on a previous slide, Raleigh Water is 100% funded by the users of the system. So essentially, those users pay for the debt associated with the borrowing. Those are not voted on, um, different than, again, geo bonds. And the third type of uh, debt financing that I'll talk about today is limited obligation. So uh, these are really what we refer to as LOBs. Uh, you will hear that. Uh, but these go to pay for mostly city infrastructure. So these are your fire stations, the law enforcement training center that just opened, and other city facilities. These are non-voted, so they do not go to the public for a vote, and they are paid for by the Raleigh taxpayers. And all of that is incorporated into the numbers that Saudi had just provided and are very detailed in our budget book uh, relative to the, the different levels of capital programming there. So uh, speaking then just quickly on, on debt, uh, there's a couple things on this slide that I'd really like to highlight. And the first is the city's credit rating. So much like all of us have a credit score, the city has a credit rating. And we are super proud of the fact that we are referred to as what's called a triple A city, meaning we have the best credit there is, uh, which is great to know. And it's on general obligation and on our Raleigh water. And there are very few cities uh, in the U.S. that can claim the, the double uh, crown there. Um, and really what that means to our taxpayers is when we go into the market to borrow money in order to support that capital plan, we are borrowing money at the lowest interest rate is, that is possible. And remember, these bonds span over a 20, 30-year period. So really, that is great for the taxpayers of today as well as the future to be able to go into the market at, uh, and achieve low interest rates. The city's debt portfolio is over $2 billion, uh, so very, very large. Uh, really, uh, the pie chart there shows how much is uh, funded, uh, if you will, from the general government side. And then the other large slice of the pie is Raleigh Water, as we just talked about. A few slides ago, I mentioned that we will have uh, two, well, 
I don't think I mentioned just one, but we will be having two debt issuances in the spring. Uh, so at least for the council members that were here in, in 2020, you may remember right at the beginning of pandemic, uh, the city had plans to go and issue fixed debt. And what we ended up doing was doing a draw program, uh, which is affectionately called a bans or a bond anticipation note. And ultimately, for the last several years, we've just borrowed money through a line of credit with banks um, in order to ensure that that the capital infrastructure and the plan we had in place stayed on track. And uh, our banks really stepped up, again, because of our, our great credit and that allowed us to do that program. And it's now time to close those programs, issue fixed debt, and then we will be starting new draw programs. And those are items that you'll be seeing in the next couple of months as a part of the council agenda. Also at one of your uh, council meetings in March, we will have the city's financial advisors, which are DEC associates out of Charlotte. They're going to come and talk to you a little bit more about the credit rating process, uh, what goes into it, what are some of the things that the credit rating entities look at, um, just so you have a better appreciation for what that is and to help us maintain that AAA, because a lot of it is about our financial policies and how we posture our ourselves from a fiscal perspective. So in order to, to support that, uh, we have several long-term financial planning models. Uh, and so each of them is slightly different in their own right, but they really do tie back to the CIP that Saudia just talked about. In fact, they go well beyond five years, though. Uh, each has key financial metrics that are looked at, again, depending on the type of um, revenues we're talking about. We have a general debt model that supports, again, the, the think of it as the fire stations, the law enforcement training center. Raleigh Water uh, has its own rate model just because there is so much going on in Raleigh Water. Uh, the convention center has its own as well because, again, we get that piece from the Wake County hospitality tax. And then Stormwater also has a very, very detailed uh, model, again, looking at how not only do you plan for today and, the, and covering the cost of your current operations, but how do we make sure we're planning for the future? So the sources into those models are everything from property tax for the general debt model to user fees that I spoke about to the way County hospitality uh, taxes. The sources out of those models are probably what you would expect. They are the debt service payments, which is just like your mortgage payment or your car payment. And then we look also, again, at what, what's the future holding and what do we need to plan for to be fiscally responsible. And all of those models really talk about, as we put that CIP plan in place, what is the city's debt affordability? How much can we afford relative to capital infrastructure that we so desperately need to continue to invest in? All right. So for those of you um, that are new, the city received $73.2 million in America Rescue Plan Act funding, so ARPA funding. The slide highlights the key initiatives that that money so far has been dedicated to. So we have, as of November of 2022, I just want to highlight that this update is as of November 2022, we have spent or budgeted for $48.5 million, and we have remaining funding of $23.7 million in ARPA funds. I also wanted to just say that according to ARPA, these funds have to be encumbered by December of 2024. So an encumbrance is actually, you're just setting something aside and saying, oh, this thing has a purpose, I cannot touch that budget anymore. But these funds actually have to be spent by June of 2026. Now you see this $23.7 million on this slide, but I really wanna emphasize that of this 23.7, there has been a verbal commitment to set aside 20 million of that into affordable housing initiatives. So what does that mean? That means initiatives including transit, parks development, land acquisition to support affordable housing initiatives, which leaves us actually with a budget of $3.7 million. And I just wanna emphasize again to council that this is as of the last update of November 2022, so things may have changed since then. Could you tell us what community health refers to? I assume it was COVID related, but maybe it's broader than that. 
So, go ahead. So yes, it, it predates you, Sadia. So it addressed some of our community health partners, some of um, the agencies that were dealing with mental health initiatives. Um, Wake Med was a recipient of some of this for the additional wing to um, address mental health. So Haven it was uh, hmm, Haven House, yes. So we had a we opened a process. Um, agencies applied, and we um, scored those applications, and we funded to the tune of thirty two point thirteen point two million. Yes. Did we do some COVID testing with some of that too? We did not. The county did the COVID testing for everybody's behalf. They spent a lot of their ARPA funding on COVID mm -hmm. testing and vaccines. Mm -hmm. The Wake Med Community Health. Clinic, did we refund that too? Didn't they yes. Open? Yeah, that's yes. You may want to repeat that. Yeah. So. so yes, the Wake um, Med Community Health Clinic um, that really kind of addresses that gap that we see in the mental health space was one of the first um, in the community health initiative category that we funded. All right. So we're going to start talking about stuff that I am super excited about, which is going into fiscal year 2024, my first budget with all of you. And I just want to start off by talking about what this year's budget process is looking like. So I wanted to highlight that our fiscal year starts in July 1 and ends in June 30th, but you all know that already. And what, where we are in the process at the moment is in that January, February timeframe, but I really want to kick us off in talking about how the fiscal year um, um, I'm at a loss of words, which is really weird considering I'm never at a loss of words. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start the fiscal year, right? So that first quarter, we're cruising. We've just finished a really, really hard budget year. We're taking a breather, and we're just cruising with normal business operations. Where the rubber really starts hitting the road is in that October, November time frame. And you would think that this wouldn't happen this early, but because the city is so conscientious about making sure that we put forward a really thorough, fiscally stable budget every year in front of council in May, we actually start this process in the fall. And that's when we really start looking ahead. We really start thinking about what is the future to bring for the city. We do our internal budget kickoff with citywide departments in December. And departments have until the, end, until the beginning of February to work on their, uh, on their budgets for the upcoming fiscal year. This year, we're doing some really cool things. What are we doing? Well, this year, we moved up our budget survey from that March timeframe to that January, February timeframe so that we could engage as many voices as possible in the budget process, which is something I know you're all passionate about. We're also conducting some engagement around the budget process this year. And we also intend to begin our city council budget work sessions this year, starting on February 10, uh, 20th. The city manager will work with departments, budget, finance, and then we hope to present a fantastic proposed balanced budget to all of you in that May timeframe. And then we'll kick off another round of city council um, budget work sessions each Monday of um, June. But another thing that I also wanted to highlight is that we also host a public hearing around the budget process this year that is scheduled for June 6th. So we have to adopt a budget prior to June 30th and hopefully, knock on wood, we will do that. <laughs> we have to. I like this state, right? I have yeah. a question. Knock on wood. Wait, it might be answered in this slide. I'll let you and finish the slide. Pardon? I had a question, but I'll let you finish sure. the slide. I, the next slide was about community engagement. It was specifically about like the January, February, it says budget engagement. And I was just wondering like, are there elements of participatory budgeting engagement? And like, where that So going? I'm actually going to speak to that in the and, next slide. And that's what I figured, yeah. Yes. So this is something that I'm really passionate about. And we're trying to do, um, you know, considering that I joined in the middle of the budget year, this is some of the things that we are doing to ensure that we engage our residents in the budget process. So this year, as I mentioned earlier, our community priority survey is normally released in that May timeframe. We pushed it up to the January, February timeframe. So residents have about two months to provide feedback around the budget process. 
We've also translated the survey in Spanish this year so that it is more visible with different communities around the city. And something that we did that was really cool was that we distributed a survey at Wake, Wake County Raleigh locations. We also posted digital posters of our survey um, in Go Raleigh buses. We've also got our survey in each community center around the city, so trying to get as much visibility as possible. And next month, we are actually including a flyer of our survey in Raleigh water bills. So our surveys will all have a QR code, so if you're cruising along and you see it, and you haven't taken it yet, please do. Another thing that we're doing around outreach and engagement is that we are working with the uh, city's communications department to do a social media push. They've done one already for us at the beginning of this month. They'll do another push for us next month. Next month, we'll also be engaging iHeartRadio, who will also be doing a massive social media push around the survey for us. And then the thing that I'm really excited about is we're doing some pilot focus groups around the budget process. When residents took the survey, they had an option to tell us if they wanted to be further engaged in the budget process. So based on that, we then reached out to those residents and said, hey, we want to hear your voice. Are you interested? And we had about 50 or so folks reach back to us and said, yes, I'm happy that you want to hear what I have to say. So we'll be hosting two in-person and two virtual engagement sessions. Now, I know this isn't perfect, but this is a start. And then last but not least, staff from the budget office is actually attending the More Homes, More Choices events as well. So some of our staff were actually there today, and they've actually gotten participants in those events also to take our survey. So just trying to do as much as possible as we can. And then something that I'm really excited about is that in March, when we come in front of you in one of the budget work sessions, we'll be debriefing what we've heard from these focus groups and from the survey from our residents in front of council as well. Did that answer your question, Council Member Black? Some. It raised some more questions, but I'm going to let you go. Go ahead. All keep, right. Keep going. We'll come back. We'll come back. So now that you know that what we're doing in the budget process, I really want to emphasize looking ahead. What does that mean for us? Now, we all are hearing a lot of crazy headlines in the newspapers. One minute, you know, inflation's down. The other minute, you know, foreclosures are rising. One minute, you know, consumers have spent so much during the December holidays, but then a recession is likely. So what does that mean for us as a city, right? Well, that means that we've got some good news, which is that we're doing a lot better. Inflation is definitely coming down. We're definitely seeing in, un, um, unemployment rates at the lowest they've been. And the U.S. economy at the beginning of this calendar year is actually growing albeit slowly, as opposed to last year when it was actually shrinking. So that's the good news. But unfortunately, we also have some not so good news, which is that gas prices continue to fluctuate. The job market isn't that hot anymore. We've still got a lot of supply chain issues. There are high borrowing costs. The housing market is cooling down. Stock market gains have plummeted. And then most economists and large major banks are predicting that a recession is on hand for at least the second half of this year. So as we think about all of that, as we think of where we are currently in the budget process, as we think of you know, what the economy might look like, I also want to direct your attention to this pyramid and really think about the budget as this pyramid, right? So when we think of budgeting, this is really a reality in the city of Raleigh, which is we start a budget process all excited, but we've got a lot of fixed costs. And what are those fixed costs? Those are our base budgets. We have to pay salaries, we have to pay for benefits, we've got to pay for fuel, for gas, and those things are expensive. And then after that, we've got to pay for those mandated increases. So that's your retirement, that's your health and dental insurance. So all of those costs keep increasing. So what you really have left at the end of the day is that little piece of the pie to work with. And that's really what determines our priorities for the upcoming fiscal year. Yeah, and I'll speak to this chart. Um, if you'll maybe hit the clicker one more time. So I think we're all aware uh, the parks bond did pass in November November 8th of 2022. Um, and it was a $275 million parks bond. And ultimately what was shared with the voters um, going into that bond was 
the property tax increase that was going to be necessary to support that, both on the debt service side as well as the operations side. So the communication, and if you look at those, I guess they're rectangles, or I don't trapezoids maybe, I'm not sure, uh, 1.4 cents uh, was meant for operating cost. Uh, 2.6 is to support the debt service, again, back to that capital, which is a total of 4 cents property tax, uh, again, in order to support the bond. And that translates to an increment of $103, again, to that median home uh, here in the city of Raleigh. Another item that you have uh, in the toolbox uh, relative to your 24 budget process, and there's a lot of words and a lot of numbers on this chart, and uh, I'll certainly try to take it slow, is what's called general capital reserves. So at the end of every fiscal year, as Saudi was mentioned in the beginning, we'd love to be in a surplus, meaning we brought in more revenues than we had in expenditures. And for the last several years, that has absolutely been the case. In fact, last year was an historic amount, again, primarily around just that one piece, that sales tax piece. But it is a calculation that is done at the end of every fiscal year and is presented to council in November. And ultimately, any amount over the city's policy of 14%, meaning we want to keep that in the bank, right, in the city coffers, that's the rainy day fund, um, is eligible for council for non-reoccurring items. So this is not a steady stream of revenue, so it's for one one-time non-reoccurring items. Again, FY22 was just unprecedented the way sales tax came in, so our revenues exceeded our expenditures. So council did take some actions back in November, uh, right after that amount was presented, with things like employee bonuses, we funded sidewalks, uh, street petitions, um, some street projects and sidewalks, and so now the remaining balance is 3.6 million, which you can use as a part of the 24 budget process, again, for the prioritization of important one-time non-reoccurring um, cost. All right. As we leave you today, we want to leave with some next steps. So staff, not only in budget and finance, but throughout the city, will continue to monitor operations. Budget and finance will continue to monitor fiscal activity. We plan to have or we'll see you again during budget work sessions on February 20th, March 13th, 13th, and April 10th. We plan to propose a balanced budget on May 17th, and then we'll see you again for city council work sessions in June. And before we leave, the last slide is actually to share with all of you what we intend, anticipate the topics of those work sessions to be. So when we meet on Monday, February 20th, we plan to give you a human resources update followed by a pretty macro level budget overview for the upcoming fiscal year, as well as an ARPA update with some updated numbers. We'll then chat, see you all again on Monday, March 13th, where we'll talk about mainly the enterprise funds of the city, such as Raleigh Water, stormwater management. We'll also be doing a deep dive into the budget community engagement process, and we'll also be chatting with you about planning and development services, um, service fees. And then last but not least, for your third and last work session on Monday, April 10th, we'll be talking all things fun and CIP, followed by some grant recommendations, user fee changes updates, and an HR update again, should we need to. And that was it. So thank you so much for bearing with us. Thanks. I have a question. Um, I remember back in 2020 when COVID hit, um, having to make some budget cuts. Uh, but then looking at this, and I recall being told that we ended up ahead of where we thought we would be in 2020. But my question is, is I know there were some things that we cut out of that 2020 budget um, that I don't think we've revisited. One, I got an email about just recently, which was like the second part of the Peace Street streetscape improvements that got cut. Like, seeing that we do have some general reserves left or just in the future, how can we prioritize getting some of those cut projects back into the mix? Oh, sure. You want help? Yep. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> so I might, I could hand this to Michael Moore to so, uh, appreciate what you're speaking to. So uh, there was some discussion about um, bonds. And so I think what you're talking to is the, the CIP. So the last transportation bond, we did revisit some of our estimates given escalation in project costs and the sufficiency of the transportation bond to be able to support those projects. The council did reallocate some funds to try to uh, create more capacity to keep those projects in, um, in path, but part of that decision making was deferring some of those projects. So it really wasn't related to the general fund or COVID impacts, but it, um, that those conversations happened in the same time frame and they were related to capital costs due to escalation. Got it. Separate pool of money. Honestly, before I was even sworn I got brought into this conversation. It was specifically around the allocation of bond money that had to do with greenway construction. And the bond that was allocated for the for the project, the money wasn't able to go to that. And now they there's like a different thing that they want to do because of the money not being there to complete that project. So I just am wondering like how that works specifically when things that can't necessarily be achieved with a certain bond, like when you circle back on wanting to achieve that. And it, I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Stephen knows what you're talking about. <laughs> Stephen can come up here too. So again, I think um, it, it, I, I, uh, he'll provide some information because I don't believe that's completely accurate, but he'll, he'll make sure you, you've got the information. Yeah, and one thing, it's broader for bonds, and I'll have Allison speak up. When voters approve bonds, it is really they're taxing themselves for parks and recreation. The council can choose to move those funds anywhere they want to. Um, so one project might say X Greenway. You might say, I, I don't want to do that. I want to move it. Mm -hmm. Specifically for the Greenway project you're talking about, in 2014, we had bond funds um, for Mine Creek. Right. And we held off on spending those because there is a parallel project with public utilities and we did not want to do one thing and then conflict with public utilities. Gotcha. So now that we're revisiting it, the community is concerned with our recommendation on where we're putting the trail. It is not about cost. When we sh when we there is trade-offs. It does cost more to do what we want to do, but it also has an environmental impact on the stream and trees. So there's policy decisions that we'll share with you. It is not strictly about dollars. I was just wondering, because that was the con question, and it sure. was like specifically about bond stuff. So thank you for yeah. answering that. We already said before we had this meeting that we were going to talk. Yep. So I'll circle back on that. Yes. <laughs> um, I asked the question. I didn't mean to, but it was like, no, I'm curious. No, it's, it's a very good question. Thank yep. you. Um, the next question I had was specifically about the – community engagement process of the budgeting plan. I saw that you guys work with nonprofits. Um, which nonprofits? So we're not working with nonprofits. For when you're doing the surveys. For our survey, we actually uh, left our survey and made sure that it was visible um, with a place at the table, 321 Coffee, and a few other businesses which I can't think of at the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But the main push has been um, we actually distributed them in the North Carolina State Campus as well because our intern in our budget office is an uh, intern from the university. Um, and I encourage all of you to please take some of our posters and, you know. Um, so it's the survey process still open? Because I know a lot of nonprofits that would be interested in participating in the participatory budget aspects of it. So, council member, participatory budgeting is a little different than the you community know what engagement. Mean, like the, I, it is a I little don't different. Think so too. <laughs> okay, let me elaborate. Um, as far as the survey yes. and the aspect of community engagement, I'm yes. sorry, the, the terminology would be a little different. When I think yeah. of participatory budget, I think of like the highs and the lows. It's like bringing people into the table, but it's also like this, the community engagement process around yes. it. So. That, that was my. No, I 100% hear you. Like I said, this is not perfect, and we can do more. At the moment, being new, 
I've got staff and they're excited and we're doing four. Should you like us to come to one of your meetings in your districts and talk budget and get folks' opinions? We'd need a little help with facilitation, but I'd be more than happy to do that. I was just thinking on the, I don't, I don't know about that yet. I mean, that sounds interesting. <laughs> oh. That sounds interesting, but that's not where I was necessarily going. That's an interesting topic. But I was thinking more of like the, the nonprofit side. Okay. I, I know some that would be interested in All right. Like, so per perhaps what you're referring to, I'm not sure. We have a grant program that nonprofits can um, apply for. And one of the things I've asked our city manager to do, and I brought it up, I think it was our last meeting. Yesterday. Um, to please, <laughs> or, yeah, to please like really look at expanding that program. What we've done is we just keep going back to the same people who we fund every year. Mm -hmm. And um, in talking to a number of nonprofits this year, they didn't even know we provided grant funding. Yeah. So I want to see us do a much more expansive uh, um, outreach program to inform the nonprofit community about the funds that are available um, through the city. And I think it's great that we can continue to fund or have continued to fund um, nonprofits f over many years, but there's also a lot of other great needs out there. And so that grant um, process, I really would like to see much more active engagement. If I could comment on that, because sorry to interrupt, but I want to comment on that point real quick. A couple, about four years ago, we modified our grant process yep. because we were having the same grantees every year, every year, and we modified the process where now, is it three or two years? I think it's three. At, after three years, they have to sit out a year um, before they can reapply. So we can try to open it up for other grantees that honestly may not have this as strong of a packet as someone else, but at least they get an opportunity to finally submit something and an opportunity to receive. I think this actually might be the first year where you're probably coming across some that may mm -hmm. not be able to apply that have applied previously. Um, so that part is happening. So this would actually be probably the first year where some people have applied continuously. They can apply this year in order to give others an opportunity. But I do agree the overall process needs to be improved. We probably need to put more money into it as well. Um, but again, that comes back to checks and balances and priorities. Uh, the, can I? I, I, I had more. Oh, but I think my thing is, I think there might be some crosstalk happening. Like I think there's an element where it's like we're partnering with nonprofits to get the survey into the hands of people. That was my question. It was more about that. It wasn't, I agree with what everything that was said about the grant process. Like that's <laughs> absolutely right. But I, but then it's like, is the survey process just about like, what, what is the survey? Maybe I'm confused about what the survey is. Like, is it like we want your money for grants or? No, no. That, that, oh. it's about the that's entire what budget. That's trying to address. Oh, um, yes, it's I about was, the entire budget. Just getting yeah. re what residents' preferences and priorities are. That or what they question. would like to see in the yeah. budget, yes. city's so, budget. As far as the survey of just making sure that it's like getting into like a diverse group Absolutely. of Absolutely, I hear you. Um, yes. I, I could think of a few that would be very helpful okay. in so that. Our website. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I go yes. back? Can I go back to that process as well? We have no idea when that grant process opens up. I mean, it, it's like we don't even have the opportunity to share that information. And I don't know when the last time that process opened. Do you all have? We have three different buckets right. of grant funding. And so it's different times in the year. It's remain the same one opportunity starts in the fall mm -hmm. then we have hrc grants that are handled through housing and neighborhoods dei and, and when are those um i'm not positive on the time it's the human relation grants that one's one I of think the fall, it's fall. Ones. Yeah. and then one kicks off this month so we can which one make kicks sure off that this month i think it's the art commission it's Kirsten. 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 yes yeah, we can if we could get that information, okay, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. Um, I think we all have equal connections in the community that, like, if, if we're learned of things, it kind of gives us the opportunity to be able to share with constituents and just offer diversity to the grant opportunities. But thank you. That was besides the point I was asking about <laughs> the surveys in the nonprofits, but I appreciate that, too.
Uh, well, mine's a little bit different. Um, I know we're going to go through an overview of the budgets and agencies, um, but I guess I kind of want to tee up something. I know we're asking a lot of the fire department, and I don't know when their initial budget was submitted, but because there's going to be expanded conversations about bringing you know, property into the ETJ and some of the other needs, I just kind of want to make sure we're going back to do a more comprehensive review of what the fire department may need because of the additional things we're asking of them and make sure their budget is going to be sufficient to meet sure. the questions that we're going to be asking. Mm -hmm. So after we have that annexation workshop and um, we start to kind of figure out based on the um, rezoning activity that's already in the queue and what that's going to look like moving forward, those types of um, opportunities will be part of our CIP process because those are facilities and equipment, big type um, financial um, obligations. So we are getting geared up for that as well. Can I ask a follow-up? Have we had any conversations with Wake County about potentially sharing resources or whatnot? So we're not spending as much and they're not spending as much? Just an idea, especially in annexation areas that haven't bloomed. Um, but I, I, I just think that perhaps we should be looking at some more creative ways of doing things. I don't know if the county spent anything, honestly. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. This would be the thing. Thanks for your efficiency, Stormy, because I got a million. Um, <laughs> um, okay, first question. Um, the survey is staying open longer. The, the virtual and in-person like follow-up focus groups are taking place before the survey is closed. Yes. And um, fully want to acknowledge, as you've said, like first time, straight out of the gate, first time, doesn't have to be perfect. So, so. Um, is there a vision that next time we would make sure there's re, like there's re, what I would hate is for someone who's becoming aware of the survey late later in the process to be closed out of any follow up that they would also love to participate in. So my vision moving forward is that you know yes I understand it's not ideal I'm also cognizant cognizant of the fact that just like me other department directors I would say would say the same thing. We're short on staff and resources, so let's be realistic about what we can do. We don't want to just do it, we want to do it well. And you know, this is what we can do. We are getting budgets back from departments on February 3rd, and then it's going to be all focused on producing a balanced budget, which takes a lot of time, as you can all imagine. So this is the vision for this year. And I understand uh, completely that you know our survey is actually open um, from till February 28th. And yes, should there should an opportunity arise, and we have the time and the energy and you know the resources, we'd be happy to do more. Next year, uh, my vision is to do more, obviously, and then you know sort of rejig the budget process so that we have more voices um, in the budget process as well. But like I said, it, this isn't perfect, but it's a start. Is there, um, sorry, no, no, go ahead, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, has there ever been, has it ever been done to use um, some of these like capital reserves for an, a sort of like moment in time participatory budgeting? So we say like, here's, you know, here's how much money we can spend on these one time use projects. Here's mm. four projects that kind of fit the bill and let's, let's allow the public to, to weigh in on which of those we, we choose. So council member, I'll just go back to my experience in my prior position um, in Philadelphia where we did do participatory budgeting. So we did set aside a million dollars in capital funds. I just wanna just talk to you about comparing budgets. The city's overall budget is over $12 billion and we set us out a million. So I just wanna put that into perspective. We also, uh, this was a partnership with council and we dedicated a million dollars in capital funds and residents had to choose which project they would like to see. Um, and again, you know, it's a large city, so this was focused in a particular um, district of a particular council member. You've got 1.5 million residents, you're the sixth largest city in the United States, so you have to be really pointed in your approach. Um, I came here before I could see the full realization of my efforts, um, but you know, I'm just throwing that out there, that yes, this can be done, um, but again, it requires a partnership. 
I'll pass oh. and it and then come back. So. Don't want to do third for good measure. Oh, go ahead. Sure. I mean, sure. Three Please for good measure. Um, <laughs> um, the slide about capital reserves. This may be um, a dense question, but can you tell me 14% of what? Like forward 14% of the previous year's budget or the anticipated future? Next year. It was essentially next year's. But we're given that in November um, each year after the, after the prior fiscal year's closed. So we have a policy that we reserve 14% of the annual budget in reserves called capital reserves. The LGC or the local government commission suggests strongly that communities have 8%. City of Raleigh is 14%. So that is our rainy day fund. Employees consider it to be the slush fund. Basically, it is enough money for us if we were to hit rock bottom that we could make it a couple months without stressing. And so anything above and beyond that is what we call our capital reserves that we have the opportunity to reprogram for the upcoming budget cycle or spend on one-time council priorities. And you may recall the slide that Sadia um, had up a few minutes ago. That was how we funded some of the projects, um, employee bonuses, our participation in the Hurricane Stadium games, you know, several um, enhancements to facilities for safety. Um, for our city buildings downtown, those are some of the things that council tells us and communicates to us that are priority that we find the funding out of that reserve money to pay for. I'm tracking this question too, though, because of okay. the timing. So you find out in November and then you expend it July or to no. council? It's available immediately to council. Yes. yes. So the, the fiscal year closes on June 30th. As she said, the um, sales tax revenues and all of that reporting runs about three months behind time. So technically, on paper, we close out on June 30th, but we don't actually know where all of the resources for the fiscal year are going to end until early November. And so from there, that's when we're able to say, this is what our book of business looks like at the close of the fiscal year. And from there, after we pay all of our expenses, what we have left over is our capital reserves. We can save it and tuck it away and, um, and save it for something really big, or we can spend some of it, which is what we've been doing the last couple of years, and then save a little bit of it so that it can be um, in reserves as we start the budget process for the upcoming year. But that is always a policy decision that you all yes. make council. And so That's correct. Back yes. Years, so. And I would also add to that, with the uncertainty of recession yeah. and whatnot, um, we were happy we had money in reserves in 2008 because um, it was ugly. And so, um, yeah, but it's it's all perspective. Thank you so much. I just have a, a general comment, um, not specifically about budget, um, but I feel like as a, I've seen, a few presentations not only today but throughout I'm hearing that short staffed I'm short staffed you know a lot of departments are saying I'm short staffed short staffed and as we go into this budget cycle I just like to see an overview of staffing throughout our entire organization you know what it would look like if they're fully staffed and not that we can get there in, in you know tomorrow but what would they what would they need in order to do everything because if, if they're doing all of that on short staff, like what could they do with a full staff? Like how much more could we get accomplished if we can get them what they need? So I don't know how to ask for that, but if we can get a, an update or just a snapshot of what that looks like throughout the city, that would be really helpful going into budget. Yeah, so at the February 20th budget work session, um, that is where we will do our initial HR update, and it will give you a rundown, basically, of what our vacancy rate looks like. Um, but for all of the positions that we currently have in the budget that are approved, we fully fund those in the budget. So a lot of our savings have come from salary savings because we have not been able to fill all of the positions. And as we are all on our professional listservs and in our professional communities, that is not unique to Raleigh, it is everywhere. Um, as the state of play and 
the return to work and what work looks like in the future. Um, the market is so hot and competitive right now, particularly in this region. And when the economy is doing really well, the private sector steals a lot of public sector employees because they can pay at a rate that we're not able to. But the one thing that the public sector has, well, two things that the public sector has over the private sector from an economic standpoint is, number one, we're stable. We may have to cut some services when we're in a dire situation, but we're never going to go out of business. And um, the other thing I would offer is we have one of the best benefit packages around. And you don't necessarily get that in the private sector. You get higher pay, and then they expect you to figure out your benefits yourself. Um, and so for us, it is a consistent for employees. They're not having to figure out how did they go on the open market and buy health insurance because we give it to them. And for all of our employees, they currently get insurance at 100%. They have no out-of-pocket. And for what, the last three years when insurance has gone up, we ate it, right? Pretty much. We, did. we have a um, health care trust fund that sort of kind of covers those costs so that we don't have to carry that burden over to our employees. That's correct. Councilmember Black, do you have anything else to add? I'll circle the block again to... You mean Jones? I'm sorry, Jones. I don't think Councilmember Jones. I'm sorry. No, that was me. That was all. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> She's got 598 left. I give you my time. Oh, <laughs> yield my time to the gentle lady from time. District B. Um, <laughs> I wanted to go back to the the bonded debt through um, Raleigh Water, mm -hmm. and um, I'm specifically curious. That's paid by user fees, right? That's paid by our bill, um, and it's not voter. It's not approved by voters. Are there, is there any kind of accountability that, to prevent, like, Raleigh Water from taking on a, quite a bit of debt that results in, like, a large impact to user cost? Us. Great question, and that answer is yes, yes, and yes. Uh, so here in North Carolina, we have what's called the Local Government Commission, or LGC. You'll hear that phrase quite a bit. Any debt that we issue, we have to go through the LGC for approval. Um, also, back to that AAA credit rating, uh, we do not want to be too highly leveraged, meaning we have taken on too much debt that we cannot afford. So those financial models that I spoke about are critical into those conversations. They are reviewed by everyone relative to any time we want to take on debt. So hopefully that's helpful. And also, just because I've been, this is my, I've been in six local governments. I've started in Charlotte Water. I mean, the rate modeling that Raleigh Water does, second to none, really try to subscribe to that rate smoothing. I think Absolutely, yep. They will come before you all and show their plan. I mean, just the thoughtfulness and the sophistication of their model, whenever you all get to, I'm a data geek, so I get excited. But when you all get to see just the thoughtfulness and the level of sophistication, and their modeling and their planning, uh, it's amazing. From their rehab program to make sure that they're doing it equitably around the city, so that you know some of the stories you see in other places about this horrible infrastructure, it's second to none. And I've been in six local governments, uh, but they usually do that in the spring at one of your work sessions. Of that'll. Yeah, that'll be at the March budget session as Raleigh Water will come. Um, and to your point, Monica, very much a balance of ensuring back to that PAYGO side, right? So we absolutely fund some capital uh, through cash. We don't have enough cash to do that, but we really do make sure that it is equitable and balanced for those that use the service today and those that are going to get the benefit from a new water treatment plant well into the future. So that LGC local government commission is the one so if for instance and this is not personal to rally water sounds like they're doing a great job so i'm just, I'm just <laughs> <trying to> <laughs> it's not personal but i just want to make sure that they that, so if they took a proposal to this group and they said oh, we want to build another water treatment facility and that's going to cause everyone's rates to go up by uh, insert x amount 25 percent they would say that the that that agency would say that's too much of an increase. That's not reasonable. Go back to the drawing board. You get a chance to say that before the 
I was going to yes. say, we, we wouldn't yeah. bring that forward. The yeah. city would not in that case that you just uh, yeah. provided. But ultimately, if we did, that answer would be no. <laughs> yeah, it's on us. Well, you might mention the LGC reviews any mo money that we any money yes. that we borrow. Yes. Yeah. Including the revenue bonds. North Carolina has the highest percentage of AAAs. Yes. And it's kind of unique to North Carolina. It is very unique, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was right around the Depression or something that they started it because people, towns were going under and whatnot, so you got to check in. And it's housed in the state treasurer's office at the state level. <laughs> so, yay. Um,
Okay, folks, uh, we're back live streaming. Let's get going. If we could get back to our seats, that would be great. So we have gotten to the portion. Um, first off, I got to say, I feel as though the flow, we switched it up this morning collaboratively, and I think it worked out marvelously. I think everything happened as it should. So I feel really good about being where we are right now. Um, I was going to really do this really structured, but I don't want to overstructure this. So let's try this. Let's go in the order of the table. Let's start with the first three priorities or things you want to get on the table and discuss. And we'll do round robin. We'll do the first three. If you don't have three, that's fine. Uh, but really want you to have the space and the opportunity to talk about the things that you want to talk about. Um, so let's start on this end. We will start with you, Councilmember Jones. Let's do the Three, if you have 10, that's fine. We'll get you um, on, the, on the way back around the curve, okay? So quick, I want to make sure if the, on the how often talk, um, you're talking about you all as a colleague, as a body, how often you talk about that. Okay. Yeah, how, I think that we have conversations one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two, -two, and that's fantastic, but I, I feel like it's not sustainable to build a group and to build a team that is leading the city forward when we don't have something like this. And I understand that there are open meetings laws. I get all of that. And that's where I'd like to use committee work. You asked me to repeat, I'm sorry, which part did you want me to repeat? I'm so sorry. The second, so the community engagement portion, sure. Um, I really liked what they brought up specifically about the district. So not just the immediate, but that year long pro project and how we're out looking that for a year. And I'd love to start it in those five, you know, one per district, but eventually, which ties into what Mickey Fern um, had spoken about in his report, growing it from community centers. We have 28. Right, Stephen? I think it's 28 community centers. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I'd love it if eventually, uh, we don't have the staff resources to actually have that, nor do we have the leadership at this moment to just say, oh, let's all open all 28 like uh, before. But if we can grow and, and have some focus, some guidance from the community engagement board of how to grow leaders, I really think that's a great blueprint that Mickey gave for us to reach out to. Um, the O. Oh, with that, one other thought, the Community Engagement Board uh, is currently made up of eight council appointees and eight city staff. The concern that I hear, mm -hmm, yeah, it's eight and eight. Staff appointees, sorry. That's staff right. appointees, I'm sorry, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, you're right, I'm sorry. Yeah, so staff appointees from the Community Engagement Department and then 
eight council appointments. What I've heard from residents is the concern that there isn't resident representation, that it's appointments and there's not a resident focus on there. And I'd love to possibly talk about the idea of splitting it up into three sections of having five council appointees, five city staff, and five, one from each one of those districts. So you've got A, B, C, D, E. And as they grow within those districts, however many community centers, it would still just be one that they would, rep that they would vote to represent. I think that that would help with the um, view that it's just appointments and that residents don't have a voice. And it would give the board um, some, di some diverse thought, both from s council, staff, and residents. And I know that we have eight people on council, and I'm saying five, but we have the five districts. So I do think that there's an opportunity to speak with that large and the mayor about who that district representative is, because um, technically right now, we can all pick somebody from like District A. So you can have two at large, uh, mayor and District A, and have a really heavy representation from one district. So um, those are just my thoughts, and those are the two things I wanted to bring up. So yeah, initial thoughts, conversation. No, I was just saying, the way we originally did it was each council person selected someone from their district, and then the at-large and mayors picked people, and then the other eight, they looked at the needs of representation based upon the eight that we gave, what they, where they saw gaps, mm -hmm. and then reached out and went from there. But I hear what you're saying. I'm just providing information. Yeah, no, I, I, I know why, and I think it's great. I'm just trying to think how can we also listen to what the residents are saying and how they want to feel. They want to feel like they're represented. So I'm just thinking, just a, just a thought. Could you, um, how many people have told you that? Uh, a lot of my CAC people that I work with. I don't have a number off the top of my head. I've been saying, saying it's, I've had two district meetings, uh, one that had 60 people and one that had 30. And so I introduced my idea to them and they were all in buy-in. So I mean, there is almost 100. Or I, I don't have a, a set number of how many people have said it. Wait for me to do my. Okay, so um, three. Um, first one is around economic development for our small businesses. Um, I've met with quite a few small business owners um, and hearing their challenges and things that they're trying to do. And, um, you know, for them, it's still staffing. They're having staffing issues, just like we are with the city. But, you know, staffing, but also knowing where the resources are that they can receive, you know. I did introduce them to NC Works, um, which is in Raleigh, that does a lot of great, a lot of great free work, actually, for small businesses um, and everything. So, but really just looking at our programs, we've had kind of had the same programs probably forever, really being meaningful with our economic development group and what can we re redefine and how we can really help you know, some of these businesses that are coming up. Um, and also talking to some of our landlords, um, especially downtown, that have a lot of vacant buildings. I mean, we want to talk about giving people jobs. I mean, <laughs> we can't give people jobs if there's no place to go. Um, the next piece where this ties in, too, is when people are working and people have you no know, income coming in, it also helps them with affordable housing. Um, I know we're doing a lot of work with affordable housing. Um, there's still more we're trying to do. It's funny if we go up somewhere else in North Carolina, they say, y'all are doing great, you're leading. But again, Raleigh, what else can we find to try to really give people access, that sense of hope that they can find um, a place to live um, and to grow a family, especially those that are, you know, in our shelters, and a lot of this, I know Councilwoman Fort is um, leading the affordable housing piece and working with the county, so really just making sure she has the resources they need um, as they're going forward, and the people there that come up with the ideas. And lastly, our youth, um, our parks programming. I know many moons ago, I asked for this great list of all of our programs, um, and staff produced it. Um, I think we, it'd probably be good to share or revisit that and just look at that from a post-COVID lens um, of what programs we have, where are we doing. Um, I know there's some things we've looked to cut, like tackle football, um, 
you know, I get it from a cost and from a safety standpoint, but in my community and people I talk to, not just in my community, across the city, they're like, hey, where do kids learn to play tackle football? When I talk to high school coaches, high school coaches are like, I'm not going to have a team because I don't have any kids that know how to play football. Um, you know, and, you know, and everyone can't afford to go to Pop Warner um, and to all those programs. So where are we doing that? And then baseball. Um, there's a big, a big resurgence in some of those activities. And they bring a chance for youth to learn team building, project, uh, you know, how to deal with skills, you know, how to deal with disagreements. Like those are the things you get out of sports and team sports that help you one day so they can all sit where we're sitting um, by dealing with these skills and conflict management at an early age. So just overall youth programming, even for music. I didn't know what Bidmore Hills did a music program um, at one time until I went to the community center. So how do we really push and propel our program so the public's aware? So those are probably my top three as of at this time. Yeah, I, I want to um, like upvote the sort of like economic development component. And I know for like in my district, there's a couple, there's like a couple economic centers that I would love to to reactivate, and I think there's an opportunity to do um, sort of physical reactivation of spaces that are, are a little bit unloved, um, but then also like using at the same moment um, opportunities to enhance our like entrepreneurial spirit in our districts. You know, how can we get small business owners to have affordable rents in these spaces that also brings life to these sort of depressed strip malls? Um, so I think those might be all different programs, but then if we like wrap them up together and, and activate them as a unit, then we can really do some good impact. So, yeah, I just wanted, I just wanted to lift that up. Yeah. That, that doesn't count as one of my three, though. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Uh -huh. I'm just glomming that on to Councilmember Brandt. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> There's an addendum. Uh, for, uh, yeah, friendly amendment is what they call it. Um, okay, so my actual three. Um, I think we'll hear affordable housing a lot across the table. I think something that might um, be diff different than what my colleagues will also offer about affordable housing. One thing I would really like for us to do, I, I mentioned this yesterday, but, but having um, like a shared p plan, I'm not sure that we have like the really best understanding of what we're running towards in terms of like and, and it seems to me like we have a plan for what we're going to execute on but not necessarily like what would it look like if we had if we achieved the ultimate success for our residents and I would almost love for us to like to like un unite so so um energetically around it that like almost at the at the the opening of every meeting we kind of put up this slide that says, this is how many truly unhoused folks we have. This is how many um, cost burden folks we have. This, you know, and, and every, you know, almost like every rezoning or every time we allocate funding, we're kind of, we put that slide back up and, and we kind of put a little icon that says, okay, this is the part of the population that we're serving. So we know where all these little efforts that we're doing are, are ending up and how it's all moving the story forward so it kind of hit, hits at that um, topic that we've we've talked about a lot over the over the weekend about the, how we tell our story so and I um, just to make sure I captured it I know from yesterday you talked about starting with that documented need um, and then kind of visioning without it being restrained by reality or resources but really let that be the guiding sure unrestrained yeah and absolutely there's always going to be a difference between what we wish we could accomplish yeah. and what we will be able to accomplish but yeah i think start starting from a different data point um number two slash three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow okay <laughs> um i also would love for us to explore like a an unarmed responder unit that exists outside of the police force at the point of emergency uh, emergency communication, something that exists like at the point of 911 call center and doesn't have to 
to flow through um, the police force. I think that just like enhance their capacity. I think what the Acorns unit is doing is great, and but they have a limited capacity, and there's this sort of the, the way they exist in the hierarchy, I think, creates a little bit of, um, I think there's an opportunity for us to look elsewhere. Um, so that's two. Pause, that's a big one. Uh, some communities are taking that on. Have you all had conversation about that as a body? Is there support among that? So that truly is an explore. That, is there an appetite to explore that? Um, are you all... So you had nods. I would like to um, hear from our chief on okay. that and have a discussion. Maybe it's a work session topic. Okay. Sounds good. So more conversation for sure on that. Got it. And then the other thing I'd like to explore are just some, um, I call them sort of voting reform, but it might, it might not be exactly the right term, but to catch a bunch of things. But um, the study that was done a couple of years ago that moved our elections to the um, even numbered years also had some recommendations about an additional district, um, also four year staggered terms, which we could explore for the next election cycle. Um, uh, so, those are some reducing uh, individual contribution limits, I think could be an important conversation. Um, oh, and then, and then really, really thrown out there, uh, we could consider moving to full time counselors. Um, every time we tell people this is relatively considered a part-time job, people are pretty flabbergasted, and um, our city is only growing. So, <laughs> so reactions to those? I believe the um, what um, Councillor Patton just uh, mentioned with the um, election the terms and all of those issues coming back to us in March. If I remember correctly, I don't know. I don't remember either. And but we do have those. There's a couple of additional things in there that. Um, Let, let's prioritize that because I think that that's the missing piece that the study group did last time, um, and we wanted the opportunity for the next council to weigh in. And I do think, um, I think we should have the discussion. I think. I agree it should be effective for the upcoming, the next election, which in reality will be here before we know it. And so we can't, I don't think we can keep waiting on that. Is it possible right now just to hear from former counselor, like counselors, how did you guys feel about that study? And um, how did you feel about the recommendations that came out of it? I, I, I've always said I'm in favor of four-year stagger terms. Um, yeah. Adding a council seat, I think we need to have a conversation about is it a district, is it at large, is it both? That was the one piece that the study group kind of fell evenly on. They ultimately re recommended a district because it's easier, it costs less to run at a district, but they, in my recollection, did not have a strong preference. Right. Um, you know, we've had eight members in the city council, I think, what, since the 70s? Long time. And the city has quadrupled, if not more, in population. And so I think a lot of this pressure we feel and you're never like our inboxes are full and people want us in so many places which is great but we're trying to cover the same amount of ground as eight people did 40 years ago and so that's difficult and so I'm I'm in favor of four-year staggered terms um, and uh, that, that's where I'm at on it and for sorry no, 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 for reference go. I was talking to um, the city attorney yesterday Asheville has seven city councilors for a population of 90,000 100,000 yeah so less than a hundred thousand people in a comparable amount of counselors so and Fayetteville has offering 10. that <laughs> yeah. I mean Councilmember Branch always says all of our district council members are basically the mayors of the smaller municipalities in Wake for the most part and 12 so, yeah. there are there there's roughly I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this on the high end so she doesn't kill me I'm the mayor of Nightdale there's <laughs> roughly 13,000 residents in Nightdale I represent 95,000 people. I will say I just took this class in Kannapolis and I was with majority small districts and when I would talk to people and I'd say, oh, what, how many people are from your, your city? And they'd say like 500. And I was like, you mean what? And, and it's then, a high school. I was like, what do you, that's, that's my, my elementary school is bigger than that. Oh my gosh. So, you know, there's, there's so many and I've learned through that class that there's over 500 and something that are under 5,000. So the majority of, of North Carolina is under 5,000 people, municipalities. There's only, I think, nine over 100,000. So it, it's it's a little, it, yeah, I definitely 
see that. Now, I do have a question about how you guys felt about the four years staggered, because how does that start? Does that start in the next election? One group will get two years and the other yeah. group will get four years? I think what we have to do is when we, whoever runs in 24, what they recommended was keeping the districts on one cycle and the mayor at large on one cycle. So every election cycle, somebody has votes. someone to vote for in a city election. So I, what I would think is we'd have to decide is district running in 24 for four-year term or two-year term, or mayor and at large in 24 running for a four-year term or two-year term, and then that would start the cycle. I think what we actually, what, where we landed was the mayor and at large would run in presidential oh, yeah, year. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And that um, the um, district councilors would run in the off-year election, because that seemed fair in terms of, um, you know, just <laughs> fundraising and getting the attention. Um, of the voters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And then I guess just as part of, as we continue to have. Four point, four point <laughs> no, 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 it's not a new one. It's a continuation. It's a continuation. It's one of those 600 questions. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. This is not a new one. It's a continuation. Just that we would need to establish a procedure for if um, a district counselor if a district councilor wanted to run at large or for mayor, they would be like off their cycle. So we would have to d have norms and routines around like, do you have to abdicate your, your no, seat? Or safe run is what happens. <laughs> the mm. council member in, sorry, the council member in Durham, um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, she ran for mayor, was unsuccessful, but she got to keep her council seat. Right. Yeah. So That's that kind of, the benefit to that is you can throw your <laughs> hat in the ring and <laughs> you're coming right. back if you don't want <laughs> Right. Mayor, you're three. <laughs> For now. Okay. So I'm sorry, but I have more than three. Yes. Wait a minute. So I'm breaking. Since, since, since Megan did. You started it, Megan. You started it. You started it. I only did three. So, so the first would be in figuring out how we incentivize the construction of accessory dwelling units, missing middle housing, um, tiny homes, and cottage courts in particular. The second, let's see. We've got to figure out what we're doing with our civic campus. Um, that has been a discussion point for more than five years. Yes, it's next Ten. Month. We're coming to, um, I mean, it's yeah, briefing in February Since 2007. and it's coming to council in March with updated pricing estimates and from my lens, a decision point. Either we're doing it or we're not. Well, we cannot continue to have the, like, the current s municipal building. Agreed. <laughs> right. Don't get me started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when the toilets don't flush and the water doesn't work and whatnot, that's not the environment and that's not going to bring people back to the office. So here we are talking about, um, you know, we don't have enough employees, whatnot. Well, you, you see what the private sector is doing. They are putting in um, golf simulators and um, rowing machines and Peloton um, bikes and whatnot to get people back in the office so they feel comfortable and look at the environment we're in. So I'm just saying with that has to be um, really discussed and I haven't heard it mentioned yet so I guess it's coming to us. Um, the third thing is commuter rail. I mean that was the whole focus yesterday um, in going to Durham. That's a regional issue but if we don't get this done um, our region cannot thrive. First responder pay um, increased um, first responder pay, something that we had talked about last year, continuing to work with our um, police and firefighters, and I think that that is really critical. Downtown revitalization, getting people back to work, revitalizing our downtown, cleaning up our downtown, lighting up Fayetteville Street, making it safer, more desirable, and um, let's see. And then the last thing was um, more funding for our nonprofits. Um, we have 
over the years increased that funding, um, but it's still pretty inadequate. That's it. I had, a, I had a quick question just because I'm new to the civic campus conversation. Where do where does staff go while we're rebuilding? Where, 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 do, where do they, where do it's they stay? It's a tear down and a build and while the build is going on, we stay in the old building and then we transfer over. The, the building ne next to the Raleigh Municipal Building is that old fire, the old uh, police. Police. The police, yeah. It's gonna go there. So that's where everyone will be housed while this other, while no, the No, that's where the oh. new building's gonna that's go. That's coming down. Where the new so that building's will vacant go. and we're gonna okay. tear it down. It would be good, I think, to have, when it comes back to us, just an overview. What I was really surprised by is how the, a new civic campus will not only provide a better user experience for the public, because right now they come down there, then they have to go to four <laughs> different places to do one thing, mm -hmm. um, but also the um, cost savings for the city, because what mm -hmm. we learned is that we have facility maintenance on a bunch of buildings we own scattered out with staff everywhere, and then we have places we rent, so obviously rent, you're just you're not building any equity in that. Um, and so there was a whole discussion we had about, um, there's a little sticker shock up front, but then the cost saving for the city is, I recall it being fairly substantial every year. Well, there's also the fact that we own buildings that yes. people are in that are, like we could sell those buildings yeah. after and bring in additional revenue. Um, I, I think housing. there's, I'm I, sorry, what? We're using for housing. Yeah. Um, well, we could, if we sell Part them, of. we can dictate what they are used for, but one of them is on Fayetteville Street, and that is more, has been traditionally more a commercial district, but that's not something we'd get to decide today. I mean, but the fact of the matter is, as um, Councilor Melton said, we can raise revenue for our city. And part of the funding of the new civic campus is predicated upon the disposition of property that we currently own downtown. Yeah. So to make it work, so mm -hmm. that it would not be complete sticker shock, um, we have properties downtown that we're planning to put on the open market to help replenish the funding for construction. Mm -hmm. Council Member Harrison. Um, yeah, I just want to lift up um, something that Council Member um, uh, Branch had brought up earlier, so this is not mine. Um, this is uh, just uh, growing leaders across the city. So I think because of the change in um, community uh, kind of, you know, engagement structure that we've had in the last number of years, I think there are some areas of the city that, um, you know, really are going to need a little bit of a revamp and some extra energy and resources. And no matter what, we need continual new leaders to be popping up and how we're thinking about growing those, um, I think is very important. Um, tree conservation, it was brought up earlier, um, not something we need to talk about today, but um, I want to have conversation as a group about what we think, where we want to go with that, improvements to our ordinances, being thoughtful with risk management, um, and being successful. How do we do that? So I really appreciate Council Member Melton's perspective on like the NDO and, you know, when, when we can be successful in these realms that go perhaps beyond our city borders. Um, walkability, um, I know we're going to have um, conversation about Vision Zero. I'm really excited about that. Um, and I also would like to talk about it in terms of, you know, around when we're looking for that, um, what kind of zoning um, kind of conditions would make that happen. Um, I think that's really important as we think about the future of the city. Um, and then finally, I'm just curious how parks are doing for staffing for this summer. I hope um, we have enough lifeguards and all the pools will be open. <laughs> you want to talk about that? Like when you all do your push for summer staffing and... They started the push this month. They had a job fair. Yep. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, we had a job fair in January, and we had 150 people show up 
about 110 applied, and we plan on doing three more of them. Um, and we're doing some in incentives. Uh, the last one, we actually had an incentive for Dreamville tickets. So, um, yeah, and we're going to find other ways to incentivize it. But <laughs> it is a priority based on the last couple couple of years. How, and how many, how many part-time positions do you have open? I'm not sure. I can bring back that information. Okay. When we scale up, we have about 1,500 part-time employees. Okay. That's helpful. Uh, yeah, my first one, of course, is probably an obvious one, which is um, our homelessness issue. Um, that's probably my number one priority. Um, my second issue would be panhandling because we've seen um, an escalation into that as well. And thinking about what, you know, some of the policies that we would have to look at. I know. At one point in time, people had to get permits and stuff like that to be able to pay. Like I'm making, I'm making Robin queasy today. Like just what I'm saying. <laughs> we, we, we've um, looked at looked at our ordinances and other ordinances, and I can update you on that and what you know what we can and what we can't do, and kind of where we are. Okay. Yeah, but because uh, those are probably the two things that I think I get the most um, email correspondence about. You know, folks don't like the way the city is looking because of the camps and people on almost every major thoroughfare, you know, out asking for money. So those would be my top two. Um, my third one would probably be kind of tied into something that the mayor mentioned. Um, she said first responder pay. But I guess for me, the second part of that is first responders having the resources. I know I had a conversation with the chief, fire chief about, you know, some of the needs that they, they've got in terms of, um, some of the funding, how some of their stuff is structured, um, and he, he explained to me how some things worked in a former organization that he was in, but just sort of making sure that they've got not only staff, but they've got equipment and resources to be able to meet the needs. Um, I want to make sure they've got uh, the ability to have good response times and things along those lines, and so um, that would be my that would be my true third, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Any follow up on on these three? No, I was gonna, I definitely agree, especially the first responders um, equipment and and build out because costs keep going up like every second. So, like a truck is what one point close to a million dollars, depending upon if it's a ladder truck or a tanker or it just depends. Yeah. And then how long have you had to get them now? Almost two years. <laughs> Not just the trucks. I mean, like they run through tires. Tires. Yeah, hoses. Go through their budgets and gas and everything else. Mm -hmm. and costs. Council members, we got thirty. So. I do have quite a few. I'm like, which one do I want to say first? Three. Uh, three. Three to four ish. We have like a range going. You want to go? Are we gonna get to go all around the room again? <laughs> Follower, I like that. We are going to circle the block. So you want to give your top three? Yeah. No. So, okay, so affordable housing. Uh, just being more creative about the affordable housing crisis that our city is in, knowing that we're losing more affordable housing than we're able to really replenish. So I really think it should be some sort of requirement for, like, replenishment, like, as we are destroying affordable housing, like, keeping up with the replenishment rate. And I know that's, like, a Ooh, Mary, that sounds crazy, but I really would like to talk about that. I brought up tenants' rights earlier. I'm going to uplift that point again, and um, really, really on the housing justice side of it, um, just being able to have that investigative possibility for the public housing issues that we're having. Um, the third thing, or excuse me, that was three things, but it was under one bullet point. <laughs> So the second bullet point <laughs> is um, just deeper implementation of the climate action plan. And the question here is, where is there room to be innovative on the regulation on what's in the plan? Um, and then just to piggyback off of that, sidewalks and walks, walkability, I think that's something that gets left out of the conversation a lot, specifically in my district. Um, just not a very walkable district. We talk, we, we're implementing walkability across the city, and I think District A gets left out of that equation the most. Um, what's Sorry, Councilmember Block, you said deeper implementation of the Climate Action Plan and creative, there was a yeah, second where, where can we be innovative on regulation of what's in the plan? Because like most of the things, we actually don't have any ability to do any 
regulatory power. Um, and then walk walkability with sidewalks for district related. <laughs> That's just my district, but I mean, we have other areas that have great sidewalks and are able to have, you're able to walk around easily, but not so much in District A. Not District A. <laughs> um, so I guess the third thing I can mention that I wrote down is just correcting harms from racial justice tied to COVID. People in my district are also still suffering, and they some of those people never received support from the monies that were available at the time. So people are struggling. Like it's still. 2020 for many people in, in that area and certain areas of my district and when I go to talk to them They're like we never got any money. We never got any support and we're still we're still hurting. So just like understanding ways that we could be proactive on Just the that that history there as most of the mostly black and brown communities were deeply impacted um, on an economic level and they're still facing a lot of the uh, direct harms from that time period as we're all as the budget and the numbers are ticking back up uh, those communities are still like falling behind so those are my top three but have like four more <laughs> yeah I just um, co-sign what Councilmember Black said about the community climate action plan um, as as with all things um, there's like many carrots not that many sticks we like don't have as many powers as we would like to but um, as, we're, as we're hearing like everything's an evaluation of the risk level so it'd be cool to kind of almost go line by line or section by section and like where are where are the opportunities and how much risk are we taking on in, in pursuing any one of them I'm going to start by saying I agree with a lot of what I heard at the table, and I'm not going to focus on obvious issues. So I'm not going to talk about housing because we all know that's a problem. I wanted to say that because there would be somebody at home who starts tweeting that I didn't mention housing as one of my priorities. But my exclusion of it on this list does not mean I do not care. I'm going to focus on things we have not talked about. <laughs> um, so one thing is um, this discussion around building sustainable um, neighborhoods and cities and this retail component, uh, neighborhood scale retail. We tried to start this process um, last term. Uh, we got some good work done with um, produce sales um, for urban gardens and accessory commercial units, like a modification of live work, removing the special use permit for certain types of live work. But we have not been able to unlock the true neighborhood retail, like um, bodegas and coffee shops and things like that. And the big issue we ran into is limitations in state law on regulating what type of retail. We don't get to regulate. And so the issue we heard was, you can't promise me that someone's not gonna open a gun shop or a vape shop in my neighborhood. And we need to, f I'm a very comfortable place of yes person. I am certain we can find a way around this issue, so I wanna make that a priority. Um, I think it'll likely, we may need Phillips help with the legislature. This is something I plan to speak to the League of Municipalities about, but that, that is a big priority for me. Um, these are things that if you look at our oldest, most cherished neighborhoods, they still exist because they predate zoning laws. Um, and, and I also acknowledge that there are problems with some of these corner stores and neighborhood retail place outlets in some parts of the city. So I think we just need a creative solution there and I, I would like to keep working on it because I feel like that's just something that I'm passionate about and we have not been able to actually get done. So that's one. Um, I'm gonna say transit equity. We keep talking about fare free transit. I know we're going to have a conversation about that as an upcoming work session. Um, I think it's really transit equity. We need to be talking about how folks can feel safe riding the bus, how the drivers can feel safe and appreciated, and how we also can um, provide equity to our community. A big issue I personally had with the fares last time is it was only cash, exact change, so it was $1.25. A lot of people don't have a quarter in their pocket. Um, most of the folks who are dependent on our on our transit system, um, you know, that's a big impact to them to, to pay dollar twenty five every time they're getting on and off. And so, there's, I'm a proponent of fare free transit. Whatever we can do to keep it in place, modifications, transit equity, I think that that's a priority for me. Um, I've got a third one, but on my list, I don't know which one I want to bring up. Um, Go for both. Pardon? Go for both. Well, some of these are really small. I already brought up the e-bike rebate program. Staff's working on that. Um, 
we, we know social district will be coming back to us. But I think the one I want to flag then is a big picture one is our city owned land. Um, we have done a big initiative to get housing on city owned land. Um, I want to keep pushing in that direction. I don't think we should own any vacant land. I don't think we should own any surface parking lots, especially empty lots in neighborhoods. There's better use for that. Um, one, we're in housing crisis. We should be housing people. And two, it's, it destroys, I think surface parking especially destroys the walkability of cities. And so I don't want to walk by any vacant piece of land in Raleigh and then find out that we own it. I think that's a big missed opportunity. And so I, I would like to continue to be aggressive and creative on what we're doing with land that the city owns. That's all. I want to second the last two points specifically. Um, came coming in kind of late to the whole transit fair issues and the equity around that, and learning a lot from city staff and some of the things. But I think it's something worth pursuing um, if, if we can. Uh, and then I think with you know with the city owned land aspect, you know we're now pushing this m missing middle at things. So it's like where can the city possibly do t tiny homes for communities and just have, like, especially in these, like, parking lots, you can fit a lot of tiny homes in parking lots, and people want to live in tiny homes, and that's something we're pursuing for this um, this missing middle housing form that we're now talking about so much. So, like, where's the possibility of where the city can really be the lead on cre creating housing through that model for affordability? The mayor has wanted a cottage court in Raleigh for how long? And <laughs> I have been trying. I've been working on tiny homes for at least seven years, and then cottage courts, really the past three years. And um, the tiny home thing is a new reality. And I, I just whispered <laughs> to to Jane. I said um, that might be the property. It, that we looked at rezoning um, on Fayetteville Street, and the you know what we just had the um, discussion about, about the one next for the, the rezoning. Yeah. Can, can, can I also floor? plug yeah. one other thing on um, tiny homes, missing middles, duplexes, and stuff? I also know that legalizing them is one thing. Incentivizing, incentivizing and, in, and also cultivating affordability is another thing. And another big piece of this in practice is there are state building code regulations, and a lot of them yep. c make it cost prohibitive to do. Like, a, I think it's either a quad or something where there's like a five. There's a bunch of state building code regulations that we cannot control that in practice will make it very difficult mm -hmm. to build certain types of multifamily or to make them attainable at a certain price point. And so I think it's another piece where we really need to work with Philip and with the development community on what are barriers to getting this on the ground and getting on the ground at an attainable price point and whatever we can do to advocate for those changes as well. And, and one I've, I've seen in, um, I know a project in, in my district, stormwater requirements. We need them, we have to have them, but because of the costs to implement. So when we talk about incentives, there may be a way that yeah. hopefully we can look in in helping incentivize um, and sharing as far as stormwater. Especially for affordable housing. Yeah. I think the one in your district I know you're talking about, it's supposed to be affordable yeah. cottages, and they're having a big, and they have a, the biggest issue trying to get the stormwater piece. infrastructure funded. Yeah. Yep. More to that, um, I know something that I had wrote down and something I've been looking and researching and reaching out to people about, um, looking at other models and other places. Now that we that I know like some of these building things that are related to the state, just like alternative building materials, um, I hear like as we've seen, I'm, I'm learning still that like a big thing related to affordability is just like the cost of building the the building itself. So just like manufactured, um, like the manufactured homes that they're building now. There are some unbelievable ones. I'll show you some photos. Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been, I'm excited to see that. I've been doing some research. So just like, where's their opportunity to say, hey, like we want to build something yeah. that you may not be used to state yeah. and it would be cheaper and better maybe for, for, different, for different types of projects. So um, I put Let's that down. Sure as, that was one of mine. I didn't mention it in my first round, but it got brought up. So I'm going to throw it in. No, I totally agree. And when we did our tiny home text change, 
um, we had a big discussion at the table at that time about um, making sure that manufactured homes were included. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a lot of how tiny homes, I think, right now are being constructed. It's mm -hmm. like the container homes. It's the homes that are, um, it's really like kit homes that they did like back in the, I don't know, like. This, the Sears. Sears. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to go in a totally different direction. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Can my, my thing's related. Can I do it? And Oh, Lord, she's going to give us TMO. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I have anger. Comes from number four. <laughs> um, I just, in the, in the um, lane of manufactured housing and specifically, like, city, um, it's, like, city land inventory, um, I would love for us to consider ways in which we use like city land acquisition for existing um, mobile home communities. Um, I'm like aware that a lot of times um, the residents own the structure, but not that they pay a lease on the land and it can happen that the land changes ownership and the rents of that land, their like land rent goes up and then it becomes unaffordable. So maybe um, we can position ourselves well to acquire the land underneath mobile home communities as a way of preserving them. Um, slightly more protected. That's a lot of rental money. Good luck. But let me let me let me just it because this may impact what happens next. But I will say I'm not the keeper of the time, but it's four seventeen. Our staff has been here all day. We've had the chief waiting for several hours. Um, we promised Council Member Jones a different conversation towards the end of the day um, that we've not gotten to. So I don't know how much more of this we really need to do. But again, with the chief waiting, our staff, y'all are fantastic. But I, it's a beautiful day. Y'all been stuck inside all day. Didn't get a chance to go out and get some sun and air and all that. So I don't know how much longer we want to do this. But in my mind, well, yeah. bless y'all heart. But, um, <laughs> but I will say to me, you know, and I'm, I'm about to reach my wall in terms yeah. of having been here for a while. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so for I, that. I, I think if we can shift to the chief, I think she's got some updates for us, and then have the conversation we promised Councilmember Jones for the rest of the time. Yes. Unless so people I, have burning issues. No, I, just got like one, I got one thing I want to mention. You got a burning issue? Of course issue? you okay. do. No, just making sure we keep looking at things through an equity, equity lens, um, especially our MWBs and contracts and professional services, keeping that equity lens um, on the forefront. That's all I have. More to that point, um, that's something I wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> come, come on. Can we? I, I just want to make sure that in the like going forward that we find a new way for fundamentally to include diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as community engagement fundamental within every department. I think Washington State has some really interesting models around how they're implementing that. Um, and it's keeping it from being very transactional where you do something and then it's like, well, let's run it through this, through the, uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion department. And it's like they should be a part of that process early on. And then also before. Mary, really? <laughs> come on. Chief, please come up. Ground rules ladies over here. Y'all stay nice. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and council member for you're absolutely right. It's a beautiful beautiful day outside today I was just out there yeah. <laughs> I was just downtown before um, coming back um, this afternoon um, Just want to give you an update on everything that's going on lots of activity downtown people are out and about um, But the no justice no peace rally that they had at 1 o'clock was great our sheriff met ahead of time with the organizer who um, assured him that there wasn't going to be any problems. And so, and there were not. There were about 60 to 75 people there. They marched from Fayetteville Street to the Capitol over to the governor's mansion and then to our downtown police station and then back to Fayetteville Street. So that was um, a great event for them. We also had a protest on the state capitol with the Ukraine, um, justice for Ukraine from Russia. Um, that was going well, too. No issues there at all. With respect to just everything with the Memphis incident, we are completely plugged in. We made sure that even before the protest today that we reached out to the downtown businesses to alert them of the march that was going to occur. We'll continue to do that as we get information about what might be happening. Also, too, I'm checking in on a regular basis with the rest of our major cities. Um, we send out, we're on a group email that they send out with information overnight last night. Um, overall, it was peaceful in the nation, but there were a couple incidents in different cities. 
Um, we've had some police cars vandalized. We've had threats made against officers. I think everybody's emotional over what we have um, experienced in the last 24 hours. But we will be tracking that, and I will keep you posted if there's anything significant for our city. All right. That's all I have. Thank you so much for all you're doing to keep our residents safe. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so thank you, Chief. Really appreciate you being here, and I know we kept you for a long time. So, um, yeah. So she, she's here. So, don't, don't leave. but yeah, don't leave yet. But um, <laughs> we gotta be in here. You gotta be. In here. <laughs> okay, so let this be the open mic for the conversation, Councilmember Jones, that you want to to have. So I will turn it over to you and your colleagues um, to kick that conversation off. Awesome. Uh, I do want to mention that I think the amount of stuff that we wanted to talk about that we didn't get to is just a testament to how much we need to have these conversations and that we need to make space for them. So as we look forward, let's try and carve out time for that. Um, thank you so much for giving uh, some attention to uh, what's going on in the nation. I know we just got an update from the chief and I really appreciate it. I'm really interested in hearing, especially, but from everyone, but especially from everyone in the room who was here in 2020 and how we proactively talk about how do we take care of the community? How do we take care of the police department? How do we take care of residents who are hurting and, and sh expressing that in, in peaceful and you know, justifiable ways? How did you guys do it before? What were the takeaway items? things that you've learned, what should we do now that we're experiencing almost ditto uh, three years later? I'll start. Um, for me, a couple things uh, from 2020. Um, one, I leaned on my faith um, to get through it and understanding. And two, I leaned on the community as well. Um, being a Raleigh native, um, having people that I know that I can go to, can talk to, and people just giving me, providing me information. Um, some information um, that I think was helpful to share, that I could share. Um, they wouldn't call, no, they wouldn't call RPD or they wouldn't call anyone else and I'd say, hey, Corey, this is something you may need to know to pass along. Or, hey, Corey, stay up, stay lifted. Um, we'll get through this. Um, that's really, you know, for me personally, how I dealt with it, um, you know, at the time, you know, I had a little one, so that was a great distraction, um, when I would get home and things of that nature. Um, but also just make sure family and everyone's safe. Um, for me, I have family members who are in law enforcement. Um, so having that lens and understanding also helped me understand um, kind of what some of them were going through and, and everything. But at the end of the day, um, it was really just me leaning on my faith. And we talked. We had chats, calls, um, meetings. You know, Mar Marshall kept us up to date on everything that was going on um, so that we were aware. Uh, and I think having that information made it easier, too, uh, where, you know, the public and others, they, they didn't have what we had. Um, you know, for better or for worse, but that's what comes with the responsibility of the job. And I think that's how I took it as well, that I'm an elected official, elected representative. There's things that I have to hold, hold on to and bear that no one else will have to, but it comes with the territory. So that was helpful for me. Thank you. Well, um, tough to like go back and think about that time. Um, my own personal experience was I had ran for office. I got sworn in in December of 19. We had like one or two months of normalcy in 2020. Um, COVID hit and it seemed like every day we were getting an update from the city manager at that time on COVID. And then George Floyd was murdered. Um, and then the social justice issues became m more of the forefront and um, I, this was before Marshall was the city manager, but I, I was on the phone with Marshall constantly. I mean, she would be the one that I would text. Um, you know, we had an unfortunate incident where there was an altercation between our police and, you know, uh, 
young queer people, and I, the community looked to me a lot on what, what is our responsibility for that, and I was on the phone with Marcel. It, it was a really hard time. Um, I did go down to the protest that first day. I was in, at home before a lot of the property destruction started, but then I kept showing up. Um, I live over kind of by the governor's mansion, which is where they were, a lot of the demonstrations were happening, so I would just stop by there and talk to people. So I think being present helps. Um, and then I do know that just hearing from the chief now about how this demonstration and protest today went as opposed to what happened back in 2020, I think probably all of the law enforcement agencies and elected leaders, everybody learned something from that. And I know that the city initiated an internal and external review of policies, coordination of services, um, and I, you know, I think the chief at the time acknowledged that there were mistakes that were made in how some of the um, protests were handled, and it seems like we're learning from that. And so I think we're structurally in a better place to give folks the space to protest and grieve, and I also think as an elected leader, um, you know, you'll have to find whatever makes you feel most comfortable, but for me it was just being down there and that was easier because I lived close by, but that, that's how I sort of handled it. Um, my experience was a little different because I think I was coming onto the council when everything was happening. So I wasn't actually right here and had some time. So it was a little bit different for me just because I was getting onboarded and trying to figure out what I was doing as a council member. Um, but I will say something that you can kind of piggyback on what you said today and something that the chief mentioned in her remarks. You know, one of the things I think is different um, is that we've got we've had leadership changes in the sheriff's department and the police department and the two people leading it. And I, I would say this even if the chief wasn't in the room, um, you know, Sheriff Rowe and Chief Patterson have been out in the community. So as Philip alluded to today, Relationships are very important. And so I think, you know, one of the differences is, you know, folks from the community will reach out to each of them. All right, Chief. And we'll have conversations. And so it's very different than people just gearing up to go protest. Like these folks have relationships and rapport with the sheriff and with the chief. And so I think that probably causes them to handle things a little bit more diplomatically than how they would have handled things in the past. And so I think that's one of the biggest things that we have going forward is that we've got folks who who are working very hard to establish relationships in the community with folks so when things happen, you know, they can kind of have those conversations before it erupts and turns into a situation that can get out of control. I think for me, um, my role was different um, in that um, I had to issue the emergency orders, whatnot, um, working with Robin and... We got another one. <laughs> and others. Um, but um, a couple of things I want to mention. Um, I like to make data-driven decisions. And this was a lot of emotion. It wasn't like dealing with COVID, where you could look at facts and data and make decisions. Um, you had to deal with emotion on all sides. And um, so deciding whether to call for a curfew. I didn't. There were reasons for that, and I'm not going to share those reasons. Um, but we saw what happened. And what I learned from that was to trust my gut because my gut was telling me to call for the curfew. And the information I was getting, um, I'm not, I can't share what that was. But in practicality, it was like, when I looked at it all, I decided that like we had one night 
toward the end where um, we had intel that um, protesters were coming um, to Lavelle Moton Park. And I was like, we got to nip this in the bud. And I think we had more police officers out there than you would imagine. But you know what? People pulled up, and they went, oh, and they drove off and went home. Um, I learned, and I didn't know this at the time, that there are paid protesters who come from out of state. Um, when I saw the video of them pulling skateboards and sledgehammers out of their backpacks and smashing in windows, it was a whole new reality. Um, and then one of the things that was very beneficial for me was I was, um, I participated in a number of calls with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, we had national intel that was being shared. That was, that helped with more the data-driven side of things. And I remember sitting in one of the calls with Chief Deck Brown, and she said, that's one of the most informative sessions I've I've ever heard. Um, it was eye-opening. Um, so going through it was very emotional. Um, one of the, I did go to protests that um, the, um, our, NAACP had. the NAACP oh, and also pastors. our pastors organized. That was during the day. It was safer. One of the things we were told um, was being out at night was probably not a good idea because that's when the paid protesters came in. That's when we had a lot of, um, it, a lot of issues. Um, but the one thing I also want to mention too, um, I think that we learned um, C21, that's what the group, CP21. right? Yeah, um, we had hired them to come in and do an assessment. Basically just, how did we do? And we made a number of changes to policy um, that, so for instance, tear gas. When tear gas was thrown, that was a sergeant who made that decision. Now, the city manager's office has to make that decision. So we put things like that in place. And you know, some of what we also learned um, is the appearance of our officers matter. Um, we had <laughs> our Wake County forces in what looked like tanks with riot gear on, and that would escalate things, the tensions, just like that. And so one of the things we learned was don't put on the riot gear, like, and don't, like, just the way you look, the way you act. No, Chief, I don't want to say too much, but that was something that we kind of felt was important, um, not to escalate things. So the changes that were made through C21, I think, were very beneficial. But also having that look at ourselves and saying, what could we have done better? And here's new policy guidelines to follow think really um, helped, um, partly helped with the healing and partly enabled us to go forward in the future. Thank you guys so much. I think it's a well of information as we step into this role because I can tell you, you know, last night was terrifying for me, not only as a, as a resident of the United States, but as a, oh my God, what if, what if, I don't know what leadership looks like in this moment. I don't know how to lead through crisis. And those are big overarching ideas that I know we can't answer in, in one session and one conversation, but it's stuff that I'm going to rely on you guys for, you know, I'm going to rely to say, you guys have done it. You've been here and, and I need to be able to express that and ask those questions so that, uh, I can start from a place of understanding and a, and a place to grow from. I know that you guys did a, Last time, a public comment session, section, session, session, uh, where it was specifically focused on um, police, and you allowed residents to come and just talk and just about what happened that night. How do we make space? Not that we need to do just that, but I'm just saying, how do we make space for people to grieve? How do we, as a council, as a city, recognize the pain 
and maybe this is a community engagement conversation, I'm not sure, but it's how do we build spaces that can lower the temperature? You know, not, I'm, I'm never going to heal. I can't, we as a city cannot fix what has happened, but we can listen to what people are feeling. And when do we turn those on? When do we, what's the green light to say, okay, now is the, the time we need to open up conversation? Yeah, I think that's my question. Address that, but it seems like something all of you are interested in having conversations on. Who's the right department to take the lead on that? Do we do that proactively, reactively when something happens, both a menu of options? But a lot of head nods from your colleagues as you were talking. I don't know if y'all are postured, positioned to have it now. Maybe it's just noodling on the thoughts, but lots of head nods. Could I make a suggestion on that? Um, you know, we just recently had um, a mass shooting. And again, um, learning from that, the pain, the agony, um, trying to heal. Um, Taisha did an incredible job um, working with the victims. And then, you know, we put together the vigil. Um, we did those things. Um, and I think we were even talking about having a town hall once things settled down a bit. Um, but I think that's um, an area, I don't want to load up Taisha, but um, that's an area where we could use her guidance. I think probably the best way to approach, every situation is different, right? right. So there is no manual or model best practice to deal with communities when communities are hurting because every community is different. I think what we, have learned from the last two to three years is that by creating a space and an opportunity for people to get out whatever it is that they have in them safely brings greater dividends than anything that we could have prepared well in advance. Um, going back to Headingham, obviously we are prepared in the moment for things but none of us were prepared for a mass shooting because we all were naive enough to think that it would never happen to us. And as a result of that, we've taken what happened and what we hope will never happen again to be prepared better the next time. Let's go back to 2020 from an operational and a staff perspective. 2020 was a blur for me in the trenches, mm -hmm. on the phone, in the EOC, trying to meet people where they were so that our city would not burn any more than it did burn was probably one of the most agonizing pieces of my 29 and a half year public service career. However, what it taught me, Christina, was the best and the worst in people because what happened that Saturday night represented the worst in people but what happened that Sunday morning yep. represented the absolute best in what we have in the way of community. We didn't go to sleep, neither did many in our community, but on the drop of a dime, we had more people helping to rebuild and clean up Fevel Street and Cabarrus mm -hmm. Street and Dawson Street and Hargett Street and Salisbury Street than we had brooms and brushes and mops and cans to keep the rubbish. Um, and so for us, it took us a moment to get beyond that. We went back in the office and to be totally transparent, many of us cried because again, we were called and we do march and protest every single week in this city. We're the capital city. So people always come here to march and protest. Okay. We thought we had the special recipe and we realized that we didn't. Part of the mistakes along the way were self initiated I'm a firm believer in owning what we did wrong. And Jonathan is absolutely right. I probably talked to him more than anybody on council other than the mayor at the time in trying to make sure that even when we got it wrong that we owned it so that people would not think that we were going to continue down a path that was going to bring potentially more damage. For about eight or nine months, every day I looked out of my window in the office and saw people accumulating in Nash Square. 
the heart in me said, okay, people are hurting, and what do we do about it? The public manager in me said, what is the city's responsibility to heal? And obviously understanding that we can't do it by ourselves. So we did, we sanctioned the study by 21CP, which is a third party neutral. But in addition to that, we did our own internal after action report. And that report hurt. Because we had to say everything that happened, be it good or bad and indifferent. And how would we be prepared when the next time comes around? So fortunate for us, our city did not experience that last night. It's a different situation in many ways, but quite similar in others. And so I will say this, when you have practitioners who have a passion and a compassion for service, and I'm emotional about that and I make no excuses and I don't, I don't even make, you know, concessions as to why, other than public service is a calling. And for those of us who are in the trenches doing this every single day, you just get into a mode and you think about community and you just do it. And you do it because you want tomorrow to be better. So the lesson that I learned in 2020 is your family is not necessarily the people that share your DNA. Your family is the people that share your heart. And many of those people were in offices that were beside us in R&B. Many of those people were students from NC State, and I had no idea at the time that my daughter would end up being a student at NC State. But the students at NC State, when they had nowhere to go because classes were closed on campus and many of them couldn't go home, they marched our city every single night. Those became the people who represented what Raleigh was all about. And so I think lessons learned from me from a management and an operational viewpoint and standpoint is we have to figure out how we stand in the gap to give people an opportunity and a space to heal. And whatever that looks like, there isn't a manual. There isn't a report that can tell us how it's going to work best. All I think it takes is people who are passionate and compassionate about the community that they serve and the work that they do. And when we lead with that, and when we lead in, sprinkled with a little bit of prayer and good luck, it works out. And so for many of us, I started when I accepted the position saying the nine months prior, even to the interview, I spent on my knees. Many of those were in my office because it hurt. It really hurt to the core to see all of the things that we had worked on start to crumble. But guess what? We're bigger. We're better. We're more united. We're more compassionate as a community. I think we're more inclusive. I think we're more understanding. Yet we're not perfect, so we still have work to do. So I hope through some of the policy revisions and some of the actions and some of the change in leadership, to be quite frankly, has positioned us to be the city that we currently are. And will we always get it right? Absolutely not. But what I will promise you, as long as I sit in the seat, when we get it wrong, I will own it. We will own it, and we will fix it, and we will do better. Accountability is big. And I expect you guys to hold me accountable, and I'm going to hold our folks accountable. So I hope that's helpful. Again, didn't prepare it, was not prepared for this, but it is who I am. Um, and so I, I think we've learned a lot, and we are a better community as a result of it. Well, I thank you so much for sharing and you know being vulnerable. Um, I want to uh, add to the conversation that I just want to know what I can do in the future, you know, what is my role? What am I to do to help you, not only with the community, because I mean, I think, you know, Corey spoke to, to how to lead within the community, but how do we work as a team to make sure that we're supporting each other? Um, and that's a, a citywide team, not just council team, but how, how can I do my part to make sure you guys have what you need? moving forward. And I, I don't want to monopolize the space. I know there's still new counselors and I want to leave space for you if you have any questions on this topic or comments or concerns. But thank you, uh, all of you, for everything you do and answering my questions. Perfect. So I know I want to be respectful of time. The manager has, I mean, she's a powerhouse. I'm over here, like, in that's awe why, as I've been. That's why since, we hired her. Exactly. <laughs> since I've been 22 in our MPA program, like, oh my gosh, there's a 
city manager who looks like me. <laughs> um, so still incredibly inspiring. She's going to close us out. So I think we need like a two, two minute break for her to get set up. Um, get her Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> Blow her nose. Give us two minutes. Y'all know we have to end with a show. Don't do that. So three new folks. Michelle's here. Here we go. Government is set see. up to well, be done yeah. from home. I hope they won't be seen. <laughs> but it was not. Guys up here. We did pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it was like, pretty quick, and you know, every day was you want to talk something about something new. I mean, we were way ahead of the game with because uh, we were not remote meetings. We did. Off screen. We set up a system fast, fast, fast. We set up every almost every <laughs> city or town in the state who wanted to do it used our model. Flight number BA2724 to Stockholm, now boarding at gate 29, due to depart at 10.20. All passengers for the Stockholm flight, please go to gate 29. Passengers for Pisa on flight number EAF33. Communications, y'all are awesome. So switching gears really quickly, I'm going to be really brief. Good afternoon, passengers, and congratulations. This is your pre-boarding announcement. I am your pilot, Marshall Adams David, and welcome to flight 2023. You made it through COR pre-check, and you punched a first-class ticket to the destination of a lifetime, the city of Raleigh. Please have your boarding passes with your council priorities readily available. Flying on Air Raleigh promises to be exciting, challenging, and very rewarding. Whether you normally fly coach or economy, you are now in first class. So that means that you can be up close and personal on the issues that matter the most to our community. Your tickets may have seemed a little pricey because you had to pay for them through candidate forums, door-to-door -door campaigning, poll strolling, and fundraising. But it is my job to ensure that you have a smooth flight and safely reach your destination. Your cockpit is ready, your bags have been checked, and your flight crew has stored all extra bags overhead because this ride will be unlike any other flight you've ever taken. The altimeter of citizen voices and concerns will fluctuate throughout this flight. And as a result, we must authentically listen and adjust our course of action. By virtue of your seat, you will gain many frequent flyer miles. In fact, it will often feel as if you're moving, but you're not really going anywhere at all. This trip will take you to many exciting and difficult places sometimes even in the same day. 
You can take the aisle seat or the window seat, but where you sit and where you stand on issues will determine if you are an observer or an actively engaged member of this city council. On our initial departure, we welcomed Mary Ann Baldwin, Jonathan Melton, and frequent flyer Corey Branch. <laughs> On our first layover, we picked up Stormy Ford. <laughs> and on the second layover, we picked up four additional passengers, Christina Jones, <laughs> Mary Black, Megan Patton, and Jane Harrison. And although we have a flight pattern, this flight will be choppy and unpredictable at times. It will often be bumpy, and we will experience some turbulence as everyone determines how they're going to govern. There is no air traffic controller to direct and clear our paths as there is no flight simulation because the work that we do is grounded in reality. We ask that you take your seats and put your tray tables in the upright position because this work is not for the weak at heart. You will have to buckle up because the seat is often hot and uncomfortable. We may have to redirect our flight path at times because the conditions are unpredictable and the air may be dense and uneven. There will be very little time for in-flight meals, snacks, and beverages. We saw that today on this flight. <laughs> for our sustenance will be from public service, which is truly the food for your soul, as it is low in calories and high in rewards. We may pass through a storm or two, but trust that your pilot and our co-pilots are firmly positioned in the cockpit and are astutely prepared and able to navigate this machine through uncertainties and unintended consequences. We will dim the lights, but know that the city never sleeps and our work is 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We ask that you stay in your seat though when we are traversing cloudy skies and controversy until staff can smoothly navigate this aircraft. And as you know, there are different phases of a flight, and this one promises to deliver. The takeoff began last November. The climb begins now as you navigate the nuances of local government that may be unfamiliar or uncomfortable to you. The cruise, while well, I'm still waiting on the cruise, typically happens when everything settles in the air. And well, for us, very seldom do we get to put the plane on autopilot as we are always balancing multiple issues at a time. The descent is somewhat rewarding when we have met the needs and the demands of the community and we can exhale a collective sigh of relief. And the final approach will often seem within sight when we bring an item to the table but general statutes, budgetary concerns, unaligned community priorities, and diverse council opinions sometimes cause us to have to change our flight pattern. The four forces of a flight, lift, thrust, drag, and weight are important in the work that we do. The lift is often heavy, and sometimes you will have to go it alone. As a passenger, you will be thrust into the throes of community issues that are difficult to manage. Additionally, the work of the city will sometimes drag you down. You will frequently feel as if the weight of the world is on your shoulders, when in fact, the weight of this city actually is. While our runway is long and very unforgiving, we will aim to land this flight smoothly with many successes, lessons learned along the way, the community feeling heard, employees feeling valued, partnerships and collaborations formed, and more fun than you can ever imagine. And as I have been granted clearance to descend and land this plane, I would be remiss if I did not add that we are grateful for each of you. Because when you were choosing, you could have chosen other nonprofit boards and advisory groups to serve on, but you chose us. I am happy that you chose the city of Raleigh via Air Raleigh, and we're going to provide the flight of a lifetime. You are now free to move about the city and govern yourselves accordingly.
So please wait <laughs> in the departure lounge. So what am I in some You will be boarding nights? at gate number 11. Oh. oh, that's the flight number. Um, one of my insomniac nights that came to me and I just started writing and then I couldn't stop. So um, I will be really brief because I know everybody is ready to go home. So just wanted to kind of hit, hit an end on a high note. As you all will recall in 2021, our theme was resilient. So I brought Olivia Pope back. I was the Olivia Pope without the scandal, as you will recall. <laughs> Last year, it was the year of wild kingdom in that we had black zebra, we had black bears, zebra cobra snakes, feral cats, coyotes, and one other animal that took over the city one week to the other. So it was the year of the wild kingdom. And some of us that are a little bit older than some of you in this room will remember wild kingdom. And the guy whose head was on that picture, that's the coat he used to wear for every broadcast. And so this year, here we are. to Madrid is now boarding at gate 15 and will be taking off at... Okay, if you will advance. So our 2023 goals, um, which I shared with council during my evaluation, the great thing about that is many of these goals are in alignment with the priorities that you all raised today at the table, unbeknownst to many of you. Um, and so that means that we are steering this plane in the right direction. I definitely can't read that, so I'm going to go to the side. First, we're going to try to create collaborative opportunities that advance efforts to address homelessness, assist those that are unsheltered or on the verge of becoming unsheltered. And obviously, that is a core value of mine, and I'm so glad that so many of you on council are interested for those that are suffering and those that are in um, um, some degree and sense of need, and we're going to focus a lot of our attention this year on trying to help those that are housing compromised. Second, enhance community engagement efforts that aim to include, inform, and educate the public on items of public interest. And at the core of who I am as a public servant is community grounded and community based. And I think at the end of the day, whether the voices of the community align with those of the elected officials, with those of staff, doesn't always happen that way. However, everybody has a right to be heard. And I will always advocate and try to support those in our community having the opportunity to have their voices heard. Number three, expand initiatives to increase public safety recruitment efforts, specifically in police and emergency communications. And that is not to say that fire isn't important, but fire really doesn't have a recruitment issue. Right now, as the world changed in 2020, public safety and policing has many, many challenges that we're trying to overcome. And one of those is being able to retain some of those strong employees that help to keep police departments responsive and responsible for the communities that they serve. And I often say, we oftentimes forget about emergency communications, which is 911. We have a countywide consolidated system that we are responsible for. And at the end of the day, if we don't have a strong 911 system, it doesn't matter whether we have police and firefighters because there's nobody to be able to dispatch and telecommunicate those needs. So we're also always going to try to make sure that we take care of emergency communication staff as well. Address the disparity study findings to ensure fair and equitable procurement and contracting practices throughout the organization. What we've seen and what we've questioned over the last several years is with the amount of money that is spent in this city, we don't do a very good job of being equitable in our procurement practices. And so we embarked upon a disparity study those findings should be reported to council in February, and from there we will develop an action plan of how we're going to respond. Next, refine the city's crisis communication strategy to improve protocols for crisis management. For those of us that were in the situation room on October the 13th, you know exactly what I was talking about. From the first call at 521, to when we went home at 3.30 to only turn around and come back again the next morning at 7. We realized that there were some gaps and some opportunities for us to do better. So I'm taking that. I own that. I'm going to make sure that our staff is ready and primed and prepared to be able to handle the next crisis situation. And although I would like to say that it won't be another one, more than likely as we continue to grow 
and the world continues to be like it is, there will be. Continue to support and champion creative opportunities to increase affordable housing and housing choice throughout the city. Housing is the number one crisis that we deal with on a daily basis. I'm a firm believer that the people who work in this city, predominantly people who work for us, should have the opportunity to live here. And we will do all that we can to try to work alongside you guys to make sure that we have policies and regulations in place to be able to make that happen. Advance critical projects that have an organizational and community impact. That is the civic campus complex. That's what we were talking about a little bit this morning. I'm at the point, we're either going to do it or we're not. And I think we have a collective yes, so we've got to figure out how we're going to make it happen. And we need to start breaking ground in 2023. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of designing it. Let's build it. BRT, another responsive um, issue that we are trying to respond to for our community, trying to make sure that people have the a means to move around. Mobility is one of the challenges that we see every other year in our community survey. And while we still fare better than our partners, being good is okay, I want us to be great. So we gotta make sure that we get BRT in place and we've got conversations about fares and what is the appropriate level of fares um, moving forward, coming up next month as well. CRM or CEM, that's the customer relations manager or the customer experience manager. When people reach out to us, we have a system right now that it's C click fix. Well, C click fix does not work. And so people have for years tried to log their concerns into a portal and there really isn't a built in mechanism by which there is follow up and response to that. We have call centers where folks can call into and get a response but we need to have a consolidated approach to how we provide customer service. And so we have embarked upon that recruitment process to hire our customer experience managers. And as Tansy smiles, we are real hopeful that we'll be able to bring you somebody in the next couple of months. Interlocal agreement items, the convention center hotel, the convention center expansion, PNC and the hurricanes. When one of us win, we all win. Although we are very specific and we're very selfish when it comes to Raleigh, and we should be, when something happens good in this county, we all tend to reap the benefits of that. And I will tell you, as I said on the manager's briefing on Thursday, your dream team of Allison, Evan, and Marshall will fight hard to ensure that our projects in that interlocal agreement get funded. We'll try to help the others, but we're gonna be predominantly focused on ours. Address growing concerns in the downtown central business district. To the point about return to work and what does work look like, activation downtown and the re revitalization of downtown, cleanliness, safety, lighting and streetscape and sanitation are some of the issues that we've heard from our business partners, our residents and even our city staff. So we have a team internally working on that and we hope to be able to bring back something that you guys can ponder on in the next month or so, but even more so in the next couple of months, we hope to have something that you guys can see. We want to light it up and I don't understand why it's so hard, but we're trying to work through how we can light it up and pick up and clean our downtown so that it will always be inviting for people to come. Develop strategies to supplement existing efforts to curb gun violence. This is one of those that there's nothing that we can do to solve it, but that doesn't mean that we don't continue to work at it. So we will continue to partner with RPD and partner with our partners in the community to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to decrease gun violence in this community. And as Chief Patterson goes to her major city chiefs meetings, and as I go to some of the major city manager meetings, and everybody talks about gun violence, they talk about how blessed we are in Raleigh, about as many people as we have with the number of gun violence incidents that we do have, how places that are smaller than us have two to three times more gun violence and more homicides. And my response to that is thanks but one homicide is one homicide too many. So we're not gonna rest on our laurels and be satisfied with the fact that we don't have as many as say a Chicago or a Dallas Fort Worth or a San Diego or a Nashville, Tennessee. I want us to make sure that we're doing everything that we can make, everything that we can do to make Raleigh safe. 
continue to build internal and external relationships and partnerships that help to further the city's strategic plan, departmental business plans, and other guiding bodies of work. And so basically what that says is all of us have plans that we work on. What we're going to try to do is be more intentional about the coordination and the alignment of all of those plans together so that we're not off walk working over here in a silo or this plan here is not informing that plan. So really that is about strategic coordination and making sure that our work makes sense. We are busy all of the time, and it only makes sense that we work smarter, not harder. And go back, go back, Luke. And so those are some pictures of events that we've, Lord, look at that, um, <laughs> that we've been to. Um, Dick's Park over here, the Hillsborough Street, um, community awards. Um, this right here hopefully will indicate what our community engagement bus is going to look like at some point if we can ever get it. Um, it's coming. Um, and so again, this is just opportunities of how we have engaged and worked with the community over the last year. And more pictures. And so there she is. Um, <laughs> And I would be remiss before I close if I did not give some thanks out and some shout outs to my staff. This is truly the dream team. I get up every single day after 29 and a half years still excited about coming to work. Part of that is because I've grown to love this community. I fell in love with this community and its people. But the other part of that is I love the people that I do the work with. They are crazy enough to jump on board with some of these ideas that we don't have any clue whether it's going to work or not, but they're willing to do it because they'll do it with me, and for that I am forever grateful. We are charged with doing all kinds of things all days of the week and on weekends. Sometimes some of us never sleep, but yet that's the difference in somebody who has a job and somebody who has a calling. And I think public service is a calling. It is not for the weak at heart. It is not for those that want appreciation all the time because you're not going to get it. It is not for those who aim to be rich because you're never going to be rich doing this work in a paycheck. But you will be rich in the communications. You'll be rich in the partnerships. You'll be rich in the relationships um, and the friendships that you make throughout this work. This two-day activity did not happen without the work of many on our team. Tansy and Michelle were the two who ran point on this. Tansy is more of that straight laced, let's get it lined out, boom, 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 taskmaster. Michelle is the doer, the logistical wizard. And I will say, over the last couple of days, we got hit with some things we never saw coming. And Michelle Millette pivoted on the drop of a dime. She got you fed. She got you in a location yesterday. She got us transported back and forth. She even transported some beverages back last night. So with that, I would just like to say hats off to Michelle Millette. I hope you get some sleep tonight. Um, no, 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 really, honestly, she made five or six trips to, to Durham over there in the wee hours at 6 or 6.30 in the morning. And again, that's the part of the work that nobody sees. That's what makes all of this happen. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the communications staff. What you all don't know is they too were over in Raleigh at 6 a.m. and packing up everything that they have has a specific spot and space and they tape and they log and they put it in these containers. We broke down last night from the reception. I saw Pete over there pulling down curtains. Y'all were already on the Go Raleigh bus on y'all way back home. We were over there breaking down that reception site. So um, communications, hats off to you guys. I know we're looking for a director, but in the interim, you all continued to do the work. You stepped up to the plate, and you made this all seamless. Thank you. So with that, if I don't sit down, Jonathan Melton is going to have a fit because um, we are past the 5 o'clock mark. <laughs> um, but I would like to say thank you for the opportunity to, again, share with you all how we work. You get a better understanding of us, and we get a better understanding of you. And when we were trying to find a facilitator, she says she's a partner, not a facilitator. Monica did the darn thing. Thank you for working with us. 
It took a little bit of Tansy weighing on her a little bit, but I think she loves Raleigh so much that she could, well, she told us no, then she called right back and said yes. So thank you, Monica, for helping us facilitate and navigate through these very meaningful and impactful conversations over the last couple of days. Have a great rest of your weekend, guys, and I will turn it over to the mayor and let her issue any closing remarks that she might have. Let's go home. Now Thank we'll you. Go home. At gate 15, and we'll be taking off at 11:05. Wait your turn. Please go to plane. gate 15 to start boarding now. <laughs> Passengers for Lisbon, Athens, and Bonn, please wait in the lounge. <laughs>